Carlo Relo. I, I call the members to order, and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister, and the first question is from Heavin David. Will the First Minister make a statement about Welsh Government plans for funding uh, of Band B 21st Century Schools? Yes, Band B of our 21st Century Schools and Education Programme will see a further £2.3 billion invested in our education estate from April of next year, and subject to approval of business cases, all local authorities and colleges in Wales will benefit from those investments. And it's the case that the government is committed to use uh, public-private uh, funding through the mutual investment model of £500 million to partially fund the cost of the building of new schools. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, told me that individual school building uh, schemes would not be of sufficient scale individually to qualify for funding, and instead schemes would be brought together in batches across Wales um, to be of sufficient scale to qualify. However, the Wales Audit Office produced a report in May 2017 in which they said, to date, most councils have resisted procuring projects in batches, protracted consultations on one or two controversial projects that involve mergers or closures could potentially delay all the projects in a batch, and that failure to collaborate would pose a significant risk to the revenue-funded element of the programme. Having looked through previous discussions in this chamber and in committee, um, on the mutual investment model, I find the government has provided inadequate um, information about how it's going to resolve these issues. With that in mind, would the First Minister, in the first instance, uh, uh, outline how the government is addressing the batching problems, but in the longer term, would he commit to a debate in government time in order for all members to scrutinise this funding model effectively? <laughs> Well, the reason why we've chosen strategic uh, partnering to deliver uh, MIM education projects is that it allows for the capital value of individual projects to be much lower than they would be under single procurement. So we encourage, of course, uh, bundling uh, to happen in order for the cost to, uh, to go down, amongst other reasons. The successful strategic partners granted the opportunity to deliver the aggregated pipeline of MIM education uh, schemes, that's up, uh, education schemes that's up to £500 million pounds in value. That represents an efficient and agile way to deliver single or small batched schemes at a local level with values as low as uh, £15 million. Because without that, every individual local authority uh, or FEI would need to run a full procurement for each of its individual MIM projects, which is impractical and time-consuming. And we would encourage uh, local authorities, of course, to uh, take a bundling approach uh, in order to, for their own costs uh, are brought down. And secondly, of course, to make sure that, uh, that they are able to deliver projects that otherwise probably wouldn't be delivered because, of the, because they are smaller in scale. Andrew Artie Davis. Presiding officer, 21st Century Schools First Minister, as we've heard you many times say, is about improving the school estate across Wales. In my own electoral region, uh, the Vale of Glamorgan Council are proposing to shut a small rural school that has a good role to it, uh, has a bright future ahead of it, Lang Carbon School. Uh, I appreciate you can't talk about the specific case, but surely it is not right to use 21st Century School money to shut a viable school that has a bright future, and indeed the argument the Vale Council have put forward uh, doesn't even talk of closure, merely talks of relocation. That is not what 21st century school is about, is it? Well, the, uh, the, uh, as he puts it, the objective of 21st century schools is not to close schools. The objective of 21st century schools is to provide the appropriate premises for uh, children and young people to learn in. I know, of course, that in uh, many parts of Wales that has meant that new schools have been built uh, and that existing schools have been closed for any number of reasons. Uh, he's right to say, of course, I can't uh, uh, comment on a particular uh, proposal that's before the Vale of Glamorgan uh, Council, uh, but we're proud of the fact that 21st Century Schools has delivered uh, new buildings and refurbished buildings for so many children and young people across Wales. Sean Gwenllian. There is huge demand for the additional capital funding allocated for the 21st Century Schools project from the Welsh medium sector, which is excellent news, of course, and demonstrates a desire to support the ambition of a million Welsh speakers proposed by the government here. But there isn't sufficient funding to meet that demand by any stretch. There's over £100 million of applications for funding which have been presented for projects to increase Welsh medium education across Wales. Will there be more investment for Welsh medium education in this Assembly term? Well, of course, we have made great investment in education. And we've retained 
or safeguarded a very large amount of money for education. If we look at what we spend on education, we can see that the spending has uh, increased over the years, 1.5% in 2017-18, and that's uh, more than any other country in the United Kingdom. But it's true to say that more demand for Welsh medium education is something that should be welcomed. And, of course, the local education authorities, through the plans that they have, should ensure that that demand is catered for. And we must also ensure that the teachers are in place so that the schools can grow and prosper. Of course, we wish to invest in Welsh medium education and we'll work with the LEAs to ensure that their plans are strong. Question two, Stefan Lewis. I make a statement on the implications for Wales of the withdrawal agreement between the UK and the EU. Well, there is a, a statement uh, later on, of course, uh, this afternoon, uh, but I think it's right to say that many aspects of the withdrawal agreement are needed. The political declaration on our future relationship needs to set out the intent of both sides to negotiate a long-term relationship that clearly reflects the position in securing Wales' future before the Welsh Government would support any agreement. Thank the First Minister for his answer. I wonder if he can provide um, his view with an, an analysis on the Northern Ireland backstop in particular and its implications for Wales. As ever with the UK Government, the rhetoric and the reality uh, do not appear to match, even when we've got the detail of a 600-page uh, uh, withdrawal agreement. Mm. The UK Government is arguing that, Northern Ireland, that the Northern Ireland backstop will provide Northern Ireland with two open borders, one with the Republic and one with Britain. But if there is regulatory or non-regulatory divergence between Northern Ireland and Britain, surely that means that there will be a hard border in the Irish Sea. Is that the First Minister's understanding of the withdrawal agreement and the backstop in particular? And would you agree, therefore, that that would be bad news for Welsh ports and the Welsh economy generally? Or is he aware of any other uh, proposal that the UK government might, might have, such as unilaterally deciding not to check any goods that come from Northern Ireland, whether there's a backstop or not? Well, th there lies the issue. Of course, there are some checks now, uh, particularly in terms of animals and food checks, but they've been there because the, the island of Ireland is one area as, as far as uh, biosecurity is, uh, is concerned. The concern I've always had, and it's not addressed in the withdrawal agreement, is that uh, barriers would be put up, yes, um, to the middle of the Irish Sea, but that affects Wales as well. Because clearly, what I don't want to see, as I've said many times in this chamber, is any fresh barriers being put in place between Wales and the Republic of Ireland, uh, particularly barriers that would lead to trade moving more easily through the Scottish ports into, into Northern Ireland. The withdrawal agreement is, is not clear as to how that would operate. Uh, the focus has been on the land border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, but there is no focus uh, on the maritime border between Wales and England, for that matter, for the, uh, and, and the Republic of Ireland, uh, which is lacking in the agreement. Darren Miller. First Minister, while your government has been uh, playing politics, frankly, since June 2016, by grandstanding and attacking the Prime Minister, the truth is that Theresa May has been working very hard to negotiate a deal with the European Union which delivers for Wales and which respects the outcome of the referendum, and I remind everybody, in which Wales voted to leave the EU. Now, I accept that the deal which has been put forward by the Prime Minister last week is a compromise. I accept that it won't please everybody in this chamber. But what it will do, what it will do is protect jobs, protect the interests of Welsh businesses, protect the environment, and protect Welsh people's rights. Now, in spite of the support which has been shown for this deal from the CBI, from the Institute of Directors, and from the various farming unions, including our own farming unions here in Wales, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, has ruled out supporting the deal. Uh, and he ruled it out without actually having read the detail uh, of the deal. Have you read the deal? And will you assure us that you will do the right thing and support the deal which is in front of us, which is pragmatic, and the only way to get an orderly exit from the EU? Well, there's no point asking me. He needs to ask his own colleagues in London. Uh, it's not a question of this, you know, this being a Labour versus Conservative debate. Uh, there are many, many of his colleagues in London who are dead against this deal. That's the reality of it. He needs to convince Jacob Rees-Mogg first, with respect, because he's a well, member you, of, uh, of his party, David, well, David Jones. David Jones, asked, indeed. I mean, uh, on his own doorstep, he can try and convince David Jones. The problem is this, isn't it? 
The withdrawal agreement does address some of the issues, but not in a way that is secure enough or permanent enough. There are some other issues that need to be resolved as well, uh, particularly with regard to the, to the backstop. The real problem is I can't see any way that this is going to get through the Commons. That's the problem. And there needs to be, the Conservative Party needs to examine whether or not it has the votes to get the deal through the Commons. So the problem is not so much the deal, even though there are I have issues with the deal, particularly in terms of uh, how long it will last. We don't know whether this deal will get through the Commons. And therein lies the problem within the Conservative Party and the massive splits that are within it. Mr. Rees. First Minister, as well as the withdrawal agreement, as you quite pointed out, there was also the political declaration on the future relationship that was published at the same time. Now, whilst we cannot change the withdrawal agreement, because it's unlikely to get any changes and amendments to the EU in that situation, the, this can actually still be changed at the Council of until Sunday. Are you having discussions with the Prime Minister to ensure that the Welsh voice is actually going to be heard in any changes to this de declaration? Because, as you pointed out many times before our committee, the Welsh voice hasn't been listened to very often in London. It's time now they should be listened to in this future declaration of future interests. Well, well I can uh, inform the Chamber that I'll be meeting with the Prime Minister tomorrow to discuss that and other issues. Questions now from the party leaders and on behalf of the leader of Plaid Cymru, Rhun Abiorwerth. Thank you, Llywydd. First Minister, other nation states within the European Union will decide to summit this weekend whether the draft agreement on exiting the European Union works for them. Do you think it works for Wales? No, because I've always been in favour of waiting, of remaining within the European Union. We are a very long way from what was proposed in the referendum two and a half years ago. Actually, from the promises made and voted on uh, in June 2016, it probably doesn't please uh, anybody at this uh, point. I think we're agreed on that. Where we don't agree is how to protect Wales's interest in the event of the UK ceasing to be a member of the EU, however that happens. Now, the Supreme Court is busy considering whether a Scottish continuity bill is within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. If the Court agrees that it is, uh, the Scots will have a powerful legislative shield uh, against the Westminster power grab. Yet, while you have raised uh, concerns about the nature of UK withdrawal, as being proposed at the moment, at the same time, you're proposing this afternoon that we repeal the Welsh Continuity Bill, the only thing preventing the Tories from legislating in devolved areas without this Assembly's consent. Now, given that the Supreme Court will come to its decision on Scotland within a matter of weeks, why not delay withdrawing the Welsh Continuity Bill until we understand the lay of the land at the Supreme Court? Well, of course, any ruling by the Supreme Court will have an effect on Wales. Let's say, for example, that the Supreme Court were to say that the Scots have that power, then you know, there's, that, that would cover us as well. But if they say that there's no power to do it, the Scots have nothing, and we have an agreement. That's the issue here. We have an intergovernmental agreement that was reached by two parties. Part of that agreement was to withdraw the uh, Continuity Act. Uh, if we don't do that, we will have breached the agreement. Uh, and that means, of course, that we have shown bad faith as far as uh, the UK government is concerned and as far as we are concerned. Uh, it's also worth, of course, bearing in mind that uh, that agreement was reached after many, many months of uh, negotiation. Uh, and that agreement uh, is something which cannot lightly be thrown away. Now, I know he takes the view that, that he doesn't like the agreement. I understand that. It's been made clear in the past in this chamber. But we have an agreement as a government to uh, protect Wales, and we intend to make sure that agreement is honoured, at least on our side. Wales has too few levers as it is, and what happens uh, in uh, taking away the potential powers of the uh, continuity bill for Wales is that you weaken those powers that we do have, and the you know, legal argument is that Wales had a stronger case in the Supreme Court than Scotland did. But moving on, just over a week ago, uh, your party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, told the German newspaper Der Spiegel that Brexit cannot be stopped. Since then, we've been told uh, that what he actually meant was that Labour on its own uh, can't stop Brexit. Now, opposition parties uh, on the Remain side of the argument have been very uh, open to the notion of working in a cross-party uh, manner to halt uh, Brexit. Now, rather than prevaricating, and, and to be honest, uh, I'm done guessing what's going on in Jeremy Corbyn's mind, but don't you think that... The Labour Party now should be entering into urgent talks with uh, ourselves, the SNP, other parties at Westminster 
to coordinate efforts to secure a fresh vote with Remain on the ballot paper. I know you've been advocating going down the general election route instead, but surely you can see now that what we really need is a people's vote. Well, let me explain uh, where I think we are. First of all, I think there's been a complete failure of politics in Westminster. We know that because uh, we had a referendum in 2016 on an idea. People now can see what the outcome uh, is. And I, I do think that there is every uh, justification in saying to people, now you know what the reality is, what do you now want to do? Uh, that could be done either through a general election or a public vote. But what's clear is that public vote would have to uh, offer the option of whether to leave, uh, on what basis to leave, or indeed whether to remain, uh, on the basis the, the, of what we know now. I, I can't see that where politicians in Westminster have failed, or a government in Westminster has failed, that there is anything wrong with going back to people and say the circumstances have now changed, what do you now want to do? If they still want to leave, then of course they have the opportunity to say so, but I do think we need to trust the people on this. Leader of the Opposition, Paul Davis. Uh, uh, First Minister, how do you consider the early stages of the new rail franchise to be progressing? But with great difficulty, because there have been enormous problems, as we can see. I'm glad that Transport for Wales has issued the apologies that it has. They've been affected by Storm Callum, and they have inherited um, quite an elderly fleet. But we did say, when we were honest at the start, to say it would take some time to replace the trains that we wanted and to get the kind of service that we uh, want to provide for the people of Wales. First Minister, only a number of months ago, your Transport Secretary stated that the new rail franchise would be transformational. We are now just over one month since Transport for Wales, since Transport for Wales took over the Welsh rail franchise, and already, and already. I, I, I can't hear the leader of the opposition, and I don't think the first minister can as well. So, can you please be quiet and allow the leader of the opposition to be heard? Uh, we are now just over one month since Transport for Wales took over the Welsh Rail franchise, and already we have a public full new newspaper page spread apology which you've just refer uh, referred to. Now, the apology states, and I quote, we know that you, our customers, deserve better from your rail services in Wales and the borders, and this is not what you expected from your new operator, unquote. And do you know why, First Minister, this is not what people expected? I'll tell you why. Because, yet again, it is your government who is responsible for these services, and you are once again failing to deliver on your promises. You promised, you promised a high-quality, affordable and accessible train network in Wales, but the reality for passengers is that Transport for Wales' morning commuter train from Chepstow and Caldicott to Newport and Cardiff has been cancelled 16 times in the last 20 weekdays. Blaenau Festiniog, Betus Coed and Llanroost have had no trains all day on seven of the last 20 weekdays. And the 8.40 train from Aberystwyth to Shrewsbury was cancelled on four days last week. This is an absolute shambles by your government. So, First Minister, instead of PR-inspired apologies, what measurable action is Transport for Wales taking to address this appalling start to the franchise? I have to say this is weak ground for him. I mean, does he, how does he justify the fact that Wales only gets 1% of rail investment, rail infrastructure investment, nothing on him about that? How does he, uh, how does he explain, yes, I know it's, it's difficult, but it's true. How does he explain the fact that it was his own party that cancelled the electrification west of Cardiff, despite the promise that was actually made? So this is very weak ground for him. But we did say that we would transform the rail network in Wales. We didn't say we'd do it in a month. After 15 years of a franchise that was let before, after many, many years of underinvestment in the track by a Conservative government, we said that we would transform the network, but it, we, we were upfront and, and we said it would take time to do it. Of course it would. Some of the problems on the uh, trains are to do with the track, which we have no control over, and some of them are to do with the fact that 30% of the rolling stock was impacted by Storm Callum. But I have to say to him, you know, I don't think people will find it realistic when he says after 15 years of rolling stock being used that everything was going to change in a month, really. We said that that wouldn't happen, but we have, of course, outlined the plan for the future and we will deliver a train service for the people of Wales and keep our promises unlike his party.
since your government has taken over this franchise, services have got worse, and yeah. that's just in a month, First Minister. Now, the previous franchise agreement made no allowance for growth in passenger numbers and no provisions for extra train capacity. Since that franchise was first let in 2003, passenger numbers have increased by around 75 per cent. This created chronic congestion, a lack of appropriate rolling stock and years of underinvestment in relation to rail services across yes. Wales. You were asked repeatedly to publish the tender specification against which the potential <laughs> rail operators were to bid in order to win the current contract. You have repeatedly refused to make that document public. Transparency is, of course, a key component in ensuring that the Welsh public have faith in Transport for Wales going forward. First Minister, in light of these deteriorating services, will you now release that tender specification in full in order to help restore the public's confidence in your government's oversight of rail services in Wales and so that we can fully assess your government's role in this continuation of failing uh, of Welsh commu commuters? Well, the, the, the document will be published. Well, we said it would be soon to be redacted off of course, but I mean, really, four weeks into the franchise, he is, he is critical. After 15 years of the franchise being run from Whitehall, after eight years of a Conservative government, when no extra money was put into rail uh, uh, investment in Wales, no extra money was put in, into infrastructure, no extra money was put into rolling stock, no money was allocated for uh, electrification. We've seen the shambles in England with some of the, uh, some of the franchises there. Chris Grayling has been hauled over the coals uh, for it. There's no vision in England, uh, there's no money being set to one side, and despite the fact that we have called for rail infrastructure to be devolved with an appropriate Barnet consequential, which will be 6.2%, the Tories have refused. Yes. Because they're happy with the situation, it seems, or Wales gets 1% of rail infrastructure investment. That is absolutely wrong, given the fact that Scotland gets a far, far better deal. What we've offered the people of Wales is a vision for the future. We've said that by the end of next year, the pace of trains will go. There will be partial electrification. There will be new trains. They will all be air-conditioned. And people will be able to, ex to experience a service that is far, far superior than the service the Tories tolerated for so long from 2010 onwards. Group, Leader of the UKIP Group, Gareth Bennett. Uh, dear Fluid. <coughs> First Minister, there is an ever increasing list of building projects in Cardiff dealing supposedly with student accommodation. In the last three years, there have been 23 separate developments opened, approved, or put under construction in Cardiff. If you stand on the junction of City Road and Newport Road in Cardiff, you can see eight separate developments, either under construction or newly opened. There are also now instances in both Newport and Cardiff of blocks of so-called student accommodation where the flats are being rented out commercially. The flats inside these blocks do not, do not go to students because there isn't a big enough demand from students. Do you think that a suspicious pattern may be developing whereby universities and private developers are gaining planning permission for so-called student developments and then deliberately changing their use afterwards? Well, of course, a change of use requires require um, an application to the local authority. If he has any evidence at all to back up what he's saying, I'd be glad to hear it. Well, it is, as you say, a matter for the relevant local authority in part, but I feel that this is um, a, an area where the Welsh Government should be concerned, and I think you do have an important role to play in monitoring this. I have raised this issue with your Housing Minister, who said she's keeping an eye on this, but she did point out that it may fall close to the remit of your Planning Minister. So there is a danger, in my view, that this could fall through the cracks. We do need to look at why there has been such an increase in this so-called student accommodation. Currently, student accommodation is exempt from business rates. This is because the student flats are classed as domestic dwellings and therefore fall under the, under the council tax regime rather than business rates. Business owners on Mandy Road in Cardiff recently found out that they will have to leave their business units to make way for a six-storey building comprising 143 student flats. <laughs> There's a motor repair garage which has been at this site for 40 years. Not only will this change have a detrimental effect on the local community, but the taxpayer will lose thousands of pounds due to business rates not being paid by the owners of the student flats. Is this not a case, First Minister, of universities and developers exploiting loopholes in the planning rules simply to maximise their profits? Uh, 
he seems to think that people who live in private flats pay business rates. They don't. They pay council tax, just as students do. There's no difference. So I can't see what point he's trying to, uh, to make there. If somebody purchases a flat in a uh, block of flats that's just been built, they pay council tax, not business rates. Well, I thank you for your answer, but there has been a certain amount of concern about this even within Cardiff Council. Cardiff Council's planning officer, Lawrence Dowdell, has recently stated that Cardiff may now have an oversupply of student accommodation. Planning Committee member Wendy Congrave, who was a Lib Dem member, described one recent development as a cynical use of the planning process. It's nothing less than a commercial development through the back door and must be resisted. We have developed too many types of these accommodations and, surprise, surprise, they are now being turned into commercial lucrative developments. I think you do need to be concerned about this because this possible flouting of the rules may affect your ambitions for affordable housing in Wales. Commercial developers, when they build new housing estates, have a legal obligation to provide an element of affordable housing. Developers building so-called student blocks are under no such obligation. So you could have universities working with private developers to get their properties on the commercial market by the back door, while all the time avoiding the need to provide affordable housing. Do you think your government should be having a word with the developers or monitoring this situation in any way? Well, I think you should be careful here, because he's effectively accusing universities of being part of a scam, uh, in effect, without any evidence. I, I come back to the point I made earlier on. He, he has made um, suggestions. Um, I've not seen any evidence from him to back up any of his uh, suggestions, apart from uh, what he says, but, but nothing to, to back it up. But I'm, but I'm pretty sure our universities are not engaged in commercial property development when they have many, many thousands of students to, to house anyway. They're, we should celebrate the fact that Cardiff and other universities across Wales have been so successful in attracting students from around the world because they add to the research and learning capacity of those universities and ultimately add to our, uh, our economy. So uh, universities are huge drivers of the economy because they attract so many uh, students. And I, I, I've not seen any evidence that suggests that universities are deliberately trying to build student accommodation uh, with a view to then changing the use of that accommodation to, to make money through commercial property. Question three, Sean. Question three, Sean Grintley. Will the First Minister make a statement on the support available to assist community hydro energy projects with their business rates? Well, in April, we introduced a grant scheme to provide hydropower projects in Wales with grants towards their non domestic rates bills. The scheme provides 100% rates relief to community hydro projects and caps the increase in rates for other hydropower developments. And Plaid Cymru was very pleased to ensure that business rate relief for community energy project as part of the budget agreement for this financial year with the government. But there is no assurance to date that the business rate relief will be available for the next financial year or for ensuing years. These projects clearly need long-term assurances so that they can plan for their future. And without that assurance, it's difficult for them to plan and to collaborate with community groups and local charities. And indeed, it's difficult for new initiatives to be set up. So will you commit to ensure that these business rate relief schemes are available permanently for these hydro energy schemes? Well, it's difficult to do that, of course. That is something for the next government to consider. And, of course, it depends on the amount of funding we receive from Westminster. But, of course, we understand how much of a help this has been for hydropower. And we will consider the situation when we know more about the financial position in the next financial year onwards. First Minister, I think it's fair to say that we could be using the business rate regime far more imaginatively to target support, uh, whether that be for uh, hydro uh, energy projects, as uh, Sean Gwetlin has alluded to, other renewable projects, or indeed our high streets. Uh, and we know full well the problems which have afflicted some high street businesses in areas such as Monmouth and my constituency in the wake of revaluation. Uh, you mentioned uh, your, uh, your successor. Uh, will you leave a note for your successor, whoever that might be? I think that's the way it's done in Labour circles. Uh, to, look, to look again at this whole area uh, of business rates and ways that the tax could be reformed to actually help rather than hinder the economy over the longer term, not just the next budget or the next two budgets. 
Uh, I think in the Conservative Party, it's a gangplank that's used mainly, isn't it, to, uh, to deal with the changes of, uh, of leadership. Uh, any, any notes or notes that I leave will, of course, be uh, electronic. Uh, we are, of course, a, 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 uh, moving towards being a, a paperless uh, government. Now, from our perspective, we will always try and use the non-domestic rates regime in innovative and imaginative ways. We've done it, of course, with the Small Business Rate uh, Relief Scheme, which uh, helps so many uh, businesses across, uh, across Wales. Uh, and, of course, we will look to see uh, what might be possible in the future, depending, of course, on uh, uh, what monies are made available through the block grant. Question, Pedwar. Question for Lee Water. Uh, will the First Minister provide an update on action the Welsh Government is taking to protect jobs at the Schaeffler plant in Llanelli? Yes, well, first of all, can I thank the member for the uh, work that he has done on behalf of those uh, workers. We have held discussions with Schaeffler. Uh, and an offer of a two-tier approach to support the company has been accepted. A meeting will be held in early December to develop a task force with members of the Schaeffler management team, and the consultation period is still in operation, of course, until early uh, January. Uh, what the support is aimed at doing, of course, is to help those who work there at the moment and to see uh, what beneficial uses for employment the site could be put to in the future. Thank you, First Minister. I warmly welcome uh, that uh, news. Uh, and I met with the Economy Secretary last week uh, to urge the government to engage with the plant. So I'm delighted that that, that has now happened. And I met with the UK Managing Director of Schaeffler. They made it clear that this, their decision to begin the process of closure had nothing to do with the workforce, who they stressed had been excellent. But it's essential they now properly engage with the consultation process. And would the Welsh Government make clear to them that if they decide they no longer want to continue the plant, we will not put up with them cutting and running. This town has provided nearly 50 years of building the profits of this business, and they owe an obligation to us to work with us constructively to see if we can keep manufacturing in that plant. Yes, the, the construction so far has been uh, positive. Uh, I would expect that to continue in the future. There's no reason why... Uh, well, no reason for them to change their minds. They've been working with us as a government, and the emphasis will be very, very strongly uh, on finding uh, a new use for the site, providing employment for all those who work there, uh, and of course others uh, in the future, uh, and of course to provide support for those uh, workers who will now possibly be looking uh, elsewhere. But as we have always done when uh, situations like this have arisen, we will be there to support the workers involved. Helen Mary Jones. And, and can I associate myself with what Lee Waters has said about the commitment that workforce has shown over a period of very many years to that company and how much they've contributed to their success. Uh, I hope that the discussions that you're having will have a positive outcome, but I have to say there's a faint sense here of shutting the stable door after the horse is already gone, and it may be that it's too late to change Schaefer's mind. I hope that I'll be proved wrong in that, and I'm pleased to see the efforts that are going in. But in terms of other manufacturing businesses that may feel that their future is greatly jeopardised by the possibility of Brexit, what more can your government do to engage with them proactively before they reach the point that Schaefer has done and they've actually made the decision to leave? I mean, as has already been put to you again this afternoon, you know, the most effective way, of course, to deal with these situations would be the, op would be the people's vote and decision for us to remain. But in the meantime, and in the absence of that, what more can you do to engage proactively with particularly international companies, uh, in the hope that we can prevent them from getting the positions that Schaefer has done? There are occasions when we get notice of potential closures, and we're able to help those companies, and have done in the past, Tata being, I suppose, the most obvious example. But there are occasions where we get no notice, and this yeah. was one such occasion. Uh, if we'd have known that there were issues there, we could have um, obviously looked to uh, help the company, but they'd already taken the decision. Uh, as far as uh, the way we operate and what we can do in the future, we have the EU Transition Fund, of course, uh, £50 million, pounds, which is there to uh, help businesses to transition, helping them with training uh, so that they are competitive uh, when uh, Britain leaves the, uh, the EU. And, of course, we, we continue to work on uh, other ways, uh, working with the business community, in which we can help them to overcome the incredible uncertainty that they're facing at the moment. Question Pimp, David. Question five, David Rees. What action is the Welsh Government taking to support the manufacturing sector in Wales? Well, since 2011, the Welsh Government has supported over 16,200 jobs in manufacturing. Uh, through the Economic Action Plan, we will support future-proofing business investment to help companies sustain, compete and grow. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. Clearly, the advanced materials and manufacturing sector discussed in the Economic Action Plan is one of the areas where we go in the future, the modern technologies. But we still have many manufacturing sectors which are still relying on older technologies which need updating. Tata being an example of one of those plants. Now, the Welsh Government committed to 30 uh, million pounds for investment into the 
power plant. Can you give us an update as to where that money is? And can you also look at other actions you might be able to take to help companies like Tata who want to improve productivity and efficiency but are having difficulties perhaps in some ways getting that extra support? Uh, well, uh, the, the investment in Tata is going uh, well. Of course, Tata themselves have invested in Blast Furnace 5. Uh, we continue to, to talk to them about uh, what kind of package uh, would help and what would be lawful, of course, in state aid rules. In fact, I had a meeting uh, some 10 days ago with a representative of uh, Tata as we look to take things uh, forward. Uh, Tata are definitely uh, keen, of course, to stay in Wales and particularly in Patalbot and the other plants uh, around Wales. Uh, and we will continue to work with Tata as we always have done to secure Welsh jobs. Mohamed Ashkan. Officer. In June, the annual Barclays and SPTS Voice of Manufacturing event was held in Newport. One of the topics of discussion was skill shortages and the shift from vocational qualification to university degrees. First, Mr. what is the Welsh Government doing to tackle the misperception that exists regarding the well-paid and rewarding roles that careers in engineering and manufacturing offers in Wales? Well, we are seeing the growth of apprenticeship schemes. Uh, I think in the 90s, the UK lost interest in apprenticeships and concentrated overly on academic courses. Uh, we now see, of course, not just bigger companies, but uh, smaller companies operate, uh, offering apprenticeships. Jobs Growth Wales was an example of that, uh, to give people uh, the training they needed uh, to, to get a job. Uh, and, of course, we have a commitment to create 100,000 apprenticeships for all ages uh, across Wales. It's through creating those apprenticeships that we create the opportunities for people and show them that there is uh, a, a worthwhile <laughs> Uh, alternative to, uh, to the academic uh, route and, of course, in ensuring that, making sure that, that uh, people have the skills they need to uh, be uh, employable uh, in the future. Caroline Jones. First Minister, my region has lost far too many manufacturing jobs in recent decades. And while I welcome your government's actions in securing new manufacturing investment, such as the Aston Martin deal, this doesn't replace the loss of manufacturing output in South Wales West. First Minister, how will your government ensure my region benefits from such investment, particularly as the region has excelled in the automotive supply chain in the past? Well, well Tata is one example, of course, and, and Ford is another where we work very, very closely with the companies. It's a very difficult times at times uh, to make sure that uh, Ford, with its 1,700 jobs in Progend, uh, is still there and looking to the, uh, to the future. Uh, what we have done, I believe, is replace many jobs that were low paid, uh, low skilled uh, with jobs that are higher paid and higher skilled that's where we need to be uh, competing with the uh, with those who are have low labor costs is not Wales's future it was tried in the 80s and 90s and unless you're willing to pursue uh, lower and lower wages then you know that is not something that is an option to you uh, and that has meant uh, an emphasis on skills it's meant an emphasis on attracting high quality investment with high quality jobs and that will continue to be the aim of the government question question six Marcus Shwood how does the Welsh Government ensure that patients in Wales have access to orthopaedic surgery? Well, we expect health boards uh, to have suitable resources in place, including staffing, to provide services to meet the needs of their local population. Well, on a number of occasions over the years of devolution, Welsh Government has uh, produced pots of money to reduce waiting times where they've become uh, excessive. In 2017-18, the median waiting time for knee surgery in Better Cadwalder University Health Board was 339 days, up 95 days on the previous year. Over 61% of those currently waiting for trauma and orthopaedic operations are waiting over a year. How do you respond to my constituent, I'd say Mr. LB? Uh, who's been on a waiting list since 8th of December 2016 for bilateral total uh, knee replacements, where the health board wrote to me this month saying we estimate we won't be able to offer him a date for surgery now until May 2019, over 500 days, where Mr LB says he has nothing but the greatest support for his GP and his consultant, but he's a virtual cripple at 63 in constant excruciating pain. It's very difficult, of course, to pass a comment on an individual. I have no doubt uh, that where somebody is waiting for an operation, they are in pain, and uh, that they will be anxious to know when that operation will take place. They'll also be anxious to know, of course, what resources are being made available in order for uh, the, time, uh, to wait, the time waiting for an operation is expedited. What I can say is the number of whole-time trauma and orthopaedic surgery consultants at BCU increased from 23 in 2009 to 29.2 
in 2017. Uh, that's reflected in an increase across the whole of Wales. At the end of August this year, uh, there was an 11 per cent reduction in the number of people waiting over 36 weeks for orthopaedic treatment in the BCU uh, area, uh, and that is reflected across the, the whole of Wales. So uh, additional resources have been made available to appoint more consultants and surgeons, and we are seeing that, of course, reflected in the reduction uh, in the number of people waiting. Uh, and uh, as far as Mr LB is concerned, uh, I can give him the assurance that we will continue to look at how we can provide more resources, and I hope that he gets his operation soon. Helen Mary Jones. Uh, First Minister, we often hear in winter period of orthopaedic operations and other planned surgery being cancelled because of winter pressures. How confident are you uh, that the, the arrangements that have been put in place by the local health boards and by the Cabinet Secretary for Health for this winter will avoid those levels of cancellations that we have seen in the past? Well, there's always a level of cancellation that takes place beforehand in order to create the spare capacity uh, for the winter period, given the winter pressures that we, we've, been, we've seen over the last few years. So I would argue that certainly last year and the year before, those pressures were dealt with, even though they were substantial and took up a lot of uh, staff resources and uh, time. And, of course, of course, health boards have to have in place their uh, winter uh, plans, uh, which over the past few years have proven to be durable. Uh, I have no reason to suspect that that won't be the case this year. Question Scythe, James. Question 7, Jane Hutt. The Welsh Government support White Ribbon Day in relation to eliminating violence against women? Yes, I've just realised I'm not wearing one, so I apologise for that, uh, first of all. Well, to promote the UN's International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and White Ribbon Day, we are holding a Facebook Live webinar ending uh, VAWDASV in Wales, funding uh, for community communication activities and encouraging more of our male staff to become White Ribbon Ambassadors. Thank you, First Minister. I'm attending the White Ribbon event today, sponsored by Joyce Watson, and will attend Bowser's Light a Candle event at Llandaff Cathedral next week. And as the First Minister is aware, for the past eight years, Bowser has led the Light a Candle multi-faith event, uh, bringing together more than 250 individuals to commemorate International White Ribbon Day. But the horrific statistics still prevail. In Wales and England, two women a week are killed by a current or former partner, and 10,000 women a week experience sexual abuse. Will the First Minister join me in acknowledging the UN Rapporteur Professor Philip Alston's report last week, in which he states that single household payments and delays of five to 12 weeks before universal credit is paid out gives more leverage to a controlling and violent partner? And will he join me today in encouraging the new Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Amber Rudd, to halt universal credit and address this punitive policy which so adversely affects women facing violence and sexual abuse? Yes, she will see that as if by magic I now have uh, a white ribbon attached, but she raises, of course, uh, a hugely important uh, issue. And can I commend her as well for all the work that she's done? in raising awareness and in combating uh, violence against women over the years. We, of course, condemn all forms of abuse and uh, violence. We work with specialist uh, violence against women services in Wales to raise uh, awareness, of course, on violence against uh, women. Uh, and, of course, we support third sector organisations to deliver direct service provision to support and protect uh, victims. It also supports, of course, preventative work, hugely important. And, of course, that formed part of the legislation we passed uh, a few years uh, ago. Uh, much work has been done to uh, raise the issue of uh, domestic violence, to make it more visible uh, in the public mind, but there is still, of course, work to be done in order to prevent uh, physical and mental abuse and, of course, sadly, those deaths that she's mentioned. Angela Burns. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, <clears throat> First Minister, there's always more that can be done. And, uh, I recognise totally the commitment of the Welsh Government to this issue and indeed the commitment of most of the parties in this chamber to the fact that too many women, too many young girls, too many teenagers are being beaten up. But I have two particular bugbears and I would like to know what you think you as a Government and we as an Assembly could do to try to alleviate this. The first is the endlessly grim storylines of dramas, thrillers, soaps and films where almost all of the victims are women, all young girls, all teenagers who are constantly the ones being beaten up, being threatened, being violated, being raped and being killed in horrific ways. And it sends out a pernicious message that actually that's kind of, you know, what happens to women and it isn't acceptable. And my other big bugbear 
is with, at times, the asinine ju uh, judiciary system that says because a 17-year-old is wearing a pair of lacy knickers, hey, it's okay to go and rape her. These are terrible, and until we stop this, this story of victimhood and fear will transmit all around our young girls. And I have two teenage daughters, and I resent them growing up in this culture, that they have to take changes, they have to wear the dark clothes, they have to not be bright and sparkly in case some guy comes along and says, oh, I'll have a bit of that. And of course, it sends out the wrong message to our boys, because they're not bad. But there's a casualness. There's that sort of, hey, it's OK. Everybody does it. Let's do it. So the media, and by I don't mean newspapers per se, I'm talking about the entertainment industry. What a great word, entertainment. And the judiciary, they've got to get real. And they are a real part of the jigsaw puzzle to stop us having to constantly campaign to protect our women, our teenagers, and our girls. And it's disgraceful. Yeah, I don't think I can add. Uh, much to, to what uh, the member has said. She, she puts it so powerfully herself. When she mentioned the fact um, that women and young girls are, are uh, particularly portrayed as victims, I started to rack my mind as to some of the programmes that I've seen recently, and she's right. I hadn't actually spotted it, so I'm grateful to, to, for, for, for raising that issue, and she's absolutely right, that a promotion of victimhood encourages people to make people victims. Uh, and I think that is, that is certainly a strong issue there and something which I think will need to be examined in the future. Uh, secondly, she is she's partially right, I think, to say about the judiciary. I think in their defence, younger judges particularly are very well aware uh, of the, um, the world around them and, of course, what uh, is uh, appropriate to say and what is not appropriate to say. I think uh, certainly when I was in practice, some of the older judges at that time perhaps were of a different uh, era. Uh, but... Uh, the judges that I know, you know, they will be very, very much aware of uh, the need to be sensitive and uh, appropriate, and certainly they wouldn't, uh, I'm sure, say anything like that in a, in a summing up. But I do wonder whether we've gone backwards. Uh, I do, because uh, we all assumed until quite recently that, that the, the issue of gender equality and the issue of respect was something that was uh, a never-ending <laughs> journey uh, towards a more positive outcome. I'm not sure it is. I, I, I don't believe that Wales is a safe place for women to come forward uh, with, with allegations, I have to say. Uh, and that is something that we, we all recognise as uh, political uh, parties and all recognise that steps have to be done uh, with regard uh, to that. So there's, there's much work to be done. Uh, but that work, of course, is driven forward very strongly by the kind of representations that she has made and others in this chamber has made and the representations that she has made and, of course, uh, 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 my, my friend, the Vale of Morgan, and others in this chamber will always be strongly supported by me. First Minister, there's no doubt in my mind that we've gone backwards on this agenda, and I fully support what's been said uh, by Angela and by Jane Hett. And I'd like to focus on what you can actually do about this. You could improve education on this front so that every child is absolutely clear what is and what isn't acceptable. You could do something about the welfare benefit system. The fact that this uh, area isn't devolved uh, is something that you could do something about if you were prepared to take responsibility for welfare benefits. The best way to support violence uh, against women would be to ensure that demand for support services are met. Shrinking budgets has meant that this isn't always happening. In 2016-2017, the latest statistics available from Women's Aid show that 249 survivors of domestic abuse could not be accommodated by refugees in Wales because there was no space available in the service that was contacted when help was needed. Now, that same report found that there had been an overall loss of up to 5% of funding for the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Specialist Sector in this country. Apart from launching yet another review, how do you intend to tackle this grim picture and become the feminist government that you aspire to be? Well, we have provided, of course, funding uh, to local authorities and third sector organisations for the implementation of the 2015 Act. We fund the Live Fear Free uh, Helpline. There's been a 5 And, of course, £969,000 of capital grant a capital funding grant to acquire, maintain or upgrade fixed assets such as buildings and, uh, and equipment. But I take the point 
that what we need to be doing is making sure, well, two things. First of all, that there is consistent coverage across Wales of refugees. But also, and I was struck um, by this, I visited an organisation in Cardiff last week where I talked to uh, women who had horrific stories of what they had been through. And the point that they made to me was, you need a safe place to live, but you also need help to get your confidence back. Uh, and, to, uh, and the help needs to come from people who are, who are familiar with, with not general counselling, but counselling that is specific to that, to that person. Uh, and so it's massively important that, 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 is, that we take that on board in the future to provide that consistency as well, so that it's not simply a question of let's move someone to a safe place, that's important, but how can we help that individual who has gone through the most horrific experience to help to rebuild themselves and their lives. I saw an example of it in Cardiff, uh, and that, I think, will be a challenge for the next government. How can we make sure that consistency is achieved? Thomas Watson. Uh, Doug uh, Flowered. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, National Federation of Women's Institutes, have, who, as an organisation, have really helped to take this message about standing up and calling on men to stand up to, to never commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women and girls. They reach the parts that others can't. They have organ uh, 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 their organisation reaches every uh, aspect of people's lives where they live, and they have a, and they have a huge part and a huge influence in changing this agenda. But one of the things I think that we really need to focus on, and it was brought up this morning, is the gender stereotyping from an early age and the role that the government can play uh, and is playing uh, in doing something about that. It isn't always the case that girls must be girls and boys must be boys. Uh, and that feeds in uh, to actions, sometimes very negative actions, uh, perpetrated on one by the other in uh, later life. So I suppose my question to you, uh, First Minister, is that moving forward, that we sp spread those messages, and I know we already are doing it, more forcefully and more evenly across Wales, so that there isn't pressure put to bear on boys uh, behaving in a particular way and girls uh, behaving in a particular way. Yes, I mean, this is reflected, of course, in the, in the This Is Me campaign. I don't think we should go, um, as the member said, to a situation where boys and girls are expected to behave differently. There should be respect on both sides, because uh, that suggests that girls should behave in a specific way, uh, and the, the member for Kamal West and South Pembroke alluded to this. Um, in, in order not to put themselves in danger, which is a profoundly um, offensive um, p uh, position to be in. Uh, you know, why on earth uh, should women be in that uh, position where they feel you know, that they're not able to dress in a particular way or not able to behave in a particular way? Otherwise, you know, they, they've brought something on themselves. I mean, that clearly is not what we want to be. So absolutely right to say that uh, we need to look, and the new curriculum, of course, um, will we'll be looking at this, at how we promote healthy relationships in schools. That's important. And, of course, to make the point that, that respect is all around, uh, that when people are out, when they're out at night, that, uh, that, that, that respect is there for every individual uh, and that nobody should fear being judged or treated in a particular way uh, because of the way they behave or dress. Question 8, Vicky Howells. Question 8, Vicky Howells. What assessment has the Welsh Government made of the rollout of universal credit in the Cynon Valley? Well, I'm extremely concerned about the fact that many of our most vulnerable people in the Cynon Valley and elsewhere are struggling to deal with the complexities of universal credit, and the UK Government must urgently address these issues before they move existing benefit claimants to universal credit. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I share all of your concerns and also the concerns raised by my colleague Jane Hutt in relation to victims of domestic violence and the impact of universal credit upon them. But so many vulnerable groups are set to suffer as a result of this rollout. And Citizens Advice have published new research showing that some single working disabled people will be more than £300 a month worse off because of flaws in the design of UC. In addition, those without a carer and unable to work could be £180 a month worse off when they make a new claim. 
with the recently departed Work and Pension Secretary having acknowledged the damage that universal credit is causing, but also having made big promises on protecting the most vulnerable, will the Welsh Government make representations to her successor to ensure that these are not just more empty words from Tory ministers in <coughs> Westminster? Well, we have repeatedly written to the UK Government and will continue to do so. Uh, urging them to reconsider this damaging policy and to commit to targeting more people, uh, more support rather, to help lift people out of uh, poverty. Uh, we all see, of course, the uh, flaws of uh, universal uh, credit, uh, and uh, <coughs> members will be aware of the representations we have made. I can all have David Melding. Finally, David Melding. Minister, I, I agree with many members here that more should have been done to learn from uh, the rollout uh, uh, process. Uh, and to do that uh, as quickly as possible. And I welcome Amber Rudd's uh, decision that that will now be speeded up, especially by listening to expert advice and the experience that, of those that have now moved to uh, 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 the new system. But the new system is one that has been widely welcomed in making it simpler and ending the cliff edge between uh, benefits and working. And that is the, the vision that I think we should all share to have a benefit system that uh, really does enable people to reach their full potential. I think the problem lies not necessarily in the idea, but in the implementation. And uh, we know that there are design flaws in universal credit. That was highlighted within a recent Citizens Advice report on the impact of universal credit on single disabled people. So, for example, the work allowance can only be accessed through the work capability allowance. This means that someone must be assessed as not fit for work to receive targeted in-work support. Well, that's one example of where the system uh, breaks down. Uh, and uh, it's hugely important that people don't suffer uh, because a system is not working as it should. Thank you, First Minister. The next item, therefore, is the business statement and announcement. And I call on the Leader of the House, Julie James. Dear Flowers, there are two changes to today's agenda. The First Minister will make a statement shortly on the draft agreement on the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. And as a result, the oral statement on reforming, reforming dental services has been postponed until the 11th of December. Draft business for the next three weeks is set out in the business statement and announcement, which can be found amongst the meeting papers available to members electronically. Darren Miller. Dear also, as Leader of the House, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I met with um, Adrian Ferry, one of my constituents who runs a long-term sustainable woodland project in the Elwy Valley region uh, of my constituency. It was visited by the Minister for the Environment uh, just last week, and I was very pleased uh, that she enjoyed her visit there to learn more uh, about uh, the organisation which he runs. But this is precisely the sort of model, I think, which will help to make our rural communities sustainable and help to encourage and promote the use of local and sustainable uh, wood products in the future. And I would be grateful if the uh, Minister for the Environment could bring forward uh, a statement on the support which she might be able to offer to projects like uh, um, Adrian Ferries and others across Wales uh, in terms of promoting the use of local timber uh, in local construction uh, projects. Can I also call uh, Leader of the House uh, for a statement on the future of business rates for independent schools uh, in Wales? There's been quite a bit of concern uh, amongst uh, independent schools uh, across uh, the country. There are 20 uh, in Wales at the moment with thousands of students uh, in them. They add around £87 million uh, to the uh, Welsh economy and generate £22 million worth uh, of taxes uh, here in Wales. Um, you'll be aware that there have been some concerns about the prospects of business rates being charged uh, on uh, independent schools. Now, clearly, I understand that there will want to be, uh, that we want to have a debate, uh, perhaps, on these things, but I do think uh, it's incumbent upon the Welsh Government to give some clarity to the sector, given the significant numbers of people that are employed uh, in it and the significant numbers of pupils who rely on the excellent education which is provided in independent schools across the country. Um, yes, on the Woodland uh, project, uh, the Minister has mentioned that she very much enjoyed her visit there and I think is very happy to bring forward a general statement on woodland management in Wales and the contribution of our woodlands in particular to climate change and adaptation thereof. Um, in terms of business rates, we've had uh, several uh, roundabouts on the subject of business rates for independent schools and I think that's much more likely to come up uh, in terms of a debate from the opposition parties than it is likely to be a subject of a business statement from the government. Di Lloyd. Uh, Leader of the House, can I um, ask for a government statement on, on screening services, uh, particularly as I've had representations recently 
Uh, concerning bowel screening whales, it operates as a bespoke screening service, as you know. Um, yes, sort of vaguely part of the NHS, but, part of, but basically standalone as well. Uh, bowel screening whales does excellent work. However, if someone who has had a previous bowel problem and a negative bowel screen as part of the bowel screening program then develops a new bowel symptom, this cannot be dealt with by bowel screening whales as they only do standalone screening at predetermined intervals, despite the fact that it's a surveillance service. So people, the situation is at the moment, if people then develop a new bowel symptom, despite being under surveillance by bowel screening whales, they're directed back to their GP, who then has the binary choice of urgent referral or routine referral that can take months. Surely, could there be a third way in such a situation of a fast-track referral if a new problem arises when a patient is already under bowel screening whale surveillance? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the member raises a very important, uh, important point, and Llaweth, I'm uh, very pleased to say that on my 60th birthday, I received a bowel screening kit from NHS Wales. Um, I was, uh, it was amongst the uh, less expected presents that I received on my 60th birthday, but it was possibly the most important one. And I, I think it's very important that people take part in that screening. It's a very important thing uh, that we should all do. I'm not familiar with the issue that he raises. I suggest he writes to the Cabinet Secretary, and if that raises a, 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 an issue of more significance than that, I will arrange for a statement. Otherwise, I'll be sure that the reply is available to all AMs. Julie Morgan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I wanted to raise uh, two issues with the um, Leader of the House. The first is the uh, WITCH report, which came out last week, um, revealing the fact that two-thirds of banks have now closed over the last 30 years. Two-thirds of banks have closed, and this has left communities without access to a local bank and leaving high streets empty. And in Cardiff North, we've lost banks from uh, Rabina, Witchurch, Birch Grove, nearly every community. Um, and, in fact, one bank is still empty um, in the centre of a shopping centre, um, which has closed years ago. Um, so I know we have debated um, in the past, you know, in this uh, chamber, the issue of um, banks and bank closures. But perhaps um, would it be possible for the government to have another look at this issue and just see if any more is can, can be done to help some of these communities? Um, and secondly, I wondered if it might be possible to have a debate on Lyme disease. Uh, one of my constituents from Cardiff North is campaigning um, on this issue and in fact we held a meeting in the Pierhead uh, today about um, Lyme disease, um, raising, uh, wanting to raise the profile of the disease, the fact that it is little known and that there are many different complications from it and there have been debates um, in the Scottish Parliament, the um, House of Commons and the House of Lords and will be in the European Parliament. But it does seem it is a little known disease that causes a huge amount of misery for those people who are inflicted with it. Um, yes, two very important points indeed. In terms of the banks, it is something she, uh, she's already acknowledged that we've discussed frequently in the uh, Assembly. And it is very disappointing that despite affected communities and political representatives challenging the decisions across the chamber, actually, I think it's something we've all expressed concern about, the banks do continue to press ahead with their closure programme. Um, and there's, there's no doubt at all that... Uh, Many citizens, older citizens in particular, are not comfortable with online banking. And also small businesses in rural areas have a need for cash. And uh, there's a big problem about how long they, they travel and uh, where they might get the cash from. And there's also a problem with the ATMs starting to close down as well, actually, as people move to cash the systems. Um, ideally, we would like to see businesses and individuals across Wales have access to the banking facilities they want and, where possible, mitigate the loss of any branch and cash point facility in Wales closing, but unfortunately we have some limited powers in, in this regard. However, we have been in discussion on the role of the post office in addressing banking needs. We recognise there are issues around that and we've been working with them to discuss them around the capacity, privacy, disability access and so on at the post office, but that's a very much an ongoing part of the discussion about uh, whether they can substitute for some um, bank branch services. And the other thing is we're investigating the possibility of establishing a community banking model for Wales. We're in early dialogue with a range of stakeholders promoting the idea of a community mutual bank for Wales and that would be able to offer support appropriate to the level of development uh, around Wales and I'll keep the member informed as the proposals for that develop. In terms of Lyme disease, um, in Wales as well as everywhere else in the UK, cases of laboratory confirmed Lyme disease have been increasing in recent years. 
that this is partly as a result of better reporting, increased testing and increased awareness by public and healthcare professionals. The member will be pleased to know that we've recently communicated a comprehensive guidance on Lyme disease to healthcare professionals across Wales and the NHS has developed appropriate public awareness materials um, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that that's an ongoing programme of public awareness and um, medical awareness across the, across the piece. Mohamed Ashka. Officer, Leader of the House, may I ask for a statement from the Cabinet Secretary for Energy, Planning and Rural Affairs on WWF Cymru's claim that one in 15 wildlife species in Wales is at risk of disappearing altogether. They say global threats to wildlife and habitats identified in Living Planet Report 2018 are echoed in Wales. Species under threat includes hen harriers and water wolves. We have seen a comeback in red kite numbers in Wales, thanks to better protection and dedicated conservation programs. So may we have a statement from the Cabinet Secretary on what action she will take to halt wildlife decline and to protect the habitats of threatened species in our beautiful country. I mean, yes, this is very much the central plank of most of our land management systems and indeed most of the um, uh, support for the, in the Rural Development Fund around what we can do to increase um, biodiversity and wildlife habitats. And it's a very important uh, function to understand how bioservices, biosystems um, can be monetized in that way so that people can be encouraged to do it. Um, we have, uh, we have fallen behind in the UK in terms, for example, of tree planting, and we're very, we have very low amounts of tree planting in Wales. And we are looking to see if there are systems in place that can increase the range of habitat and biodiversity available across Wales. It is something we're very concerned about. Um, the Minister for Environment is uh, shortly going to be consulting on a climate change adaptation plan, which we will be including looking at the loss of biodiversity and habitat change. And I encourage all members to respond to the consultation on that plan as early as possible, making the points that Mohamed Ashka has pointed out to us. Leanne Wood. Leader of the House, I've got three matters I'd like to raise with you this afternoon. You'll be aware of the uh, interim report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. It was a very hard-hitting report, pointing out that cuts and austerity are a political choice, that Wales faces the highest relative poverty in the UK, and that 25% of jobs pay below the minimum wage. The report says, and I quote, in the absence of devolved power over social security benefits, the Welsh Government's capacity to directly mitigate the reduction in be benefits is limited. Benefit changes are one of the structural causes behind the increase in poverty, rough sleeping and homelessness in Wales. Universal credit may exacerbate the problem, particularly in the light of the Welsh Government's inability to introduce flexibilities in its administration, unlike its Scottish counterpart. This strongly says that you could help people if you were prepared to take over control and responsibility of the administration of benefits. So far, the government has resisted that, despite the difficulties that we've heard about just this afternoon yeah. in this chamber. So can we have a debate in government time on this UN report with specific focus on the devolution of the administration of welfare? I also wanted to flag up the homophobic attack on Gareth Thomas. Now, I'm sure I speak for most of us, if not all of us, in this chamber when I say Diolch and Fawr iawn, Alfie, for taking a stand and for seeking an educative, restorative response from those responsible. Restorative justice can be very effective, especially when we're talking about young people. So I'd like to see a statement from government outlining its approach to hate crimes in general, like the homophobic attack on Gareth Thomas, and also to tell us what it's doing to fund uh, supp and support restorative justice opportunities. The final matter I'd like to see in government time is an apology. We've already heard this afternoon that rail services since this new franchise have got worse and the company issued a full apology to its customers today and while your government has responsibility for this, we had no uh, such apology from the First Minister today. He still seems to be in denial. The most concerning line in the company's apology was in relation to extra buses that they are putting on, saying this will continue for as long as is needed. There are real health and safety issues now, and this simply cannot 
carry on. So we need a statement from the Cabinet Secretary as a matter of urgency to say what extra action he can take to alleviate these problems. Customers are not prepared to take any more. Oh, well, thank you for those, uh, uh, raising those three issues. Um, just in terms of the uh, homophobic hate crime, I also want to add my voice in uh, acknowledging the courage and the dignity with which Car uh, Gareth Thomas uh, met uh, the situation he found himself in and, uh, and the courage in coming forward in highlighting and tackling the issue of homophobia uh, and his experience. I thought his, uh, his piece that I heard on the radio about the restorative justice process was, was deeply moving and very interesting indeed. We have actually just recently um, talked in this chamber about the hate crime awareness that we do. We do continue to encourage victims of hate crime to, to report their experiences and build on the strong partnerships we've developed across the piece with the police, the CPS, Victim Support Cymru and other agencies um, to reduce that kind of hate crime and to hold perpetrators to account and to enable victims to receive support and redress. And this is very uh, a key conversation on White Ribbon Day and uh, the event that uh, my colleague Joyce Watson am sponsoring earlier and the uh, issues that uh, Jane Hatt raised in her question to the First Minister, are still germane in this piece. Hate crimes are hate crimes no matter uh, how they arise or which section of the population is experiencing them. And we are looking uh, to work with our partners and victim support and uh, hate crime awareness um, to see what we can do with restorative justice. And my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Public Services, has been looking into this as well in, uh, with a view to uh, looking what we can do in this regard. So I'd be uh, very happy to see if I can... Um, uh, bring forward a statement to that effect. Actually, I think, given where we are in the cycle of government, there's going to be a, a statement, I hope, on human rights um, towards the end of, the, of this government's term, and I will make sure that, uh, that I put that issue into that statement, because otherwise we'll, we'll be out of uh, government time. So I'll make sure that that's included in that as, as part of that, because I do think the member raises a very, very interesting point. On the other two points, um, the UN Rapporteur's uh, report is, is uh, harrowing reading, I think, and says a lot of things that a lot of us agree with around the benefit system and the difficulties of living in poverty. I think the gov this government has done a great deal in its programme for government and its um, prosperity for all uh, policy platforms in order to, to do what we can. But uh, the member will know that I and the government completely disagree with her take on the welfare benefits regime. And uh, my own particular view is that uh, the UK is better to be redistributive and the idea that Wales can stand alone in terms of welfare benefits is not one which I would cherish or, or relish in any way. In terms of Wales services, the First Minister, uh, uh, in answer to Darren Miller, gave quite a good run through of where we are on rail services, Lareth, and I don't think it requires any more addition from me. Andrew Artie Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On that very last point, I was going to um, ask for a statement, but I'm quite surprised at how dismissive the Leader of the House has been on that. Uh, many constituents over the last week certainly have contacted myself and has been evidenced here today with the Leader of the Opposition's comments and the Member from Pride Cymru's comments, uh, and hard evidence of trains just not turning up. I mean, I think on 16 cases there were no trains on one particular line, uh, north, south, mid or west, as you can find examples of that. When the franchise was launched, ministers were all over the press, and rightly so, because it promises much, and if delivered correctly, will see an improvement. But members in this House are getting berated time and time again by their constituents about the level of service that has happened over the last month. It surely is incumbent on the Cabinet Secretary to come to this House before the Christmas recess and highlight what action is being taken to address hopefully shortcomings that are in the short term, not the medium to long term. And, he would, and I would hope that the Cabinet Secretary will welcome that opportunity to put on record what pressure he is putting on Transport for Wales and their contractors to up their game. Otherwise, it will be a dereliction of duty on behalf of the government. I do hope that the Leader of the House will reflect on the answer she just gave and make time for a statement for the Cabinet Secretary to come here before the Christmas recess to address these failings within the transport system here in Wales. I said I didn't have anything to add to the comprehensive answer that the First Minister had gave. I don't see how that's dismissive. The Cabinet Secretary will be answering oral assembly questions as part of the cycle over the next few weeks, and there will be an ample opportunity for members to question him on specifics. But I'm afraid I think the idea that after one month of running a franchise we should have solved all problems and, and all the rest of it is, is just not credible. 
We have been in charge of the franchise for one month. The, the Cabinet Secretary, in, in uh, announcing that, set out a programme of, of uh, action uh, uh, to do with the rail uh, franchise, which the First Minister reiterated during First Minister's questions. I'm merely saying that I don't have anything to add to that at the moment, and if you want to ask specific questions of the Cabinet Secretary, you will, of course, be very free to do so. I'd like to ask for an update on ongoing parking problems along the A5 in the Lake Ogwen area in my constituency. Over a year has passed since local representatives asked for action and a particular plan to find a swift resolution to the problem in this area. Six months have passed since the Minister received um, a study of the problems, but again there has been no progress made. In a written question from me asking when that feasibility study on the parking problem would be published, the response I received was that the report was being translated. So there are two issues arising that I'd like you to look into. Is it common practice to take six months to translate reports? And secondly, what is happening in order to resolve the parking problems near Lake Ogwen? And secondly, I'm afraid that once again I do have to ask about the timetable for the building of the Bontnewydd Bypass. A session for prospective apprentices was cancelled recently and there is no talk of any work on the site and naturally therefore people in my area are starting to become concerned about what is happening and are asking whether there is to be even more delay with the bypass. Well, on that second one, I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary to write directly to her and explain where we are on the timetable. I'm afraid I don't have that information with me, but I'll ask him to clarify. On the first point, um, Again, I, I didn't realise the time to get it slipped that much, and I'm more than happy to discuss with the Cabinet Secretary where we are on the time scale and let the member know. Mark Reckless. Uh, could we have a, a statement on the M4 relief road? When you um, stood in for the First Minister on the 23rd of October, Leader of the House, you um, promised a binding vote in, in government time and then said this was timetable for the week commencing 4th of December. We now have the business uh, timetable through to Christmas, and there's no, no sign of any motion uh, on the M4. Did you, uh, did you misspeak? Um, could you also perhaps um, give us the government's perspective on the First Minister's interview on the 15th of November, asked by BBC Wales whether he still intended to decide whether the road is built. Uh, the First Minister said, yes, the plan is that I will take the decision. Is that the case? And if so, isn't it just the planning permission that the First Minister would be determining, as opposed to whether the road would actually be funded and built? Uh, he then went on to say that the inspector's report has been received. It's more than 500 pages long, so it takes some time to digest and analyse, as some of us know, with the withdrawal agreement. Um, but he then said, I've not seen the report yet, but I expect the report will be ready for me to take a decision by the end of the month. Surely, if it's so long and complex, the First Minister should be given it as quickly as possible if he's genuinely going to take the decision himself, rather than just rubber stamp someone else's decision. And while he's about it, could it be published so we could all read it too? I mean, yes, in answer to this question, when I did stand in for the First Minister and First Minister's questions, I read out a very long and complex legal timescale and process, which was attached to the point in time at which people can take various decisions and so on. I'm more than happy to circulate that back to the member. I, I made it very clear that there was a process, a legal process in which we were, that we were awaiting the various legal advices and summaries of evidence and so on, that the First Minister still uh, hopes to be able to make that decision and that the debate will then follow. I've also made it very clear in answer to Renap Yorith uh, in a, a business statement very recently that the, we've left the space on the timetable for that to happen if it can, but that I was not in, uh, I, I could not be guaranteeing that it would. We will do it if we can. If it's not possible within the time scale, then Flower, I will be very uh, sure to make both business committee and this chamber aware of where we are with it. Pathan Syed. Um, there was an event in the UK Parliament yesterday by the Cystic Fibrosis Trust to mark three years since they had been campaigning for uh, the drug or can be to be put onto the NHS and we had a cross-party meeting here last week uh, with regards to this important issue as well. Now a Healthier Wales, um, your strategy um, says that we need to be having more personalised care, more precision medicines on the NHS but or can be which could affect 200 people in Wales is still not on the NHS. Now I understand um, that uh, Vertex, uh, 
uh, the company that has the drug are now in discussions uh, with uh, the NHS in relation to putting in a new application to NICE. Uh, but we don't have that um, on the record anyway from Welsh Government. So I was wondering whether we could have an updated statement uh, from the Cabinet Secretary of Health as to his uh, negotiations with the company and with the Cystic Fibrosis Trust to try and make this drug um, realised um, on the Welsh NHS. If we did that, we could be leading um, on a UK level because nowhere else does this drug exist in the UK. But, of course, the Republic of Ireland, Denmark, Norway, um, many of the countries already have the drug that can um, look to the root cause of cystic fibrosis as opposed to only managing the symptoms. So I would urge you for a statement um, on that. Uh, the second statement I wanted to ask for was... Um, Alongside other Assembly members here in this room, we were at um, St Joseph's Comprehensive School yesterday as part of a Youth Parliament um, debate, and one of the uh, young uh, students came up to me afterwards and said that she had been waiting on a waiting list for school counselling for over a year, by which point she'd already sought private treatment uh, because uh, she couldn't wait for that uh, list to be on that list for uh, her to get any treatment. Now, I know uh, uh, Lynn Eagle and others have uh, been looking hard at uh, mental health uh, for young people, but it was very concerning to me to hear that uh, from a young person when we have the school counselling uh, processes in place in Wales. So could we have an update on uh, the situation here in Wales? Are there long waiting lists in, in schools across Wales? Is this something we need to get to grips with? Because young people, of course, will be falling through the cra cracks if that is the case. I mean, so not all can be. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, went through the situation um, in, in, in response to his last lot of questions where uh, he outlined the process by which uh, the company has to go through the process of getting uh, accreditation via NICE. Uh, I'm not aware that anything has changed since he, that, since he explained where we were with that. What I will do is discuss with him whether something has changed, and if something has changed, then I will make sure that Assembly members are, are kept in the loop of that. But I'm not aware of that. If, if something has changed, then I will uh, make sure that there's an update. Uh, but he did, he did go quite extensively through what the process need, need, needed to be for that to happen. And likewise, on the mental health issues, he, he went through the whole process of that. But again, I will discuss with him whether there's some some substantial change or some evidence has come to light that the member, perhaps the member would like to share with me the story that she's just uh, outlined and I will undertake to discuss with him whether there's some issue there of general importance that we could come back on. Nick Ramsey. Uh, Leader of the House, I asked you last week, I think it was, certainly recently, about the availability of flu vaccine across Wales and whether we could have an update from the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health on that availability. Um, since then, I've been inundated by uh, more emails uh, by people who've been unable to access the vaccine. Uh, one only uh, yesterday, uh, a patient of the Castlegate practice uh, in Monmouth whose husband is 75 and was told that because they are now prioritising for the over 75s, uh, the vaccine wouldn't yet be available for him and to come back uh, later when some arrives. Uh, I understand from Age Cymru that there has been, they've identified an issue uh, that early on in this process, some practices and community pharmacies underestimated the amount of vaccine they might need, and so uh, not enough was uh, therefore in the system be, to be provided, and they're working on that. So could you ask the Cabinet Secretary to, have to look at all of this issue? Because although I understand that there are going to be vaccines uh, uh, arriving hopefully before the end of November, um, that hasn't been necessarily best communicated to patients, and many of them uh, have been very concerned. So hopefully this can be dealt with better in future. Uh, secondly and finally, can I concur with the, uh, the words of the Leader of the Opposition earlier, also the, uh, the, the member for South Wales Central, who sits behind me normally, uh, with regard to uh, the issue um, with uh, Transport for Wales and some of those... Uh, whatever you might want to call it, teething problems, uh, getting things back on track. Uh, there clearly has been an issue, and it's important that beyond the apology, which they have given, and I respect the fact that they have been very quick off the mark to apologise to, uh, to travellers, uh, that something there does need to be uh, looked at. Um, my, uh, my very own uh, uh, pregnant wife was affected um, by the problem recently, uh, when, uh, which you'll know from Facebook, I know many of you will be aware of that. Uh, where uh, trade, I think it was three successive trains didn't have sufficient carriages so she wasn't able to get on I was the one who got the flack for that uh, uh, or got the earache later in the day so it was in my interest to be looked at so if you could, if you could uh, uh, have discussions with the Cabinet Secretary about what can be done to, uh, to try and uh, alleviate some of these teething problems of the franchise that would be very beneficial 
Um, yes, uh, my sympathy with your wife. I, I uh, also follow her on Facebook, so I did know about that. And as I said, I haven't got much to add to anything else I said on the rail. On flu uh, vaccine, the member raises a very um, uh, pertinent point. I think it's worth with me just repeating um, what the Cabinet Secretary has told people. For winter 2018-19, a flu vaccine specifically designed for older people has been licensed in the UK. The advice from the UK's expert panel on immunisation, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, is that this adjuvanted vaccine is expected to be more clinically effective in people aged 65 years or over compared with the other flu vaccines that are available, and, it, and that it is the only flu vaccine that is likely to be effective in people aged 75 and older. There is not a shortage of flu vaccine for over 65. All orders submitted by GPs and pharmacists in Wales will be met, but delivery, delivery is phased due to demand. The manufacturer has confirmed that all orders will be delivered before the end of November. It's important that the flu vaccine offered to at-risk individuals provides the best available protection. With the high levels of flu we experienced last season, resulting in increased GP consultation rates in at-risk care homes and in hospitals, it's sensible to act on the expert advice to do everything we can. So we're looking to people to choose the most effective flu vaccine for them, uh, demographically. I appreciate what the member is highlighting is that delay in receiving uh, flu vaccine may be worrying for older people, but flu does not tend to start to circulate until mid-December, so there's plenty of time yet for the flu vaccine to arrive and for people to be protected. Um, the Chief Medical Officer has already written to health boards, GPs, pharmacies with advice about planning arrangements for offering the flu vaccination to older people this season in light of the availability. Um, and we are aware that a very small number of practices, as I think Nick, Nick Ramsey was highlighting, didn't order the adjuvanted vaccine as recommended by the Chief Medical Officer or did not order, it, order enough of their eligible patients. In those cases, or where deliveries of vaccine have not yet been received, we've asked health boards, practices and community pharmacies to work together to ensure that individuals can access the adjuvanted vaccine as soon as possible, prioritising those over 75 and those over 65 with medical conditions. Um, and uh, we are working with Public Health Wales and the NHS to ensure that that vaccine supply um, situation does not impact on any uptake. So I think we are working very hard to do that. We're not yet at the point where all of the vaccina vaccines have been delivered, and I think that should be very reassuring to Nick Ramsey's constituents. Thank you, Leader of the House. The next item is postponed until the 11th of December. That's item three. And we move, therefore, to item four, statement by the First Minister on the draft agreement on the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. And I call on the First Minister, Karen Jones. It's uh, symptomatic of the handling of the UK Government's Brexit negotiations that I'm providing an update to Assembly members amidst the worst political crisis I've seen. As I'll explain, it's a crisis that could have been avoided, a crisis rooted in a reluctance to be honest about the difficult trade-offs needed in the negotiations and an unwillingness to build a broad consensus, including with the devolved administrations, about the approach to the unprecedented challenges of leaving the European Union. And now, of course, we have the hardline Brexiteers in the Conservative Party who are actively working to bring about a no-deal outcome, seeking to deepen the political crisis still further with a leadership election. Uh, today, Llawydd, I want to set out the Welsh Government's position on the agreement and outline the next steps that need to be taken and taken urgently by the UK Government. It's important, of course, to make the distinction between the withdrawal agreement and the future economic relationship that will need to be set out in the political declaration. Now, many aspects of the withdrawal agreement are desperately needed. Securing the transition period is absolutely essential to avoid the cliff edge in just four months' time. The protection of citizens' rights will secure the status of the EU citizens who have made their lives here, contributing to our economy and our public services, and also those of UK nationals who have chosen to live and work or retire elsewhere in Europe. It's shameful that the UK Government has used the EU and UK citizens as a tactical pawn in what is a party political chess game. Now, we fully recognise the importance of securing the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland to make sure that Brexit does not put at risk the peace and prosperity that agreement has brought to the island of Ireland. And as I have said ad nauseum in this chamber on a number of occasions, that the border issues on the island of Ireland are at the very heart of Brexit, and they demonstrate the failings of the latest agreement and those of the Prime Minister. We understand why, given the dangerous nonchalance of some in the Conservative Party about the Good Friday Agreement, that uh, the EU27 needs a robust guarantee that there will be no return to a hard border. 
Elements of the backstop are at best problematic, but they would never need to be implemented if the UK Government embraced a solution which recognises the importance of the closest possible relationship between the UK as a whole and the EU short of membership. If the UK Government had adopted the position we set out jointly with Plaid Cymru almost two years ago for a future economic relationship that included full and unfettered access to the single market and a customs union, there would be no need to ever invoke any backstop arrangements. But what we have instead from the UK Government is a totally inadequate political declaration. The real failure of the current deal is the worrying lack of progress in and lack of clarity of the political declaration. What has the UK Government been doing for the last two years? We have no idea what the UK's future relationship with our largest and most influential trading partner will look like. Uh, and the reason for this is the Prime Minister is continuing with her failed strategy of looking inwards, focusing on managing the internal turmoil of the Conservative Party and not focusing on the needs of the UK as a whole uh, and the interests of Wales and the other nations. I mean, the political crisis is all of the UK Government's own making. It needn't have been this way. The Prime Minister has spent the last two years, unfortunately, encouraging the expectations of uh, militant, ideologically driven hard Brexiteers in her own party, and small wonder they feel let down by what she has tabled. She now, of course, belatedly needs to face down those in her party who will never support a relationship with EU27. She needs to listen to the views of the business community, the trades unions and the devolved governments, and she could then begin to negotiate the right deal with EU27. In Brussels, the EU27 have been clear that if the UK Government moves away from their misjudged red lines and embraces a closer economic relationship, one that we set out in securing Wales's future, <laughs> then a cleaner, more coherent and favourable deal can be achieved. And while we see the UK Government's position moving ever closer to ours, by only doing so in the most reluctant way, kicking and screaming, the Prime Minister has lost all the negotiating advantage he could have achieved. Now, rather than platitudes under subject headings, with next to nothing on uh, key issues like future migration and participation in programmes such as Horizon Plus or Erasmus, the political declaration needs to be based on a firm mutual commitment from the UK and the EU27 to a future relationship grounded in long-term participation in the customs union and the single market across all sectors. Now, this is on offer. Michel Barnier has repeatedly talked about his preferred model being Norway Plus, but progressing this has not been possible with the UK Government intent on clinging to their red lines. So, what needs to change before we could even consider supporting this deal? Well, perhaps relatively little in the withdrawal agreement itself, apart from ensuring that the backstop is never needed. And if our proposal of a long-term customs union is accepted, any theoretical case for the backstop largely evaporates. But we do need a fundamental rewriting of the political declaration and a fundamental change of mindset to be honest about the fact that the UK Government has made it a clear choice to prioritise our economic stability over the soundbite of taking back control of our laws, borders and money. And no one voted in the referendum, surely, for the economic and social catastrophe of a no-deal departure. We need to see a political declaration that sets out the intent of both sides to negotiate a long-term relationship that clearly reflects the choices of securing Wales's future, something which is no longer unrealistic given the position the UK Government has already moved to. That approach would render the backstop unnecessary and would provide certainty for our people and our businesses that there won't be another cliff edge in December 20. 20, and in practical terms, it would almost certainly command a large majority in the House of Commons. Time is very short until the European Council, but the political declaration is clearly work in progress. And following my demand for an urgent meeting at yesterday's meeting of the JMC on EU negotiations, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance set out again our view on the right future relationship with the EU27. So the final position of the Welsh Government will be determined in the light of whether or not the UK Government at this late stage sees sets. Paul Davis. Uh, dear Mr. Mm -hmm. can I thank the First Minister for his statement this afternoon. Whilst I'm disappointed with the tone of today's statement, the First Minister does confirm that to support this deal relatively little in the draft withdrawal agreement needs to change. And so, Llywydd, my first question is in that case, can the First Minister explain why on earth he and his government are not supporting this withdrawal agreement? Of course, as the Prime Minister has made absolutely clear, 
Although this represents a significant breakthrough, it is not the final deal, and negotiations to produce a full political declaration are now taking place. Now, in today's statement, the First Minister has made it clear that he believes the UK Government's approach shows a lack of any meaningful engagement with the devolved administrations. But I have to say, the First Minister has not extended any invitations. The First Minister has not extended any invitations to discuss the impact of the withdrawal agreement on Wales with me as party leader in this place. And since I've been in this job, the Welsh Government has not extended any invitations to discuss Welsh Government legislation with me as leader. And so it's a bit rich to talk about engagement if that engagement only ever seems to be one way. Therefore, does the First Minister agree with me that rather than playing party politics, it would have been far better for Assembly leaders to have met and discussed the proposals and the impact these proposals will have on Wales and the operation of the Assembly? If the, if the genuine view of the Welsh Government is to respect the 2016 referendum result and deliver a Brexit agreement that works for Welsh businesses and communities, then perhaps the communication channels have to be open both in Wales and in Westminster. So with the tone of today's statement and the First Minister's commentary on UK Conservative internal party relationships is a bit rich when you look at the discipline of some Welsh Government ministers and does nothing remotely constructive to support Welsh industry. Indeed, it makes Wales look weak in leadership at a time when the country should be focusing on getting the best possible deal for its people. Now, the draft withdrawal agreement confirmed a time-limited implementation period that provides a bridge to the future relationship, allowing businesses to continue trading as now until the end of 2020. I hope that's something that the First Minister would welcome, and I'd be grateful for his comments on that implementation period. The First Minister makes it clear in today's statement that the Prime Minister needs to listen to the views of the business community. But let me remind him that the CBI has made it clear that, and I quote, this deal is a compromise, including for business, but it offers that essential transitional period as a step back from the cliff edge, unquote. Indeed, he will also be aware of the views of the Chief Executive of Aston Martin, Andy Palmer, who has said the draft Brexit, de Brexit deal was good enough. Therefore, perhaps it's the First Minister, perhaps it's the First Minister who needs to listen to the views of the business community, who have made it clear that the Labour Party should work with business, not seek to control it. And so can he confirm what initial discussions he's had with business leaders in Wales, so that, when, so that we can be sure their views will be accurately reflected when Welsh Government Ministers continue to discuss the impact of the draft withdrawal agreement with their Westminster counterparts in the coming weeks? Now, as the First Minister is aware, the Welsh agricultural industry is closely integrated with the European market, and I'm sure he will have seen the comments issued by NFU Cymru, again, cautiously welcoming the draft agreement as a step closer to delivering the free and frictionless trade that Welsh farmers want to see with the EU. Of course, NFU Cymru has also made it abundantly clear, as well as uh, FUW, uh, as well, that there are question marks over whether the draft agreement will secure parliamentary approval and that Welsh farmers now look to its politicians to do what is best for the country. Therefore, in those circumstances, perhaps the First Minister could tell us what he's doing to ensure that Welsh MPs fully endorse the views of the farming industry in Wales so that all Welsh politicians will put the needs and sustainability of the industry at the top of their agenda. Of course, there's still plenty of detail that's yet to be firmly meted out in the UK Government's draft withdrawal agreement. For example, one issue is around the lack of firm detail on the impact of this agreement on Britain's fishing industry, of which Wales plays a significant role. As I understand it, the British fishing industry continues to call for the UK to abandon the common fisheries policy and develop it as an independent coastal state by the end of 2020. But there's some ambiguity surrounding access for EU vessels to British waters. Therefore, perhaps the First Minister could tell us what the Welsh Government's view is on this specific issue and what representations he and his colleagues have made to ascertain what the draft withdrawal agreement will mean for Welsh fisheries. <laughs> Now, in the past few weeks, the First Minister has made it clear that the last thing the Welsh Government wants to see is a hard border between Ireland and Wales, and I very much agree with him. He has said that there could be huge implications, particularly on the road structure 
leading to our ports. Now, First Minister, the case for duelling the A40 in my constituency has been made since the 1950s, and I have continually asked government ministers in this chamber about commitments to duelling this road, and we have seen nothing since the creation of the Assembly to deliver genuine improvements to existing road networks. The Assembly's External Affairs and Additional Legislation Committee report into the implications of Brexit for Welsh ports last year confirmed that Wales had previously not taken full advantage of the funding associated with the trans-European uh, network. Therefore, in light of the Welsh Government's new concerns for the road structures around Welsh ports, can you now tell us what plans you have to genuinely start tackling these long-standing issues. Now this, now, this brings me to the wider point about preparing for Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, where it appears as though there are plenty of issues that the Welsh Government could be addressing within its own competences, and yet there seems to be little evidence of real action being taken. Whilst it is easy to criticise the UK Government, Government Ministers in Wales could and should do more to start addressing some of the issues raised in Assembly Committee reports surrounding the implications of Brexit and Wales, rather than just commentating on UK Government policies and announcements. Therefore, shall we then closing, can I thank the First Minister for his statement. We on this side of the chamber look forward to scrutinising the detail of this draft agreement and its impact on Wales in the coming weeks, and we look forward to working where we can with both the UK Government and the Welsh Government to prepare the best possible deal for the people of Wales. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his comments. He asks uh, what the issue is with regard to the withdrawal agreement. It's longevity, really. I mean, there, there, when, it seems to me that the agreement kicks the can down the road. Uh, where will we be in December 2020? Will we be in exactly the same situation again? Uh, we've already had two years, uh, and here we find ourselves in a situation where the agreement is not um, permanent. Uh, our position is quite simple, and that is we want to see full and unfettered access to the single market and to remain in the customs union. Anything that, that is short of that, clearly, uh, is not something that we could agree uh, to. He is right to say that businesses and others have cautiously welcomed the uh, deal, but that, I believe, is because they think the alternative is no deal at all, which nobody wants. Uh, so I can, I can imagine why uh, people would want to support this deal uh, for fear that there's nothing else on the table. But I believe it is possible uh, to uh, look again uh, at certainly the political uh, declaration and to be more certain about the way forward. That means making a commitment to the customs union and to the single market. I have to say, I think the Prime Minister has painted herself in a corner on this. She needn't have run the general election last year on the basis of um, putting before the British people uh, the vision of a hardish Brexit, which they didn't accept. Uh, and she has found it difficult to get out of the corner that, that, that she has found herself in. But I have to say, he, he makes reference to my tone. My tone is as of nothing compared to those of his own colleagues in London. Uh, it, his own colleagues in London uh, have openly called for the Prime Minister to resign. They have open, been openly uh, abusive, really, actually, in, in terms of the way they have described her. Uh, the reality is that, that I have been, uh, I think, gentle compared to uh, the tone that has been adopted by Conservative politicians. And this is the problem, isn't it? Yes, there are those in my party who take a different view. There are some in my party in, in Westminster who, who are Brexiteers. There are not many of them, but they are there. The problem is that the divisions in the Conservative Party are so vast that it's very difficult to see how there can be any unity in that party around a vision for Brexit. And that we can, he, he says plain politics, the worry I have is, where does it end? Um, there's no leadership, because there can't be. We have a Prime Minister who's lost, who has lost a lot of uh, ministers, cabinet ministers who have resigned. We have a number in her party who don't support her own policy. In those circumstances, he says that each of in, in the Welsh Government is weak. Well, you can only point at London and say, where is the leadership in London, given the circumstances that, uh, that exist uh, there? We have always been constant in what we have called for. We, were always, we laid out our vision two years ago as to what we wanted. We do work with the UK Government. You know, I will single out David Liddington as somebody who it is possible to, to, to work with and to uh, discuss issues uh, with. You know, the, 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 there is a relationship there. It is not consistent, because other UK Government departments uh, see things uh, in a slightly different uh, light. He mentions that there is a need for a bridge. That may be right, but a bridge to what? 
at the moment, we don't know where that bridge leads, and that is the problem. Two years ago, there was talk of constructing a bridge, and now there is still talk of constructing a bridge, but we don't know what the final destination actually is. And listening to the views of the business community, their view is quite simply this, they want certainty. And whilst this might provide a temporary level of certainty, it doesn't provide the certainty that they need, particularly with regard to their ability to access skilled uh, labour. As far as the agriculture industry is, uh, is concerned, well, there are many issues there that need to be resolved. Market access is key. Without market access, you know, sheep farming particularly can't survive in Wales. Uh, the UK market simply isn't, isn't uh, big enough uh, to support the UK's own sheep meat industry. So it's not simply a question of supporting farmers, it's, it's ensuring that they have access to their market as well. The same is true of fishing. It's one thing to have access, uh, if sufficient access, as you would see it, to your own coastal waters. But when you're utterly dependent on exporting the fish, you have to ensure that you've got a market for those fish as well. It would be no good for the UK to uh, be able to land more fish, even if that were, were possible. I don't believe that's possible. Uh, because of the uh, low level of fish stocks, th the reality is that most of those fish have no market. So that has to be looked at as, as well. Uh, he mentioned the issue of the hard border. Work is being carried out through uh, a ports group as to how that would move forward. I have to say to him it would be uh, Pembroke Dock rather than Fishguard, which would be the emphasis in terms of freight. Fishguard tends to take uh, people. Uh, Pembroke Dock tends to take freight, and Hollyhead takes, takes both. Uh, he says that nothing's been done to improve the road. Well, the Rose and Wortham bypass is there. Uh, the Llandora bypass is there, of course, uh, heading off towards uh, Pembroke Dock in the, in the other direction. So there have been road improvements there as well. But it's, that's not the issue. The issue is not what happens on those roads. It, it's what happens at the ports. If we have a situation where uh, the UK government decides to take a heavy hand in terms of customs, that will lead to delays. And that will mean the need for accommodation at those ports rather than further on down the, uh, down the roads. We don't know what that will look like. We don't know what level of checks will be implemented. We assume there'll be no passport control because the CTA has been preserved. Uh, but will there be an element of, of customs checks? How will they be carried out? Will they be random? Will they be heavy? None of these questions have been answered. So it's very difficult to prepare our ports for uh, a scenario that's not yet clear. But as I said, there is a ports working group that has been set up with the UK government to look at this. And in terms of preparing for withdrawal, we are already on track for doing that. I've said before, a no-deal Brexit is not something that can be prepared for. It can't be mitigated against. Uh, it can't be seen as one option amongst many. It's a disastrous uh, outcome. And we have, through the EU Transition Fund, uh, and through working with uh, businesses and with our farmers, of course, put in uh, place uh, what needs to be done in order to promote Wales in the future, to give Wales more markets in the future by expanding our overseas offices. Uh, and, but, of course, Ultimately, if we cannot get the trading relationship right between our closest, biggest market, that will always be our closest, biggest market, then we will not get it right with any other market. Adam Price. Uh, dear Officer, so with, um, I'm very grateful for the, uh, to the First Minister for the statement uh, today. I, I think it was a, a useful and, and fair uh, summary of where we, we currently are. What I, what I was struggling uh, to discern in it was um, a strategy as to, as to how we go forward, how, how we avoid uh, the political uh, cataclysm that is opening up uh, in front of us. It is, of course, uh, I think, the, you know, the key salient fact of the, of the draft withdrawal uh, agreement, all 585 pages, that it doesn't mention Wales even as a footnote, you know. Even the, uh, the, uh, the 1888 uh, version of the, uh, of the Encyclopedia Britannica did better than uh, that. And, you know, and it says something pretty central, doesn't it, about the attitude of the Westminster government uh, to Wales and devolved administrations. And the First Minister himself has, uh, has himself rightly complained about the fact that it, uh, the, the draft agreement wasn't even shared uh, in advance uh, with uh, the Welsh Government and indeed perhaps the First Minister can say whether the same is going to be true of the, uh, the redraft, the 20-page uh, the uh, version of the political declaration we're told is being worked on uh, at the moment. But in the light of, of that, surely uh, the Welsh Government's decision to place its trust in the Westminster Government in handing over our powers to them is at best na naive and at worst reckless. And perhaps can the First Minister explain I understand the point that he, he made earlier at First Minister's questions in terms of 
wanting to keep to uh, the intergovernmental agreement. But can you explain the timing, not just in the light of the case that uh, is before the Supreme Court, but also the, the, the very simple fact that the UK government may not may collapse in the next few weeks. Therefore, why not postpone this decision to see how things uh, develop, uh, as he said, at this time of the greatest political crisis probably uh, in our lifetime. Now, Plaid Cymru has clearly said that we will not support uh, the withdrawal agreement as it currently stands. Uh, it rips Wales out of, of the single market and the customs union. It actually ignores Wales uh, completely and our, and our particular interests. And it's silent, as the First Minister said, uh, in, uh, in terms of the, uh, the parameters and the shape of the, the uh, future economic uh, relationship. Now, I'm glad to see that we're going to have a meaningful vote on the meaningful vote, to use the parliamentary jargon of the day. Um, can the First Minister uh, uh, confirm that uh, we will also have the opportunity for a range of amendments which, which will, which will uh, reflect the range of views between parties and also within parties in terms of possible solutions uh, to the political crisis that he referred to. And in particular, uh, can we have a commitment to allow uh, those members on, on his backbenches that take a, 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 a view of unequivocal support for the people's vote as probably the best solution going forward, but not just his backbenches, but also in his front benches, as we've heard during the course of the leadership campaign, so that we can have a free vote for those members uh, who wish to uh, uh, voice that uh, position. Um, in you mentioned that uh, you uh, um, asked uh, for an urgent meeting of the, of the, of the JMC uh, that took place last night. Uh, can you say, that given that these are extraordinary times, if you sought a meeting of the plenary uh, of the JMC before uh, you uh, leave uh, office? We agree with you that, that uh, there's been two years of prevarication. Time is not on our side now to provide a workable solution going forward, whether that's uh, single market membership, membership of the customs union, whether it's a, a people's vote. Do you agree that now is the time uh, to extend Article 50 uh, uh, in order to allow us that time to provide that uh, sensible uh, way uh, forward? Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I noticed earlier remarks that actually there's been a complete failure of Westminster politics. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I was down in Westminster earlier today meeting with the First Minister of Scotland trying to provide some kind of sensible way forward, trying to find common ground among opposition parties uh, in, in order that we actually can provide the kind of leadership that's been sadly lacking. Would he agree, though, that that vacuum of leadership that certainly characterised the Conservative government has also been at play within his own party at Westminster because of divisions within the Labour Party at the Westminster level on this issue as well? And surely we should take the opportunity, when it comes to a vote in this Parliament, to provide the kind of leadership that has been lacking and send an unequivocal message that we do want to see, uh, at the very least, Wales retaining its membership of the single market, but better still, for us to have a people's vote to remain within the European Union. It, well, he, he asked, I, I thank the leader of for his comments, he asked about the, the strategy going forward. There will be a debate uh, in this place, either next week or the beginning of the week after, our understanding is that the vote in Westminster will take place in the final week of Westminster sitting, which is a week after, of course, the Assembly rises. So it will be essential that there is a, a vote uh, a debate in this place so that uh, the uh, MPs can be aware of the views of AMs. I understand the discussions have taken place around holding it possibly uh, Thursday next week or possibly another day. It would have to be, I think, um, a specific day allocated for such an important debate rather than try to shoehorn it in to uh, government business between now and, uh, and Christmas. So I, I, I certainly accept uh, that that needs to be done. I can say to him that Cabinet agreed a motion yesterday. Uh, that motion needs to go, of course, to our group, as you can imagine. It, it tries to be as all-encompassing as possible. It includes, for example, the need to look at extending the Article 50 period. I think that's inevitable uh, if, there's going to be, uh, if there is to be a uh, a, a look again at the, with the, um, the political declaration particularly. Uh, it also, of course, makes reference to um, the need for the public to be involved and the need for there to be options on the table uh, that, that, are not ex that do not exclude any option. And that will form part of the motion and uh, perhaps uh, that's something that he can uh, see when that motion is, is produced. The, the, he is right to say 
that neither the, my colleague, the First Minister of Scotland, nor myself have access to these documents at what I think is an appropriate time. Now, I can understand a reluctance in government to share documents with another government for fear of what might happen to those documents. Well, I've said over and over again, uh, if, we are, uh, if we receive documents in confidence, we'll keep them in confidence. Uh, all we need to do is, to, to, if we breach that confidence, what, all that happens then is that we, we don't get those documents again. And besides, of course, a lot of documents could be shared with me on Privy Council terms, uh, which uh, would uh, mean uh, that those documents should be, could be shared in confidence at that time. Uh, he mentions the intergovernmental agreement. He, he takes a different view to me on this, uh, but my view is we have an agreement. Uh, part of that agreement was that the Continuity Act would go. Uh, as I said, it, 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 I mean, Westminster could simply repeal it anyway uh, with, with one line. But what, we have ha what the Continuity Act has delivered for us is an intergovernmental agreement, uh, which uh, has been signed up to by uh, both governments. Uh, there is no indication the UK government would want to move away uh, from that. It may be that uh, there's a new government in Westminster in the, in the next few weeks, or a new leader in Westminster in the next few weeks, but the same is true here. Uh, although I doubt very much any of my successors would want to move away from, the, uh, fr from that agreement. So I think having sought and negotiated an agreement, it is essential that we keep good faith of that agreement and honour our obligations uh, under it. He mentions JMCP. I am meeting the Prime Minister tomorrow. Uh, we have made representations regarding JMCP. The date that uh, so far has come back is a date where I can guarantee I won't be there because it's after my time as First Minister. Uh, so we are seeking to have a JMC plenary uh, sooner than that. It is essential and it, is, it will be hugely uh, important. Uh, in terms of uh, well, leadership in Westminster, we all see what, um, what, what's been happening in the last few days. Uh, it does nobody uh, any good to find a situation where it's not possible almost on an hourly basis to know whether the government will survive or not. Uh, in the business world, that's something that they certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't welcome, which is why, of course, we've urged on the UK government, and we worked with Plaid Cymru on this, uh, with the White Paper, uh, to adopt a pragmatic, sensible approach to uh, Brexit that recognises the importance of the single market and unfettered access to it, that recognises the importance of the customs union to Wales, and recognises the importance of providing certainty whilst delivering uh, on the, uh, the referendum result. So far, of course, we are far from that position. Neil Hamilton. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I too welcome the First Minister's statement, and like the Leader of Plaid Cymru, I think it is uh, by and large a fair summary of where we are now, and I certainly agree entirely with the First Minister in his criticisms of Theresa May and her conduct of the Brexit negotiations. I wonder if he'd agree with me that the catastrophic uh, outcome of two years of utter incompetence in these negotiations has produced the greatest national humiliation for Britain, certainly political humiliation, since Suez. You know, Theresa May does have a certain genius. You know, last year she contrived to make uh, Jeremy Corbyn look electable and to come within an ace of winning a general election which she need not have held. Uh, this year she has contrived to produce a deal for leaving the EU which is even worse than staying in. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion that the Prime Minister has actually been intent upon sabotaging the whole Brexit process. I mean, it's utterly irrational to me uh, to do no preparation whatsoever for leaving the EU during the last two years on uh, WTO terms, and then to run negotiations so close to the wire as we are now, uh, which has limited everybody's options, including her own and then to agree this transition deal, so-called transition deal, which seems to be worse than staying in. Unless there's a subtext here that we're actually in Hotel California where you can book out but never actually leave. And I note that uh, Monsieur Barnier this week has been talking about extending the transition deal even to beyond the projected date for the next general election into 2022-2023. Uh, and I certainly agree with the uh, question that he poses in the statement. What on earth has she been doing for the last uh, two years? Uh, I don't think she's been so much uh, managing the internal turmoil inside the Conservative Party as actually causing it in the first place. Um, this is a deal which has been designed by a Remain Prime Minister, endorsed by a cabinet of Remainers, to ensure that Britain never actually leaves the EU. We won't even leave in name only because this deal commits us to regulatory alignment with the EU for an indefinite period to come. Uh, and after we leave the EU, of course, we won't even have a voice, let alone a vote in the laws which are going to be made to us and which we'll be obliged to, uh, to uh, implement. 
It can't be explained, in my view, by incompetence alone. This is treachery by an establishment determined to frustrate democracy. And we've seen it before in Denmark, in France, in Ireland, in Holland, where referenda have been held. The people voted no, but they've been told, you've got to keep on voting until you vote the right way. So we remain, as a result of this so-called deal, inside the EU, subject to its regulations and directives, as interpreted by the European Court of Justice, in which we won't even have our own judge, without representation in the Commission, without representation in the Council of Ministers. And furthermore, whereas under Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty we have the right to leave, under this deal the EU has a veto upon whether this deal is concluded or not enforceable at the orders of the European Court of Justice. That's the opposite of taking back control, which was the Prime Minister's stated objective. At least at the moment we have 8% of the votes in the Council of Ministers. After uh, the 29th of March next year, we will have 0% of the votes. And we are paying £39 billion of taxpayers' money for the privilege of giving up what little control we currently have. And in the process, we are prevented from taking advantage of the greatest boon of leaving the EU, which is to enter into free trade deals with the United States, Australia, India, China, etc., uh, until an indefinite period and possibly permanently. The EU has got everything that it wanted out of the Prime Minister and more. Uh, we have a 90 billion a year trade deficit with them. They export 340 billion pounds worth of goods and services to us. Why on earth would the European Commission want to allow us to enter into free trade agreements with other countries to undercut their prices on cars, food, clothing, footwear, etc. Of course they don't want us to reduce taxes on fuel because that would make our industries more competitive with them. And the most shocking thing, I'll conclude on this, the most shocking thing about, about this uh, agreement is that as regards Northern Ireland, in future, laws will be made for Northern Ireland in which Dublin has a voice and a vote, but Belfast and the UK do not. That is the very reverse of partition. The, 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 uh, uh, the, the leader of, uh, of the Conservatives, uh, during his, uh, his questions to the First Minister, I'll come to in a second, uh, talked about the need for engagement. Well, the Prime Minister has gone behind, behind the backs of two Brexit secretaries to make far-reaching concessions to Brussels, and twice tried to bounce the Cabinet into agreeing with her plans in ruthlessly plotted manipulations of Chequers and Number 10. There was no engagement with the Cabinet by the Prime Minister, let alone with the uh, Welsh Government, and a 558-page densely worded document was produced for people to comment upon. Uh, at five minutes' notice. The Conservative and Unionist Party is certainly no longer a Unionist Party. This is not a deal, but a capitulation. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with that description. Oh, it, it's, it's rather strange, that way, that I, I, I find myself standing up to almost to defend the Prime Minister. I guess the tax made on her rather than, rather than on me, because uh, it was all about what was happening in, in Westminster. I have to say, that what is noticeable about Brexit is that those who smashed the window have run away and left those who didn't want the window smashed to put it back together again while claiming that they're doing it in the wrong way. Uh, I did notice that you know, those people who said it'll be the easiest trade deal ever and all that nonsense that we heard, that hasn't come about. And, and what is the narrative now? The EU is being unreasonable. Well, the EU is looking after its own interests. And this idea that, the, e, that we, the EU needs us more than we need them, that, the EU doesn't see it that way at all. Well, nor does EU 27. Their view is, well, we'd like to give the UK uh, a, a, a good deal, but actually there's a whole world out there that we can, uh, we can talk to and we can trade with, big blocks that, uh, that we can sell our goods uh, to. Now, he asks fairly, what's been done in the last two years? Well, <laughs> when you have David Davis and Boris Johnson in place for so long, uh, the question is answered. I'm not sure what David Davis did, if I'm honest with you, uh, in terms of moving this forward. Boris Johnson seemed to think that any problem could be resolved by a quip of some kind. Uh, and his greatest contribution to uh, the job of Foreign Secretary was to jeopardise the release of a British national in Iran, because of something that he said. So uh, she did not choose her personnel wisely when it came to her Brexit Secretary and her Foreign Secretary. And here we go again. This is treachery by an establishment. Hmm. No evidence at all to, uh, to back that up, despite the fact that uh, there, are many, uh, there are many levers, of course. David Davis is a lever. Dominic Raab was a lever. 
Uh, and yet, uh, Dominic, Dominic Rabb, uh, despite the fact that he was the one who put, who, who put this uh, uh, agreement before the Cabinet and then decided to leave, uh, and David Davis said, Leave, he was the Brexit Secretary, are they part of the establishment that was so treacherous? And, and here we have the start of a narrative. All this would be fine if it wasn't for traitors in our own ranks. The stab in the back theory. Now, where have we heard that one before? You know, the British people have been stabbed in the back by people who sold them down the river. That's a familiar ground from uh, another country nearly 100 years ago. Plus, we see now why Toby Robinson will be so welcome in the uh, UK, uh, because the historical parallels seem to be, uh, to be playing out. And now, when it comes to uh, free trade agreements, I have to say to uh, the, the member, a free trade agreement with America is no substitute for having a, a good agreement with Europe. It's further away, and it's a smaller market. India is further away. Australia is both a small market and even further away. None of these markets will make up for the European uh, market. And I have to say to him, these countries, India particularly, will say, if you want a free trade agreement with us, we want our people to be able to move in to, to, to arrive in Britain without a visa. They're not going to accept visa restrictions at all. They will want something close to freedom of movement for their own people. Uh, and then what's he going to say uh, at that point? He's opposed freedom of movement uh, from European nationals. Does that mean he supports it for Australian nationals, for Indian nationals, for American nationals? You know, that's something that UKIP have never uh, addressed. And then, of course, uh, finally, he, he came up with a comment that, that belies really the sort of raging free marketism of many in UKIP. He said that uh, we would lose out on the opportunity for cheaper cars, cheaper food, cheaper clothing and cheaper footwear. What of the British workers that work in those sectors? Yeah. What does it mean for our farmers if we allow in inferior, inferior food products to undercut what they produce? What does it mean for our car workers if we allow in cars that are produced at a much lower uh, cost that don't meet uh, our current environmental standards? His view seems to be, let's cut the standards right down and let them in, undercut our own uh, workers. Clothing, footwear, all these industries that are important to Britain. I do not believe that those who voted leave, voted leave to jeopardise their own jobs. Many, many people said to me that one of the reasons why they were voting leave was because they felt that, they, that their jobs were insecure and their lives were insecure. They will never vote for anything that looks like a laissez-faire, low-regulation economy. That's exactly what, what uh, I was going to say the leader of UKIP, but uh, anyway, so it's, a, it's a rotating chair. Uh, what the, the, the member has said, that is not, I believe, what the British people voted for. It's not the vision uh, that they voted for. Uh, and I believe what they want is a sensible Brexit that protects their interests and the interests of Wales. Mick Anthony. First Minister, we were given very, very clear assurances during the referendum <laughs> campaign and subsequently that there would be no denial of workers' rights, no reduction of workers' rights, that those would be protected all the way along. Now, when one reads the uh, agreement or the draft agreement as it's set out, superficially it seems quite attractive because it talks about non-regression. But First Minister, you will know as well as I do that non-regression clauses have very little status, very little legal status, are effectively unenforceable, have been rejected as giving any real grounds of support to workers' rights uh, in European law and indeed in British law. The actual clauses that are set out there uh, are ones that really aren't worth the paper they are written on. Now, that's the view that I've taken of this, and I've also sort of consulted with some of the country's leading employment lawyers, and this is what they say. They say it is therefore abundantly clear that the commitments on non-regression of labour standards and compliance with international labour organisation and European social charter obligations will be ineffective and will not achieve what the government set out in its white paper. In particular, it will be almost, almost certainly be impossible for trade unions and workers to rely directly on these commitments anyway. It is even more abundantly clear that these commitments do not even begin to meet Labour's fourth test of does it defend rights and protections and prevent a race to the bottom. Do you agree, First Minister, with that analysis? And in this Assembly, as well as the debate that takes place in Westminster, one of our fundamental commitments is that working people in Wales will not have their rights taken away from them and that this draft agreement, as it stands, significantly undermines and removes protection from Welsh workers in terms of the rights that they've enjoyed up until now. Well, yes, I do. I mean, we know that there are many uh, in, in the Conservative Party, and indeed we've heard it from UKIP today, who take the view uh, that this is an opportunity to whittle away 
uh, all those rights which have been hard earned for so many years. Uh, they see it as a burden on, uh, on business, whether it is a right to statutory leave, which 20 years ago didn't exist, and there were workers in Wales who had no right to leave at all, uh, whether it is statutory maternity pay, uh, whether it is uh, maternity leave or adoption leave, all these things are seen as unnecessary burdens by some uh, on the economy, which they would like to do away with. But uh, he will know, as I will know, that there are many, many people who did, even though they voted leave, didn't vote for that vision. They wanted greater security, not, uh, not some kind of uh, buccaneering attitude that, that left them uh, behind. And so, yes, I am greatly concerned about where we will go in terms of um, social rights, in terms of workers' rights. But uh, one thing that the Welsh Government will resist uh, absolutely is any attempt to dilute those hard-won rights uh, that workers in Wales and the rest of Britain have had for some years. Jane Hutt. Uh, dear Llywydd, uh, and I'd like to thank the First Minister for his statement and also for, for your swift actions, First Minister, last week uh, in writing to the Prime Minister jointly with Nicola Sturgeon calling for a JMC as a matter of urgency. As far as the draft withdrawal agreement is concerned, I'm dismayed uh, by the apparent disregard and low level of importance given in the political declaration with regard to future relationships with the EU. We've been focusing on this as a committee uh, taking evidence from the Welsh and UK government, as well as partners in private, public and third sectors. Do you, do you share this dismay? Will you be relaying these concerns on the political declaration to the Prime Minister when you meet with her tomorrow? As the Cabinet Secretary for Finance said yesterday after the GMC, which was called in order to, uh, to response to your letter, the focus should now be on Wales. Will you be asking her, as Mark Drakeford has, to claw a bit of time to think about the future of her country, a country that has four different governments, each with their own responsibilities? And First Minister, at a fair funding Brexit roundtable meeting last week, where the socio-economic context of the impact of Brexit was discussed. The questions were asked about the impact of the draft withdrawal agreement in addressing the poverty and inequality caused by this Tory UK government in its relentless pursuit of austerity. And the question was also asked uh, in terms of the draft withdrawal agreement uh, for the, about the protection of equalities and human rights. And I, I support McAntony in this point and thank you for your uh, response to his questions. But finally, in terms of securing Wales's future objectives, what will it mean for the Welsh Government, this draft agreement, already investing in our poorest citizens and communities as we experience a disregard in terms of consultation on future prospects for funding in terms of the Shared Prosperity Fund following the loss of our structural funds. Well, we, I can thank uh, my friend, the member for the Virgil Morgan, for her comments. We will promise we wouldn't lose out a single penny of funding, and that's a promise we intend to hold the UK Government uh, to. Uh, I think one of the lost opportunities here was that the Prime Minister uh, very much took the view before the general election that, that she was the one who would take this forward and did not see the need to engage the uh, devolved administrations at that point. Uh, now, I think it's pretty fair to say that if the Conservative Party had won with a handsome majority of you know, 90 to 100 seats, then I, I dare say we wouldn't be in this position uh, where they have to talk to us as they do uh, today. But that's not, of course, what the, uh, the outcome uh, was. And, of course, the lost opportunity was that if the Prime Minister had not <laughs> painted herself in such a corner, uh, a hardish Brexit corner, there might have been the opportunity to work with the UK government on uh, the kind of Brexit that we would have wanted. You know, we might have been in a position where we could have said, OK, look, we need to leave the EU. People have voted for that. But let's, let's have full and effective access to the single market. That's important to us. There is no better alternative to customs unions. So let's stay in the customs union. Now, if that had been the uh, attitude of the UK government at the start, that would have been close to our position. We could have been in a position where we could have been supportive. But all that was lost. It's a hypothetical question. And now uh, what the UK government finds itself in is a position where nobody is happy. Uh, Remain is not happy. Leave are not happy. We're not happy. The Scottish government isn't happy. The DUP, well, they're rarely happy, but they're particularly unhappy at, uh, at, at this point. And where does that leave us? You know, the, the, the problem was this wasn't handled as it should have been at the beginning. This situation could have been avoided. I'm not saying it would have been avoided, but it could have been avoided. But sadly, of course, it was that lack of consultation and engagement that uh, led us to this position. Uh, and certainly, uh, I hope that in the future, lessons are learned by UK governments that in order to be more effective, they have to talk to us 
and, of course, have to make sure that, um, that we, uh, we feel that we're not just listened to, but that what we suggest is actually taken up. Because it's happened, of course, with Brexit. They have moved on to our uh, turf, uh, not, not entirely, but certainly, to a, 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 certainly in part. But much of this could have been avoided two years ago if the lines of communication had been more open. Julie Mopka. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I also want to reiterate how shameful it is that Wales has not been consulted meaningfully on the withdrawal agreement. Um, and it's not, it's not good enough, as the Cabinet Secretary for Finance said yesterday, just to listen to what we say and then go away and um, we hear no more. Uh, the last of the Labour Party's six tests is, does it deliver for all regions and nations of the UK? And um, it certainly does not. And does the First Minister believe, in fact, that the withdrawal agreement meets any of those six tests that the Labour Party has put forward? Um, the withdrawal agreement lays out how EU citizens and families um, and UK citizens um, will be protected um, after we leave the EU. And those are people who have chosen where they would live and uh, the freedom of movement, which up to now has been our right and it, within the EU. Now that we are losing the right to um, freedom of movement, um, does he not agree that the uncertainty about um, who is going to be able to stay in this country and who will come here in the future is causing um, great uncertainty for businesses? Um, I had a meeting yesterday with a company director from Cardiff North of a medical products manufacturing company um, who relies heavily on European staff. And he was uh, telling me, in fact, how much he felt for those staff at the moment because they were so uncertain. They felt so uncertain about their future. And, of course, we have had some information laid down in this withdrawal document today, but we don't know what the future will hold. Um, and um, he is very um, you know, uncertain about how his company, which is a very valued company in Cardiff North, will prosper in the future um, with, the, with the future proposals for um, immigration and no freedom of movement. And, of course, we do know um, what the CBI's view is about the government's plans for immigration. And so doesn't he agree as well that some of the uh, rhetoric that has been used around the immigration issue does not foster good relations? Um, Theresa May, May's words were that her deal will stop EU nationals jumping the queue and how unnecessary it is to use that sort of um, expression. You know, it's building up division again. And I think we had such um, a spike in hate crime when we had the referendum, and there are more hate crimes now being reported than have ever happened before. And I think it is um, behoven on us, all of us politicians, that we must be very careful um, with the words that we use in order that we, um, in this very, very difficult time, don't increase the feelings of um, insecurity that many of our citizens have as a result um, of this uh, very divisive vote and the very divisive politics that um, <coughs> we're um, experiencing at the moment. So has the First Minister got any comments he could make about that particular issue? Yes, I mean, it was uh, certainly uh, uh, very much an issue in the aftermath of the referendum, but we saw a spike in hate crime. One of the things that I did was go and visit communities around Wales, the Polish community in, in Finnessy, of course. Uh, I went to a meeting in Swansea just to reassure the people that uh, the Welsh Government uh, and the people of Wales are welcoming. Uh, and that it wasn't the case. So some people did believe that they would somehow be thrown out of the country very soon. Even to the extent that one person said to me that she feared the knock on the door. You know, that's, how, that's how bad it was as far as their uh, perception of what might uh, happen. On the issue of citizens' rights, the withdrawal agreement does take us further and provide some kind of certainty compared to where we once, where we once uh, were. But, of course, what businesses are saying to me is, yes, they understand the point that there is a need to get skilled labour professionals in the health service. We've all talked about that. But also there's a need for unskilled labour as well, people who are going to work in uh, jobs that are not as highly paid, which are unattractive in a, in a climate of full employment, such as the abattoirs. I keep on mentioning them. And I'm not you know, running some kind of vendetta against them, but they, they do find it difficult to recruit because the nature of the job is, is unpleasant for most people. Uh, where will they get their people? And if they can't get their people from the EU, that means they won't be able to function and people who live locally won't be able to get a job there either because they won't be, the opportunities won't be there. So these things have, been, uh, have not been missed by the UK government. And of course, the, the tragedy of this you know, is that people celebrate the ending of freedom of movement. What does it mean in practice? It means that UK citizens will not be able 
to travel and live freely in 26 other countries that they previously could. It's a wall. However, if you're Austrian or German or French, you can travel to uh, 26 other countries, but not freely to the UK. So actually, you can travel to all these countries uh, around Europe without any restrictions. If you're Irish, you can travel to them all. Uh, UK and every uh, country in every other country in, in the European Union. So what, what, what in fact has happened is that restrictions of freedom of movement have actually applied more strictly to our own people than to anyone else in Europe, because it's our own people who now won't be able to live and travel and work as they used to, whereas every other citizen in Europe will be able to do it, except they won't be able to come to the UK in the same way. So actually, it's been a self-defeating uh, action to limit the places where UK citizens can actually go uh, and live long term and work long term and those strictures will not apply to other countries in Europe so it shows that what we've done here is not actually uh, create a situation where uh, immigration is in some way better controlled to the UK it's meant that UK citizens and that citizens will now have controls put on them when they have to travel to other countries in Europe Thank you, First Minister. The next item, therefore, is a statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Education on international student mobility, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary to make the statement, Kirsty Williams. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Only 2% of Welsh students at universities currently spend time abroad studying, volunteering or undertaking work experience as part of their studies. At a time when it's never been more important for our students and graduates to be global citizens, for there to be stronger cultural and economic links between Wales and the world, and for even greater academic and employability outcomes for our students, we need to ensure that international opportunities are an aspiration for many more students. I want to see the number of Welsh students who spend time abroad as part of their studies double by the end of this government. As someone who benefited hugely from time studying abroad as an undergraduate, I know how such an experience broadens horizons, expands key skills and ensures connections that last a lifetime. Research from Universities UK points out that these gains are particularly significant for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. However, it is these students who too often miss out on or don't even apply for these transformational opportunities. Now, we have made a start on addressing this by targeting Generation UK China student mobility funding towards widening participation. Today, I'm announcing a new international student mobility pilot, which will make a significant contribution to our ambitions to increase opportunities and raise aspirations. We have been developing the pilot in discussion with British Council Wales as part of our response to the Diamond Review's recommendation on support for students who choose to study overseas. It will focus on Welsh domiciled students at Welsh higher education institutions and it will run for three years from 2018-2019. The pilot will offer a mix of opportunities for Welsh students at Welsh HE institutions including study, volunteering and internship, ranging from two to three weeks to eight weeks. Our scoping study showed that it is these sort of opportunities that will lead to the strongest take-up. This will help to encourage participation from a wider group of students and hopefully including those with, for example, caring responsibilities or in employment and will avoid duplication of any schemes already available. I believe strongly that government should invest in these opportunities, but there is also a responsibility for universities to step up. On that note, I'm pleased that many Welsh universities have signed up to the Universities UK's Go International campaign to double the percentage of undergraduates who have an international placement as part of their university programme. We are investing £1.3 million in this pilot over the next three years, and further details on those mobility opportunities will be published shortly. Of course, there are already good examples of work taking place within the sector with the support of government, and I'd like to take the opportunity to mention these today also. 
We were recently able to support the Global Wales project with European Transition Fund investment worth £3.5 million. This funding will not only support the promotion of Wales as a study destination, but will also support outward mobility opportunities for Welsh students in Global Wales's priority markets, such as Vietnam and the United States. These opportunities, as part of our wider international education programme, are important for social mobility, employability skills and soft power links for Wales. The SERIN network goes from strength to strength, and I was delighted earlier this year to secure a new partnership between Yale University and SERIN. This new partnership resulted in 16 SERIN students having the opportunity to participate in the Yale Young Global Scholars Summer Programme. Let me tell you, members, this was a life-changing experience for all that took part. This exciting partnership will continue and expand in 2019. These relationships with leading global universities have also offered us the opportunity to lever engagement in our wider education reforms, and I hope to make further announcements on this very soon. As I mentioned earlier, our new investment provides additional and new opportunities. It will not duplicate existing schemes. We are clear in our view that the United Kingdom should continue to participate in Erasmus after Brexit. Wales benefits hugely from our participation in Erasmus+, Plus, allowing people to study and undertake work experience and volunteering in another EU country. In fact, the total funding awarded to Welsh projects amounts to some 6% of the UK total Erasmus Plus funding awarded since 2014, and that is above our population share. The call for the 2019 projects has just been announced by the British Council, and I would encourage Welsh institutions to submit applications. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am determined that many more of our students, from all backgrounds, benefit from the transformational experience of spending time studying, volunteering or undertaking work experience abroad. International experiences benefit individual students, it strengthens overseas links for our universities and promotes bilateral exchanges for, for Wales with communities and countries across the world. Thank you. Thank you. Janet P. Saunders. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the, Secretary, the statement from the Cabinet Secretary. As someone relatively new to this portfolio, I was actually shocked myself to learn that only 2% of Welsh students currently spend time abroad studying and volunteering or carrying out work experience. It is heartening to, to hear your statement that you do intend to double that figure by the end of this government. But a particular concern to me is how the opportunities do present themselves for those from disadvantaged backgrounds, our care leavers, disabled students, and I ask how the new international student mobility pilot uh, that focuses on Welsh higher education, how will you be hoping this will extend, if at all, to further education sector? Because, you know, to me, it's important that children from both sectors are able to experience the opportunities that present. So, if not, why is this not the case? It is crucial that our underrepresented groups do have the same opportunities to go on international, um, you know, sort of uh, courses away, um, and I just simply cannot see um, why that would not be the case. So if the Cabinet Secretary could, um, you know, sort of enlighten us further. Uh, well, can I thank uh, Janet for that question? Uh, could I uh, make absolutely uh, clear that the reason uh, why we are going for uh, relatively uh, short periods uh, for the pilot is to uh, allow for students that do perhaps have other responsibilities that could not afford uh, uh, the time to take a year abroad, which is perhaps traditionally what many uh, students would see as a, a period of international study. Uh, these short placements for two to three weeks, up to eight weeks, uh, will allow for, we believe, uh, following research that has been undertaken on behalf of Welsh Government by OB3 Research and Wizard, this gives us the optimum uh, uh, chance for the highest level of uh, take-up. Uh, these, these particular grants are available for those studying in Welsh HEIs, as recommended uh, by Diamond, but that's not to say that there aren't significant opportunities for uh, international study uh, in the FE sector. 
Of course, in many areas, uh, FE colleges are delivering uh, uh, A-level programmes uh, uh, to our SERIN uh, students and are participating in the SERIN uh, programme. Uh, you've just heard me say about our new links with Yale University, and we are hoping to build upon those. And FE colleges have been particularly successful in drawing down Erasmus Plus funding. Uh, both our school sector and our FE colleges have excelled themselves, as I've said. We have had a greater than population share of the resources under Erasmus Plus that has looked to fund a range of very exciting projects uh, in FE that have allowed FE students studying academic and vocational colleges uh, as a, uh, to have uh, periods of study uh, abroad. The challenge we have now, Janet, and perhaps you can help us with this, is convincing your colleagues uh, in the government in Westminster to allow us to continue to uh, participate fully in the Erasmus Plus uh, programme. And at the moment, it is far from clear after 2020 that we will be able uh, to do that. Uh, the, uh, the, the Westminster Government uh, is currently carrying und undertaking a value for money uh, study. We have been more than happy to support that review uh, with all the data uh, from Wales, which I believe uh, makes a very strong case for continued participation uh, in the scheme. The Universities of Wales uh, and the Colleges of Wales are very clear of their desire to continue to participate fully in Erasmus+, Plus, as is the Students' Union uh, of Wales. Uh, it seems, though, that at this moment those voices have not uh, been listened to. And I would uh, once again you know, reiterate the experience of Switzerland, who, saw, who left the Erasmus Plus programme, decided they could do something better on their own. It ended up costing them more money for less opportunities. And we should learn from that and not think that some UK alone scheme uh, would be a satisfactory replacement for ongoing continuation participation in Erasmus Plus, which, as I said, is what this government wants, what the students of Wales want, and what the universities and colleges of Wales want. Bethan Syed. Thank you, and apologies uh, for my late arrival. Um, thank you for advance uh, notice um, of this statement. Um, following Brexit, it needs to be ensured uh, that international students uh, continue to be welcomed uh, to Wales and are aware that they are valued. And it also needs to be ensured uh, that students from Wales are encouraged to be outward looking and to seek opportunities to study abroad. Uh, Plaid Cymru believes that students from Wales should be able to study in the world's best universities and have the opportunity to live and to work abroad. Our 2016 manifesto pledged to provide first-time student financial support for Welsh domicile students enrolling as undergraduates in universities outside the UK, as well as expanding our support for Erasmus+, Plus, as has been mentioned already today, to get more young people uh, to see the world and to have enrichment from those experiences. It is therefore welcoming to hear the Cabinet Secretary is launching an international student mobility pilot as part of the Welsh Government's response to the Diamonds Review's recommendations on support for students to study overseas. Now, you mentioned there is uh, £1.3 million in the pilot and that further details are to follow. Um, and I'd just like to ask when those details uh, would uh, follow, considering that uh, we would need to scrutinise how that investment is being put, play, put in place uh, by the Welsh uh, Government and whether that money would be enough or whether we, it could be used in different ways or whether other parties may have ideas as to where that money could be utilised. Um, Will the Cabinet Secretary um, give not just this chamber, uh, but the international student community assurances uh, that they will not only be welcomed uh, in Wales, uh, but also valued? Because I understand that this uh, scheme is about taking Welsh students um, out into other countries, um, but it does work both ways. If we attract international students uh, to Wales, uh, it will broaden the experiences of students here in this nation of ours, uh, and it will allow for us to meet people we would never otherwise met, and in my case, my husband. Um, and so I am very thankful uh, that we had uh, that opportunity uh, here in Wales. And what representations um, has the Welsh Government made to the UK Government um, in securing uh, continued Welsh involvement in international student exchange programme uh, post-Brexit? Do you see a role for some form of continued Committee of the Regions in helping facilitate continued cooperation in this area, something which I uh, and my colleague Mick Antony, who currently sit on the Committee of the Regions, are looking into. 
How does the Welsh Government plan on mitigating the cost of losing EU students post-Brexit? We are seeing a decline in applications and, as I said, in this chamber only recently, Wales is already way down the league table in terms of EU student numbers and applications. So a further reduction is going to be very hard for the HE sector to absorb when almost certainly we see an even further decline in EU student numbers as a result of Brexit. And what plans does the Welsh Government have in place if we are unable to remain part of the Erasmus uh, scheme? And do you share my concern uh, that the increased anti-EU national language being used by the Prime Minister as part of her hard line against EU freedom of movement and to sell her proposed EU deal risks putting continued cooperation on this front in jeopardy? And finally, will the Cabinet Secretary consider a pilot scheme uh, to provide support for students to study further afield for the whole of their degree programme, as recommended by Diamond? I think that this would be something um, to look at in the round um, so that we can encourage uh, young people to not only do part of their degree abroad, but to do all of their degree abroad and to bring that wealth and talent back to Wales. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you for the series of questions, uh, Bethan. Let me be absolutely uh, clear. Uh, Welsh universities and college, uh, colleges are open uh, for business, and not just to an international students, which, as you say, uh, bring a, a, a depth uh, to our university towns uh, in, the, uh, in what they uh, bring with them, but also, of course, faculty uh, as well. Uh, fa uh, international faculty, faculty is a key strength uh, in, uh, in our sector and uh, a significant number of our lecturing staff uh, uh, in HE institutions in particular are, are, are international lecturers and um, they are very welcome uh, in, our, in our universities and help make our universities as strong as they are. And that is the message that I, m myself, Universities Wales and Global Wales are taking to the world, the very strong offer that Wales has with regards to uh, higher education and further education. One only has to look at the student satisfaction surveys that shows that Welsh universities rank higher uh, among students for their satisfaction of their experience than across the border in England or, or in Scotland. We have excellence, uh, excellence in research uh, and excellence in teaching, and we have a wide variety of institutions, either uh, city-based, like here in Cardiff, or uh, uh, on the coast, whether that be in Bangor or Aberystwyth. We have a real mix, so something for everybody. And you would, I'm sure you'd agree with me that what international students and faculty can be assured of if they come to study or work in Wales is a very warm warm welcome uh, from our communities who value their contribution uh, very much uh, indeed. Uh, with regards to uh, the ongoing challenge of recruiting international uh, students, of course this is not helped by the determination of the UK Government to include students as part of the immigration figures. Nobody sees international students uh, as immigrants only Theresa May and the Home Office. Poll after poll after poll show that the public do not view international students in this way. And international students, they come here, they study here, they learn their skills here, and the vast, vast majority of them then take those skills back to their uh, home, uh, home countries. So this idea that somehow uh, they should be included in these figures is highly damaging, highly damaging to the HE sector, not just here in Wales, but across the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, I have had uh, uh, meetings uh, with Sam Juma uh, uh, and uh, my Scottish counterparts with this regard to talk about uh, international student recruitment as well as ongoing opportunities for British students to study abroad, particularly as part of the Erasmus Plus uh, programme. I am due to meet with them again uh, shortly. Uh, I've invited them all here to Cardiff. I'm very glad that they have taken the opportunity to agree to that invitation. But once again, we will sit as a group of education ministers to try and form a common understanding of the challenges that face us all and to try and put those messages across uh, to, the, uh, UK, uh, to the UK government. With regards to European student recruitment into Wales, it should not be unexpected that we have seen a drop in those students as our student support package has changed. 
It was an inevitable consequence of a very generous offer that EU students were able to avail themselves of under the previous regime, that that financial incentive has now been removed as we move through our diamond packages. Uh, actually, the year before, we outperformed the other UK nations in terms of uh, international and EU stu uh, student recruitment, so it should not be unexpected. But that does mean we have to uh, redouble our efforts alongside our partners in HEIs and FE colleges uh, to uh, spread the message of the strong offer that we have here in Wales, which is why I recently was with Global Wales uh, on, uh, at New York, uh, alongside the Vice Chancellor of Swansea University, uh, hosting a Study in Wales uh, event, uh, and most recently. Uh, and most recently in Vietnam, where we were able to negotiate with the British Council a significant uh, tranche of new achieving scholarships, uh, Wales universities having the most of them to attract Vietnamese students uh, to our country. And we will continue to support uh, our university colleagues in their recruitment, uh, in their recruitment activities, where we can add value, uh, where we can add value to them. Uh, this is initially a, a pilot for short uh, periods of study abroad. As I said, this is a result of uh, research that has been done by WIZARD uh, on behalf of the Welsh Government, uh, because we feel that this is where there is the largest uh, demand. Demand for international placements has been growing steadily in Wales, but at 2 per cent, we lag behind England and Scotland in the number of Welsh undergraduates who avail themselves of these opportunities. And, and this is an attempt to supplement what we're already uh, doing to increase uh, those opportunities, especially for those uh, students, as I said, from particularly disadvantaged backgrounds who are least likely to apply uh, for, these, for, uh, for previous opportunities or for study abroad uh, in the round. Uh, we will continue to keep under review, given the, uh, given the uh, financial constraints that we currently work in in the higher education sector as to whether we would move to a situation where we would fund entire degrees uh, in international uh, universities. Uh, uh, we are not in a position uh, to undertake that at this moment because we believe that there are other pressing uh, needs on the higher education uh, budget in Wales. Uh, and our priority for the diamond dividend is to reinvest in expensive subjects and to increase uh, uh, resources going into the sector here at home. Thank you. Kevin David. What a good point the Cabinet Secretary makes about international students and the action she's taken in this chamber that contrasts so severely with the UK Government Conservative cynical policy of uh, discouraging international students coming to this country because uh, they affect immigration figures. And Conservative benches in this chamber should be ashamed yeah. of the Conservative Government um, and that policy. So this is a very good focus on opening Wales um, and opening the world to Welsh students. One thing I'm particularly interested in and would welcome is the focus on students, which you just mentioned, from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. But what I also ask is, it's not just students from disadvantaged backgrounds, but students, future students who live in communities of multiple deprivation that may not be from disadvantaged backgrounds themselves. So I'm talking about valleys communities, particularly places like St. Enid and, and Bargoed in my constituency. Um, I went to school in Bargoed. When I was in school, I wouldn't have considered international study. Um, it wouldn't have been on my mind. I didn't come from a disadvantaged background, but it just wasn't in the culture of the school. So I think if we're going to encourage students to travel abroad, I think we need to look at how primary school students and secondary school students are educated in the value of international study. And people can say to them, well, look, you, you can get abroad, you can travel abroad, and this will be great for you. Um, it wasn't until I was um, 25 and, 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 and travelling abroad to China to teach did I realise the value of international study. I tell you something, I wouldn't have had the confidence to do it when I was 18. Uh, well, uh, you, make, you make a very good point because uh, often these are, are issues to deal with aspiration and actually creating that spark within the individual to seek out these, op these opportunities. Uh, and the research shows us that people from a disadvantaged background are least likely to seek out these opportunities. So this is about raising aspiration. Uh, as I said earlier in answer to Janet Finch Saunders, some of the strongest projects that Wales has seen in the Erasmus Plus programme is actually school-based projects. And that's, really, uh, and that's really, really important that Erasmus is not just seen as a university uh, programme. It's actually available for schools and FE colleges. And schools are engaging uh, in that very well at the moment. But as you know, one of the 
four purposes of our new curriculum are to create um, uh, global citizens uh, ready to play up their part uh, here in their own communities but in the world. So hopefully our new curriculum will, uh, from the very earliest ages, from three years old, begin to uh, teach children about their place in their community, back the fact that they are a citizen of a world and there are opportunities for them uh, out there. Uh, one of the reasons why the, co the opportunities are are limited to two to three weeks to eight weeks is because those are seen as, as most desirable. It's a big leap, isn't it, to take a year away, uh, living away from home and moving to a country for a year. But the ability maybe to go for two to three weeks or up to eight weeks is a much more manageable proposition uh, and an accessible one and an attractive one. And we believe, following the research that has been, been, been undertaken to inform this uh, policy initiative, that that's where it makes the biggest difference. Uh, we anticipate that between four and 500 students will be assisted by this pilot. It will be operated um, uh, by the British uh, Council Wales, uh, who already have systems in place for other uh, opportunities. But, Evan, if you had met the very sparky 16 and 17 year olds from schools across Wales who went to the Yale Global Scholars Pro Programme, you would have been in awe at their confidence, their aspiration, and their ability to compete on a global stage with other young people and to hold their own and the confidence that that has given them uh, to come back to Wales and to ha set their aspirations even higher for what they can achieve has been, uh, has been remarkable. And if we can provide more of those opportunities for more of our students, then uh, I feel that at least part of my time in this job will have been very well spent. Jenny Rathbone. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I thank you for your statement, and um, I think this is a very important issue, um, because there's a real danger that uh, as we are, have this threat of leaving the EU, that we will become an inward-looking country when we are part of a global economy. We can't get us away from that, this idea that... Uh, um, that we somehow can uh, hack it on our own uh, is pretty frightening. Anyway, I, I, I want to pay tribute to um, Cardiff University in particular, who have been focusing uh, a lot of effort into ensuring that as far as possible, we encourage young, all young people who are studying there um, as undergraduates to uh, build in some sort of international experience and that's absolutely as it should be because they've already done the research that shows that by studying abroad it improves their employability, their confidence and uh, their broader education. So well done Cardiff University and I'm completely terrified at the fact that only 2% of Welsh students overall go abroad. Uh, but focusing back on the very important point you make about um, the significance of students from disadvantaged backgrounds going abroad. Um, I, I, I heard what you said to Helen David and uh, the importance of having these short-term um, uh, 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 international experiences, uh, but that I doubt if they're going to be in Vietnam or the United States, given how long it, you know, the distance uh, involved, are they? Um, I, I mean, and, and I think surely we need to be focusing on our biggest markets, which are in Europe. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to move our country to some other part of the world. Um, I just wanted to ask what you're doing to ensure that disadvantaged students are taking up these opportunities of this new £1.3 million, because otherwise we know it will be taken up by the less disadvantaged students who will always have families who will probably be able to make arrangements for them on their own. Could you just explain why you have not considered extending this opportunity to FE students who are studying just as importantly uh, the technical skills that um, are also uh, going to uh, make them employable and, and make a, an important contribution to our economy. Um, uh, those are my two questions. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to join you in congratulating uh, Cardiff University for the uh, significant work that they have done in this particular uh, field. We have been very careful in trying to design the scheme to complement what our universities are already doing, and it is certainly not to absolve them of any responsibility that they need 
uh, and are uh, taking uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, as I said in my opening, ta opening statement, perhaps this work is more important now than it ever has been as we approach uh, Brexit. Wales has never been an insular country. Our outlook has, our outlook has always been global and international. Uh, uh, only, uh, only last week, in her Welsh language uh, speaking assessment, my daughter talked of the Welsh people that were there at the signing of the Declaration of Independence uh, for the United States of America. We have sent our people out into the world who have created and done amazing things. Our and at this time, more than ever, we need to increase Wales's soft power. We may not have responsibility for foreign affairs uh, in this chamber, but that does not absolve us of our responsibility to get Wales out into the world. And what better way, what better asset do we have to sell our nation than our young people? They are our best assets, and that's why I'm determined that more of them should have the opportunity. Of course, we want students to continue to have opportunities in Europe. That's why we're fighting so hard for the Erasmus Plus uh, project. But I can assure you, Jenny, um, it's only six hours and you can be in Boston. And uh, with the new flight from Cardiff uh, to uh, Doha, you can be at Vietnam in less than 12. So the idea that um, an eight-week pro eight programme isn't long enough for you to go to some of these places, I, I would argue, uh, is not, uh, not the case. Uh, we will be looking uh, for the British Council, who will be administering the scheme, to uh, help us collect data to make sure that a wide range of students are, uh, are taking up these opportunities. And uh, as I said throughout this, uh, one of the, my guiding principles in this job is equality of opportunity and, close, and closing the attainment gap. And that attainment gap isn't just about qualifications, it's about an opportunity attainment gap as well. And I hope this programme uh, helps us to achieve uh, that. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The right item, Nessie, you don't. The next item is a statement by the Minister for Welsh Language and Lifelong Learning, the review of the funding formula for further education. And I call on the Minister, Lynyrd Morgan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Welsh Government is seeking to build an economy that works for everyone. Now, more than ever, we need to ensure that we do all that we can to boost living standards, encourage growth and productivity, and also address deeply ingrained regional and social inequalities. The FE sector is at the heart of this agenda, yet over the past five or six years, it is also one of the sectors which has been hardest hit by the austerity measures imposed on us by the UK government. With this in mind, I commissioned a review of the FE funding methodology to ensure that it is fit for purpose to deliver what learners need and what employers want, and also to ensure fairness across the whole of Wales, not just for full-time learners, but also for part-time learners. The changes introduced in 2014 have achieved their objectives. We no longer deliver isolated qualifications, but we have in place a comprehensive skills-based learning programme that have a defined purpose and outcome and a redesigned and sharpened curriculum offer. Generally, our in institutions are financially stable. However, in 2017, a Wales Audit Office report recommended that we should review the funding methodology to reflect the changes in demography and local need. To deliver this recommendation, the Welsh Government has been working with the FE sector to align funding for full-time learners more closely with the approach adopted around sixth form funding, thus reflecting relevant demographic changes. While the current programme approach, uh, program approach to funding delivers 
the main qualification and underlying skills that employers in each sector require. Learner choice remains the main driver for which programs are delivered at each college. And the choices that learners are currently making do not necessarily chime with the needs of local employers or the economy. And therefore, it's possible that some people choose courses where there is no clear uh, progression pathway, which could lead to people being trapped in low-paid jobs. Now, to bring change to this position and to move towards a situation that closer aligns the needs of our economy with the training delivered, officials have worked to uh, align college courses with the recommendations of the regional skills partnerships. The aim of these partnerships is to ensure that employer needs are considered in the recommendations. And these are used to influence the planning processes provided at every college. If college if colleges introduce plans that do not reflect the RSP recommendations, they will not be approved. Furthermore, my officials will ensure that delivery is in line with those plans and will adjust funding when appropriate. I intend to appoint an independent advisor to review how we can enhance the current arrangements in terms of the partnerships and their ability to have an impact on skills provision in their regions that meets employer need. The responsive sector, and I fully expect them to embrace this improved methodology, to work collaboratively and regionally, and to ensure that each and every one of our FE learners is given the best possible start in the world of higher education or employment. We need to be constantly striving for improved learner outcomes, and I'm keen to see an increase in the trend of successful completion, and we'll explore options in consultation with the FE sector to incentivise <laughs> colleges to ensure they meet annual targets for learning outcomes, ensuring improved standards year on year. And where a college does not meet that target, I'll withhold funding in the following year. And I'm pleased to say that in the past decade, the outcomes achieved by colleges have improved by 20 percentage points. But we must be constantly striving to improve the standards. <coughs> now, alongside the changes to full-time provision, I'm also proposing to change the way part-time provision is funded, planned and delivered. The introduction of funding frameworks in 2014-15, I'm afraid, coincided with the 37% decrease in the funding available for part-time learning, with a further 50% the following year. So since 2015-16, the volume of part-time provision has varied depending on the numbers of full-time learners, and the offer is inconsistent across Wales. Now, part-time funding is prioritised for basic skills, including digital and ESOL provision, as well as giving all learners the opportunity to attain GCSE, English, Welsh <coughs> and Mathematics. Now, delivering to those with the lowest level of skill has long been a core part of each college's mission. And in future, part-time provision will be prioritised to the proportion of the population who only hold a level two qualification. And that will ensure that all learners with a qualification level below level three will have equal access to the amount of part-time funding that's available wherever they live in the country. As with full-time, I expect college's part-time provision to be influenced by the RSP recommendations. And this review has also refined the sparsity uplift to reflect the increased costs of delivering in rural areas, although additional work will be undertaken in 2019 to refine the sparsity uplift to ensure we identify and fund the optimum curriculum 
entitlement in rural areas. I'm also changing the way we fund the post-16 Welsh baccalaureates. Now, currently, A-level and equivalent programmes are funded at the same value whether the Welsh BAC is being delivered or not. This is because where the Welsh BAC is not being delivered, providers are expected to deliver as a minimum three essential skills Wales qualifications. However, data has shown us that this is not necessarily happening as expected, with learners missing out on important skills development. Therefore, from 2019, the Welsh BAC will be funded as a separate qualification and funded as equivalent to an A-level. I'll also be looking at how we can implement this change within vocational pro programmes from 2020. Other elements of the FE funding methodology will continue to be considered during the next academic year for implementation in 2020-21. For example, the Coleg Cymraeg Caned Leithol was tasked with developing an action plan for Welsh medium education in FE in partnership with Welsh Government officials. I have this week received the final action plan and I'm considering the advice which will be the basis for future support for the sector. So to align this with new developments, a review of the Welsh Medium Uplift will take place next year, bringing a more cohesive direction to Welsh Medium and bilingual education and training. And research will also be carried out on the deprivation uplift and will review the additional funding for learning support for those with additional learning needs, with a revised allocation to this budget being announced. In line with the announcement of these changes to the FE methodology, I intend to write to each of the FEIs to set out my expectation for engaging with this new methodology and to broaden its inclusivity, in particular in relation to people with disabilities and their access to FE provision and <laughs> apprenticeships. I'd like to recognise the commitment that the FE sector has given to this review, and I believe that the new arrangements will better suit both learners and employers. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to confirm that the Welsh Government will be providing funding to enable further education and lecturers to be awarded a pay deal in 2018-19 and 2019-20, which is commensurate to that received by school teachers. I'm pleased to say that funding will also be provided to extend the pay deal to other FE staff, which highlights the recognition that FE makes an important contribution <coughs> to the economy of Wales. I'm so sorry to have taken so much of your time, but I think it was important to set out exactly what the changes will be in future. Deal. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Asma. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for her statement today. Further education is a crucial for the future development of the skill base of the Welsh workforce and for the future development of the Welsh economy as a whole. According to the colleague Gwent, or colleague Cymru, sorry, the economic impact of FE colleges in Wales to local businesses community is four billion pounds a year. However, the FE sector has been chronically underfunded for many years by Welsh Government. Make no mistake, this has been a deliberate policy decision and responsibility lies with the Welsh Government also. So, can I ask the Minister, given the importance of the further education sector, if she regrets the lack of support it has received from the Welsh Government? I welcome plans to improve the methodology, what she's been saying a few times in her statement, the Minister referred to. Does she agree that any changes should not be introduced in such a way so that, that, so that destabilize the sector or otherwise impact negatively on learners' outcomes and meeting business needs? Colleges have been successful in attract attracting income from outside its core Welsh Government budget. But this is no substitute for core Welsh Government funding. Will the Minister join me in congratulating colleges on funding innovative ways of attracting commercial income and what is she doing to support their efforts? Central to the funding question is the benefits it delivers for training and skills. 
So can the minister say how the review fits with the employability strategy and its focus on helping people return to work? The minister referred to part-time learning. The number of part-time learners at further education institution has fallen by nearly a quarter. Could the minister expand on her plans to reverse the serious decline in the number of part-time learners, learners in the FE institutions? Finally, the minister will be aware of the threat of industri industrial action currently facing the FE sector. How confident is the minister that her proposed pay deal will address the problem of low morale that has seen lecturers leaving the sector due to the in-year budget cuts faced by the sector since 2015. I look forward to her reply. Thank you. Minister. Well, nobody wanted to see the kind of cuts that uh, were imposed uh, on the FE sector, but that was a deliberate decision by the UK Tory government in relation to austerity. That is the consequence of the cuts. We have to make decisions, we have to prioritise, and this was a decision that was forced upon us, that we did not want to take, that we had to take because of that austerity decision, which is a political decision. That was a political decision that you did not have to make. Uh, but let me tell you about the sector itself. Compared to England, our FE sector is the model of stability. Uh, and I think that the coherence and the financial stability <laughs> of those uh, FE colleges is something that the Welsh Government has been working very diligently on over the past few years. So I am confident that those colleges are in a much, much better place than any of the FE colleges uh, are in England. In relation to um, colleges being able to derive additional income, I'm very open to that. In fact, I would encourage them to do a lot more of that. But in order to do that, I think they need to become a little bit more flexible to respond to the needs of learners uh, who may not be able to fit into the hours that colleges currently provide. So I I'm hoping that they will uh, be more responsive. One of the things we've done to try and encourage that is to put £10 million on the table to say that uh, you can access this pot if you can provide uh, learning to people uh, which coincide with the kind of priorities that the local skills uh, are need, we've identified are needed, and, and that we've asked them to provide that. And they've been really responsive, and that's good. But I think that's the first step. But I would certainly like them to become a little bit more, more flexible. Uh, so, so more than anything, you know, I would like the public sector to really... Uh, take a, a, a much better uh, role in terms of engaging with the private sector so that they can be delivering these courses rather than the private sector. Um, if you, um, you're talking about um, part-time learning as, uh, again, the cuts have been uh, significant and that's why what we've had to do is to focus on specific areas. So we focused on basic skills, on digital, on ESOL learning, uh, because we've had to, because that is the, what has been forced upon us by the UK government. And just finally on the industrial action, um, I'm really delighted that we have been able to come to a conclusion on the industrial action. There will now be parity uh, in terms of pay for FE college lecturers with uh, sixth form lecturers, but we, it, we've gone further than that. We've also helped to make sure that it's not just college lecturers, but other people who are in the support services, some of whom are on very low incomes, who uh, will also benefit from, from this additional support that the Welsh Government uh, has put on the table. Beth and Syed. Um, thank you for the advanced uh, notice. It's timely, given that we have uh, a debate on further education uh, this time tomorrow also. Um, we've al always recognised in Plaid Cymru that to have a successful, highly skilled and productive economy, that we need to, the facilities and the institutions that are world-class competitive with a clear mission and a plan uh, to deliver. And further education is something that needs to be available to everyone throughout their careers, and uh, not just um, at school. So it's one of the reasons, as part of the most recent budget agreement that Plaid Cymru pushed for, where we could uh, to secure extra money for FE, although we recognise that it's not enough and we understand the challenges which remain. Uh, we do welcome the announcement of funding to allow a pay deal for college lecturers, which is 
commensurate to those achieved by teachers, and we have uh, been calling for this for some time. And it's also good to hear that funding will be available to extend that to FE staff as well, as we know we have to achieve parity of esteem between vocational and academic qualifications and a fairer pay structure. But I would just like to probe uh, the uh, Minister further. Um, we still know there's going to be uh, the potential for strike, strike action in December, and do you think that this pay deal will go far enough uh, in relation to the wider workload issues uh, that are facing uh, the sector. Um, so far as the other elements in the statement go, I am puzzled on some of the other announcements. Uh, the current funding and allocation framework is put in place in 2013. Uh, today we have this announcement covering the next few years, but there's no information as to how long colleges can plan ahead uh, based on this announcement. Uh, how long a period do you envisage the announcement today will actually last for? Uh, the purpose of the proposed Tertiary Education and Research Commission uh, for Wales is to provide oversight, strategic direction and leadership for the post-compulsory education and training sector. So why are you bringing forward piecemeal reform of funding for the sector now, uh, rather than waiting for the Commission to be in place to strategically review the needs of the sector? We know, based on the Hazel Corn Review and other statements made by the Education Secretary, that the whole of the post-16 landscape is being proposed for a major legislative overhaul. Will this mean that these announcements today, in reality, will be up in the air as soon as or if that process begins? Can you give us some more detail on when the wider legislative agenda is being planned for? According to the statement, and I quote, college plans that do not reflect the RSP recommendations will not be approved, end quote. You also say that you intend to appoint an independent advisor uh, and to review how we enhance the current arrangements with RSPs uh, and their ability to have an impact on skills provision. Um, is the Minister confident that RSPs are equipped to make the right recommendations to colleges to ensure that employers' needs are met in those plans? <coughs> Some in the sector have told me that they have no real power, no real accountability and no real direction from Welsh Government. It's my understanding that only one of the three RSPs currently have staff. RSPs need to be hardwired into the wider post-16 landscape in the way that they currently are not. Uh, will an independent advisor be able to provide a better way forward? Although, again, I think it's something that could and should be done as part of a wider strategic change in the sector. How will, for example, the John uh, Greystone review be worked into this announcement? They've already reviewed uh, uh, the RSPs. How will you be taking this uh, in, into regard? Uh, there seems to be further reviews into aspects of the uplifts, the formula, but I want to understand why you feel that's necessary. Have we had enough reviews uh, in this area, and, or have they had enough time yet uh, to bed in? Uh, I, I'd like to understand why you've made that decision. And my final question is, you've explained in the statement that part-time provision has seen drastic cuts over the last few years, and we would obviously uh, agree with that, uh, not agree with the fact that it's been done, but agree with the statement. Uh, you say that part-time provision will be prioritised to the proportion of the population who only hold a level two qualification. Have you carried out an impact assessment on how this will affect uh, different groups of learners at different levels, and have you discussed uh, this with the sector? Um, yes, um, just first of all on lifelong learning, I, I think it is critical, I think the role of FE in lifelong learning is, is terribly important. One of the key issues we have in our society today uh, in terms of problems is in work poverty. So the question is how do we get people out of that situation and the answer I think is to upskill them while they are, they are still at work and to do that we need to provide a more flexible system. So I'm trying to uh, encourage the FE sector to try and get into that position so that they can be responsive uh, and not just leave it to the private sector as I said earlier. I am uh, very hopeful that uh, the the money that we've managed to put on the table today will uh, avoid strike action, but then that is a matter, uh, and the relationship between the college lecturers is one uh, between the, the, the unions, the college lecturers, and Colleg I Cymru. So that's the relationship. What we can do, uh, we're kind of slightly outside the system, uh, but we've been very pleased to be able to, to support them uh, in, in, in this instance. In terms of planning ahead, um, I, I understand what you're saying, the Hazelcorn review is coming. 
The problem is it's still quite a way out. And what I don't want to do is to wait before we incentivise, before we start moving these colleges. If we wait for the Hazelcorn Review, we could be waiting uh, a, a significant amount of years, and I don't want to be in that position. So, so some of this is about getting us to the situation where we're on a par with six forms, where we're looking at the methodology, for example, in relation to how they're paid relating to demographic changes. That's something, that's what's done in six forms. So we're, we're gradually getting into the same uh, kind of position. Um, the, uh, and of course, we needed to respond, I think, to the National Audit Office report. So that was another incentive for us to, to get moving on this particular issue. Um, on the RSPs, uh, we have, of course, had the review by Dr. John Greystone. That was specifically targeted at governance. It was specifically looking at governance. governance. The RSPs have responded, are responding uh, to that. Terms of references uh, are now clear for the public. There was an issue about public accountability. Um, minutes of the meetings are now being, uh, being put on websites and things. So, so the transparency of the process is much better. Um, I, I hope that in appointing a new uh, somebody to, to overlook the, the RSPs, we'll, we'll get a better degree of consistency uh, between the RSPs. I think they're doing a, a good job, and I'd like to encourage them to keep going, but I'd like to have somebody who has an understanding of both the, the RSP, the employment situation, and the further education um, sector to, to really make sure that we are in the right place on this because it's, it's critical, I think, that we get this right. Um, and then uh, on your last point, which was uh, about... I can't remember what it was about. Mm -hmm. The... Part-time provision. Yeah, part-time provision. Um, absolutely. You know, we, we are concerned about this. That's why we've had to prioritise. We have done some analysis to, um, to have a look at how this would impact. Of course, we've been speaking to the colleges about this. We've had to prioritise. We're, we're really making sure that, that there's a consistency. When you, we've, we've decided where to prioritise, though, we've decided that we want to upskill uh, and focus on those of the lowest levels of qualification in relation to part-time. David Rees. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet and the Minister for the statement, and can I also basically applaud the Welsh Government's decision to actually fund the pay awards, both for lecturers and for support staff, because so often support staff are not thought of in these, in these discussions, and they are the crucial pin which actually allows the whole process to work. I'm so very much pleased with that. A um, couple of quick questions for you, Minister. I agree with Beth in the sense that the part-time provision is crucial. We need to look at how we address this issue. Now, your statement says you can prioritise those who only hold level two or below, but we can't ignore the level threes because they are the ways in which we can upskill our workforce and provide people opportunities to move on, and as you highlighted in your answer, to actually gain better themselves out of the uh, in-work poverty situations. So can you give us reassurances that you will also be supportive of programmes above Level 2 if there's evidence to demonstrate that that need is there by, by the RSPs as well? Um, and in the RSPs, will you also confirm that they will look at not just regional needs, but national needs, because very often what is good in a part of Wales might not be appropriate for another part of Wales, but we not, don't want to stop the social mobility of, those, of the students to travel. Uh, and, for example, something in South East Wales, if it's only delivered in South East Wales, we shouldn't deny people in South West Wales or West Wales the opportunities to actually gain skills which might allow them to move into those type of professions. Uh, you also indicated that you will be doing the financial or checking the financial funding business. You won't pay if the plans are not delivered. How often will you assess those plans to ensure that they are being delivered? And are you also going to assess the financial management of the colleges to ensure they are delivering on the outcomes that they should be delivering on? Uh, we've seen our FE colleges grow, some of them quite large, um, and some of them have spin off private businesses as a consequence of putting extra funds in. So what we want to make sure is that they are delivering on the objectives set by Welsh Government for the funding from Welsh Government. Could I also tell me um, in your statement you highlighted you've done some of the scarcity uplift has been looked at. 
but then you talk about other elements will be looked at the next academic year. Well, what elements will be looked at in the next academic year? Will they be all the remaining elements, or will there be a proportion of those elements, and some looked at the year after that? Um, and I suppose the most important thing is, how are you going to ensure that the hit that the FE took, and we all recognise the hit the FE took, is not irreversible, that we are going to deliver, because there are many people out there who need access to those access courses, to, to return to work courses, to get them back into the opportunity of working. And that is an area sometimes we forget about, the adult education aspects, um, which brings that person back into the world of, of educational learning and gives them the enthusiasm to move on and gain workplaces. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm also delighted that we've managed to find the money in terms of support staff. Some of these people are on extremely low pay, so it, I think it's really important that we've managed to find that money and to support them. Uh, and as you say, they are essential staff uh, in terms of making the colleges work. So I'm delighted that that, that has happened. In terms of upskilling, um, look, I, I think everybody recognises that, that this is the sector that's taken a huge hit. Nobody wanted that to happen. And if austerity ever ends, uh, I'm sure that this will be a, a sector that will be considered uh, in terms of really trying to reinstigate uh, the kind of um, priorities that, that we had for the sector. Uh, and I think uh, particularly in, in terms of uh, our commitment to adult education, this is a historic thing that we've, we've really um, <coughs> stood by, I think, in particular uh, in our party. And I think what we need to do is to try and reinstigate that, that situation. That's very difficult unless austerity is lifted. So, um, but in relation to um, sparsity and, and rural, uh, one of the things that we'll be looking at is making sure when we revise this further is to ensure that people have access to a broad curriculum. So how far away do you live from a plumbing course? Uh, it costs a lot more to put on a plumbing course in a rural area simply because you can't perhaps get the numbers that you would get in an urban area. And yet, people in rural areas need plumbers. So we are looking at ensuring there's a kind of baseline of courses that are necessary, and it may be that we'll be saying, well, we will subsidise those uh, so that there is a broad curriculum. And that's one, one of the things we want to examine further. Um, on the, the planning function, so there's the, the funding formula, but that goes hand in hand with the planning uh, formula for these colleges, which now have to interlink with the regional skills partnerships. And uh, what we're saying is you have made an agreement. These are the things that you agreed in your plan that would be delivered. If you then don't deliver, then there will be clawback. That will be done on an annual basis. Um, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, FE has had a hit in the past. And when possible, I'm sure that we will, we will find the money uh, to be able to <coughs> reinstate the money that, that sadly has had to be cut. Thank you very much, Minister. Item seven on our agenda this afternoon is the statement by the Minister for Housing and Regeneration, investing in early intervention and cross-government approaches to tackle youth homelessness. And I call on the Minister for Housing and Regeneration, Rebecca Evans. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a government, we have demonstrated our commitment to tackling and preventing all forms of homelessness through new policy initiatives and significant investment. This includes an additional £10 million of funding in the next financial year, as previously announced by the First Minister, to specifically address youth homelessness. Today I am setting out how that funding will be allocated to support a suite of cross-government measures, offering a mix of evolution and space for innovation, providing opportunities for new approaches to housing solutions and support, as well as opportunities to build on existing services and tools to better recognise and respond to young people at risk of homelessness. To strengthen our evidence base and to inform our funding and future policy decisions, the Wales Centre for Public Policy was commissioned to deliver a report into the causes and prevention of youth homelessness. 
One overarching message from the report was the need for cross-government action, something I fully recognise and why earlier this year I established a cross-portfolio and cross-sector ministerial task and finish group to advise me on both youth homelessness and Housing First. I am grateful for the work of that group which, alongside discussions with ministerial colleagues and my engagement with the End Youth Homelessness Cymru campaign, and my discussions with young people with experiences of homelessness and the risk of homelessness, has informed the allocation of the funding that I am announcing today. The WCPP report sets out a complex set of interrelated factors which can culminate in causing a young person to become homeless. The report then sets out a five-part typology of prevention – structural prevention, systems prevention, early intervention, eviction prevention and housing stability. A further report from WCPP then uses this typology to map current provision in Wales providing a strong basis for informing the allocation of funding I'm announcing today, as well as future policy development. The report makes it clear that if we are to eradicate youth homelessness, we need to tackle its root causes by identifying those who are at risk earlier and putting in place measures to reduce risk factors. It highlights strong evidence to support coordinated multi-agency approaches, including the Geelong project, which centres around a collaborative model between schools and youth services, using a screening tool to identify those at risk and then providing a flexible and responsive practice framework. Many of the Geelong principles are already visible within the education system and youth service in Wales, where we have a track record of successfully taking forward this kind of early intervention approach. Our youth engagement and progression framework has allowed earlier identification of those at risk of not being in employment, education or training, the brokerage of appropriate support and the monitoring and tracking of progress. The actual numbers of young people who are not in employment, education or training are the lowest they have ever been, reducing every year since the framework was introduced. The First Minister visited the Hangar Youth and Community Centre in Abbot Bargoid yesterday to see how it works in practice. We know the same warning signs of young people potentially becoming neat are also good indicators that a young person may be at risk of family breakdown or youth homelessness. There is, therefore, a clear rationale for building on this approach and working with partners to explore the considerable potential to strengthen the framework for a wider purpose. I am therefore pleased to announce that £3.7 million of funding will be allocated to the Youth Support Grant to further evolve and strengthen the existing systems and services with a focus on youth homelessness prevention, drawing on the principles of the GLON model and adapting them for the Welsh context. The funding will also provide for training and resources to support school-based counsellors, education welfare officers, youth workers and other frontline staff to ensure that they are equipped with wider knowledge of homelessness and the links to other risk factors in order to better prevent young people falling into homelessness. It is imperative that the Geelong principles are embedded throughout existing services to ensure the seamless identification of young people at risk of homelessness and the services available to them. The £3.7 million of funding will therefore be available to fund a youth homelessness coordinator within each local authority to drive forward this collaborative agenda. The WCPP report recognises that an essential component in tackling youth homelessness is housing stability, which requires the provision of a variety of support and suitable accommodation options for young people. The Supporting People programme currently funds a range of projects to help young people access and sustain accommodation, and the Affordable Housing Review is considering some of the wider structural questions. However, the WCPP report tells me that there is a clear need to promote and encourage new and innovative options to both house and support young people. I am therefore pleased to announce £4.8 million of funding to establish a brand new innovation fund to develop suitable housing and support options for young people. These might, for example, include Housing First for Young People or projects specifically for young people leaving custody or leaving care. It is vital that we understand the current landscape of housing options available 
to ensure that this investment is driven by the needs of young people. As such, I'm in the process of commissioning a short piece of work to assess current housing options for vulnerable young people with a view to better understanding the gaps and seeking to build on and develop the options available. Another aspect highlighted in the WCPP report is what they describe as systems prevention. We know that children leaving the care system are at increased risk of becoming homeless. Many care leavers report being unsure how to manage household budgets or problems, feeling lonely, and like many young people, they need support to transition to independent living. In recognition of this, the Welsh Government supported the development of the Care Leaver Accommodation and Support Framework through Bernardo's Cymru, specifically for young people leaving care in Wales. My department has been working closely with the Social Services Department to identify <coughs> barriers to effective implementation of the pathway and other measures that might be needed to support care leavers. <coughs> A joint housing and social services led group is being established to sit under both the Ministerial Homelessness Task and Finish Group and the Looked After Children <coughs> Ministerial Advisory Group, which is chaired by David Meldin, to strengthen the arrangements in place to successfully transition young people <coughs> from care into independent living. I'm also pleased to announce that £1 million of funding will be allocated to the St David's Day Fund, with the effect of doubling it and strengthening the availability of direct financial support for care leavers, to support them to transition to and sustain independent living and help, them prevent them, help prevent them falling into homelessness. This funding seeks to provide some of the practical financial support to care leavers that others might expect from mum or dad, enabling their successful move towards adulthood and independence. Successful system prevention also invo involves a wider awareness amongst all professionals working with all young people about the risks of homelessness and the services and the interventions available to support young people. As such, I am allocating a quarter of a million pounds for new targeted communications and engagement work. And this will take two forms, one specifically for young people and the other for professionals who work with young people to raise awareness, understanding and the take up of services available. We will work closely with the End Youth Homelessness Cymru campaign, whose expertise will be invaluable to test and advise on the approach. The WCPP report uh, highlighted the complexity of navigating the information available to young people. Therefore, in addition to targeted communications, I am also allocating a quarter of a million pounds for tenancy support work, <coughs> including work with Shelter Cymru and its existing helpline, to ensure young people have access to wide, inf wide access to information, advice and support services. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is already a plethora of work going on and, and underpinning this agenda across government, including work on adverse childhood experiences, the whole school approach to mental health and a wider focus on emotional and wellbeing support for young people. It is important that we continue to complement, align and strengthen existing pieces of work through joint working and this funding is deliberately a mixture of innovation and evolution in order to do just that. The funding allocations I have announced today take a collaborative and preventative approach to this complex issue and demonstrate our cross-government commitment to tackling youth homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome this statement. In particular, I would uh, commend the following elements. I think the focus on needs is absolutely right. That is a major risk indicator. And uh, we do need, uh, as the Minister said, this is a complex problem. But you know, it needs uh, uh, an approach that uh, really ensures that young people have as full uh, lives as possible. Therefore, they need to be doing something constructive uh, with their lives as well as having you know, a secure uh, home. So I think uh, that the needs issue is, is absolutely right as, as, as a key indicator. Um, I'm pleased to hear about the 4.8 million that's going to be invested in an innovation fund which will support measures like Housing First. I have to say, I think the Housing First model is particularly relevant in terms of uh, youth homelessness and enabling young people to uh, keep tenancies going with that sort of uh, support and the uh, fact that we don't give up on them. So if 
things, you know, happen and uh, uh, there are issues to be uh, resolved. We don't, uh, uh, we, we don't evict and uh, that uh, they're given a second or third chance, whatever it takes. That housing first model uh, with the wraparound support from various agencies is key. So I, I, I do welcome that uh, aspect of the announcement uh, particularly. Um, can I thank the Minister for the reference uh, to care leavers? I also commend the work of Bernardo's in this area. I'm also pleased to see a doubling of uh, the St. David's Day Fund to help independent living. Carl Sargent was determined that the St. David's Day Fund would establish this uh, concept of the uh, uh, Bank of Mum and Dad and uh, apply it in, the, uh, in this key area. Um, I also think that for care leavers, but it, it is usually housing that you know, becomes the most dominant uh, need for them. Uh, I think educational attainment is a really important thing um, for uh, young people in care, but when they leave care, though they may still be in some form of education, housing is then very, very pressing. And there, I think corporate parenting really means a sort of housing first approach. I also welcome what you said about uh, the need for all public agencies to be aware of the risks of homelessness uh, that uh, face some young people. And again, we have that approach for looked after children, that corporate parenting that it belongs to everyone. It's not just uh, children's services, it goes across all public agencies. So I, I, I welcome that, uh, uh, that, that, that reference in, <coughs> in your statement. However, there are a couple of things I, I think I should um, press for, uh, for a, uh, a, an answer on and just to see what uh, the Welsh Government's thinking uh, may be. There's no target in your um, statement for the ending of youth homelessness. Now, I know when we make those sort of announcements, they are declaratory, uh, but I still think they set important objectives. Now, in Scotland, they have halved youth homelessness since 2010. In England, there's a target to halve homelessness uh, by 2022 and to eliminate it by 2027. I think we should set some targets as well, and I don't expect you to do that in your reply. But I think you could find there's an all-party approach to this and that we would all sign up to that commitment and to the priorities and the financial costs that would then have to be met. And I think that would set a very clear vision of when we want to uh, end this scourge. But there's much that is useful in this statement, and I'm pleased to commend it. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David Meldon, for his contribution and for his welcoming of the announcements today. And I really would like uh, to begin, really, by thanking David for the work that he does, and he has done for many years as a real champion for children and young people in care and leaving care. And uh, commend him and, again, thank him for the work that he does on the Ministerial Advisory Group as well. Um, I'll address immediately the issue re raised regarding targets. And when the First Minister announced the additional £10 million uh, last year, he said it would be his intention to eradicate youth homelessness in Wales uh, in 10 years. So that would be by 2027. And I am under no um, illusion as to how difficult a task that is going to be. In the first instance, it's very hard to, um, to grasp a figure of how many young people are, homelessness, are, are homeless because uh, many of them don't necessarily identify themselves as being homeless. Uh, for example, if they feel unable to stay within the family home and are sleeping on a friend's sofa, for example, they don't identify as homeless, but we would certainly uh, consider them to be so. Equally, young people can become homeless uh, as a result of the family losing their home as well. So um, we understand the estimate of young, um, young homeless people is around 7,000. Uh, and that figure is a figure given to us by the End Youth Homelessness Cymru campaign. And I think that really does give us an idea of the magnitude of, uh, of the job ahead of us. Um, David Meldon referred to the St David's Day Fund. I'm really pleased that we're able to um, add additional funding to this because we have seen the impact that it's already been uh, making. Since it's uh, launched just last year, it's helped over 1,900 care experienced uh, children and young people to receive funding to support their transition into adulthood. And case studies show that the funding has been really used very flexibly and creatively by local authorities to meet the needs of those young people in the same way that birth parents uh, might support their children. So, for example, 
The fund has been used to pay for driving lessons to enable care leavers to access employment and education, bridging payments to enable continuity of tenancy and residence or uh, due to an unexpected shortfall in benefits, for example, enrolment on courses, materials for study, laptops for further and higher education studies, and also clothing and uniforms for work as well. So all the kind of costs that young people can incur in their, uh, in their move on to adult life. So it's, uh, it's a really exciting fund and I'm glad to see the difference uh, that it's already making. One of the really exciting parts of the uh, statement today, for me, I think, is that innovation fund. Um, I really do want to have that space where we can uh, come forward with good ideas because one thing I've learned in the year that I've been working closely with this sector is that it is a sector brimming with good ideas and a desire to, uh, to, to move forward and look at uh, solutions and opportunities. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the kind of um, schemes that will come forward. Just for clarity, there'll be a bidding process uh, for that funding and the criteria is currently finalised uh, for that. The funding sits within the Homelessness Prevention Grant and there'll be a panel within Welsh Government to assist us in determining uh, which will be the successful programmes. But absolutely Housing First could be uh, one of those kinds of programmes. I was really pleased to have the opportunity to visit the um, Rock Trust in Scotland, which was the first ever Housing First project in the UK. Um, it started in 2017, so it's still early days there, but um, they are very enthusiastic about what's being achieved there. And um, I, I liked it when David uh, Meldon used the phrase, whatever it takes, because that actually is the Rock Trust approach uh, to Housing First. It is about whatever it takes. And I've also been uh, very clear with local authorities that our housing legislation must be seen within the spirit of it as well. So rather than just discharging the, the duties to the letter of the law, and an example would be um, a young person risks homelessness. There's an immediate intervention by the local authority to try and prevent that homelessness, but for one reason or another, it doesn't work out. Well, actually, they've discharged their duties, but actually the spirit of the law would mean that they keep going back to, uh, to ensure that that young person doesn't become homeless. So we've been uh, very clear with local authorities on that. And again, um, the point that David Meldon raises about um, wide-ranging understanding of the risks of youth homelessness and how to identify it um, is important and again something which has been um, uh, identified as suitable for further funding uh, in my statement today. Thank you. Thank you. Beth and Syed. Thank you. Um, homelessness is a political choice <laughs> and it is the consequence of several policies and it can be solved through policies. Indeed, the numbers of people rough sleeping were a lot smaller a decade ago thanks to policies that aimed to support people being in place and a social safety net that was, in fact, better uh, than it is uh, today. Um, I appreciate the statement that you've given us. We've waited over a year for this information. But and I don't want to undermine the work of the Wales Centre for Public Policy, but they do tell us things that we already did know. For example, tackling the root causes, reducing the risk factors, cross-government working. These are things that should have been put in place before now and are not really something that we, uh, are something that we already kn knew. So um, I want to frame uh, my response in relation uh, to that. Now, you attended a, a crisis uh, conference, and I know that you spoke at that co uh, conference. Um, I wanted to know whether you would be in support of the recommendations specifically made for your government, as some of which I'll read out to you today. So place the duty on all relevant public bodies to prevent homelessness and to co cooperate with local housing authorities in relieving homelessness. Introduce strict time limits on the use of temporary accommodation of no more than seven days and this should apply to all homeless households. Abolish the priority need criteria. Introduce a duty to provide immediately, immediate emergency accommodation to all those with nowhere safe to stay until priority need is abolished. And abolish local connection criteria for rough sleepers and ensure it no longer presents a barrier to assistance for anyone threatened with or experiencing homelessness. These are um, many uh, suggestions that have been put pl in place by uh, the sector and I believe uh, should be uh, responded to. Now, I know that you have said uh, that you want to put uh, finance in towards housing first, but I potentially, you know, my, my 
uh, my uh, portfolio has changed, but I don't know uh, whether you have announced the results uh, of the pilots, um, or is this uh, new money uh, an intention uh, to scale up uh, the Housing First initiative, given that you've analysed that it is a, a good uh, thing? Uh, when you say that there will be £3.7 million funding available to fund uh, youth homelessness coordinators within each local authority to drive forward this collaborative agenda, what discussions have you already had with local government in this regard? Um, I'm getting countless emails uh, from local government saying that they're stretched to the limit. Uh, have they had any uh, intervention as to where or how they would use uh, this money uh, to best effect? And I'm a bit confused as to what the targeted communications and engagement work will be with a million pounds put towards that. Um, how will you be engaging with young people? How are we going to be able to track uh, the developments um, of progress in this regard? And what work will you then be doing with, you only mention uh, one organisation uh, here today, how will, you be how will you be working with the wider sector uh, to ensure uh, that everybody uh, in this field will be able to partake in it. You say that it's hard uh, potentially to reach uh, the target uh, in, in 10 years' time, but you know, we've been waiting a long time for a target uh, to end uh, youth homelessness, uh, and we need to be able to have uh, intermediate targets to understand how you will be able to reach that goal, how you will be involving uh, the sector, and how ultimately you will be involving young people who are actually homeless. Uh, because time and again, uh, they feel disenfranchised, they feel as if they're not being listened to, they feel isolated, and how can we ensure uh, that they are key to the delivery uh, in this regard. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. Um, it is a shame that um, it does fail to recognise the huge amount of work which has already been going on, which has been supported by government um, over a long period, not least through the Supporting People grant, which I know uh, both our parties have a particular interest in. So one example would be the um, Swansea Young Single Homelessness Project. That um, is an organisation where young people are valued for the contributions they make, and they have um, fixed site services run um, called Drus Agored, provide an emergency service for nine homeless young people. So that's very much at the sharp end of preventing those young people from becoming, uh, uh, turning to rough sleeping. And they also offer floating support services to vulnerable young people up to the uh, age of 25 who require some support to maintain their tenancy. That's just one example. I've been to see uh, Flamai also to see the fantastic work that they're doing, also funded by Welsh Government. So I think it is unfair to suggest that all of a sudden we've woken up to the challenge of youth homelessness. Actually, work has been going on um, in the area of youth homelessness for many years, and we've seen the youth um, engagement and prog progression framework um, every single year, reducing the number of children and young people who are not in employment, education or training. So I think it does do a disservice to the people working day in, day out in this sector to try and ensure that, um, that young people don't become homeless. Uh, and the investment which Welsh Government has been making in this agenda for a long period. Um, so in terms of um, how we would want to measure those targets, actually I think we need to be realistic and um, expect potentially an increase in the number of people who uh, we do identify as being homeless in the short term, and that would be as a result of that communications activity uh, which we would be doing and the awareness uh, raising that we would be doing in terms of um, helping those uh, people working in youth services, in schools and so on, to identify the risk signs that a young person uh, might be rough sleeping. And I know many of us were at the launch of the End Home Youth Homelessness Cymru campaign, and we heard there very much and very directly from young people with their personal experience of rough sleeping, how, um, uh, how, how they felt that their, the signs uh, that they could be rough sleepers weren't even noticed by those people working most closely with them. On the issue of, um, of uh, priority need, I've already committed to uh, commissioning a review of priority need. I understand very much the issues there relating to priority need. However, I would say that young people um, are very much already considered uh, uh, to be in priority need. So young people aged 16 or 17, by definition, are considered pri at priority need, and those between 18 and 20 who are at particular risk of sexual or financial exploitation are also uh, considered to be priority need, as are those people up to the age of 20 who have spent time in care. Now, I, um, I, 
I'm very interested in what our review of uh, priority need will show us, but um, those young people are currently considered priority need, and also the issue of local connection will be considered as part of that wider review of priority need, as I've already uh, told the Chamber previously. In terms of input from the wider sector, the Ministerial uh, Advisory Group, or the Ministerial Task and Finish Group, I should say, has representation very, very widely across the sector from all organisations, from the youth justice sector to local authorities to the End Youth Homelessness uh, Cymru campaign and uh, uh, police and so forth. So it is widely represented in the sector and does um, very much respond to that point that tackling use of the homelessness does have to be a cross-sectoral um, responsibility. In terms of Housing First, um, those pilots are ongoing. We have now ad um, identified additional funding, which I announced recently, for some uh, trailblazer projects which are taking that Housing First model to the next level by ensuring that they are um, working very closely with mental health services, with domestic violence services and with substance misuse services as well to try and uh, ensure more of an integrated approach to meet those uh, needs of people. And uh, uh, to, just to finish on uh, this particular point, the Housing First uh, Network has uh, produced a Housing First Standards document, which, uh, which, which we have agreed now in Welsh Government. So for a, uh, a service to consider itself as Housing First, it must meet all of those standards, because one of my concerns was that um, there are some excellent projects out there uh, calling themselves Housing First, not adhering to the Welsh Government's Housing First principles, um, and that was a concern. So whilst rapid rehousing models um, are very much in need, Housing First isn't for everyone, but we do need to stay true to those principles of Housing First uh, if we intend to call those projects Housing First. Jenny Rathbone. Thank you. Um, I um, very much uh, welcome the attention you're giving to this important subject uh, and the joined up approach that you're all giving to it. Um, unfortunately, I absolutely agree that NEETs are a real uh, indicator of potential youth homelessness. Um, and one of the things we need to do in conjunction with the Cabinet Secretary for Education is ensure that all our schools are paying attention to the well-being of all their young people rather than in some of our schools, I'm afraid they're all too keen to get rid of people who require extra support. And that is really something we need to uh, stop happening. Um, so at, at one level, I'm quite surprised that you're having to invest so much money in, um, in, in training and resources to support school-based counsellors and education welfare officers, because I would have thought that um, they would already be pretty familiar with uh, the complexities of this problem, but on the other hand, reflecting on the inability of some schools to support appropriately um, young people who are having difficulties, uh, maybe that is what's required. Um, yesterday I visited um, the Grassroots Project in Cardiff, which is in Charles Street in the city centre. And this is a, a youth project that's been going for nearly 40 years. And there was clear evidence of the excellence of their work um, joined up approach just opposite the, um, the youth housing office and literally down the road from the uh, job centre plus where people had to go and claim their benefits. Um, but in addition to that, I met several young people who've clearly been involved with grassroots for several years. And um, this has obviously become an organisation that they've come to trust. And in many cases, it's uh, an excellent success story. Um, the quality of their work is really outstanding. I was very pleased um, to meet a young man who has only recently been diagnosed with autism, age 25. So we were obviously weren't doing the right thing uh, when he was in school. Um, and he's at the moment struggling. Um, he's between jobs. Um, but I was very pleased to hear that Autism Initiatives is helping him uh, get some independent housing. At the moment, he's living with his mother, but obviously he doesn't want to go on doing that. Um, so um, it's great that uh, another organisation who specialises in autism is available locally for, to help him with that aspect. Another was a young parent who was living in truly appalling private sector housing. I know that the, uh, it's not in my constituency. I know the Assembly member can, is aware of it. Um, and she obviously was making a really good fist of uh, being a parent of, of a child who looked very contented and thriving. So 
Good luck to her after many years of being supported by grassroots. And thirdly, I met a, ver a vulnerable young woman who simply is not ready for going into independent um, housing. If we gave her a tenancy, it would break down almost immediately. And therefore, I'd like to um, ask you, uh, Minister, what we're, we're, we're doing to focus on the supported housing that many young people who, are, who fall homeless actually need to enable them to subsequently be able to successfully support a tenancy. Uh, because it seems to me that we need foyer accommodation, um, such as provided by St Basil's in Birmingham, where they've got 29 different um, hostels um, to support young people, including some with families, um, to ensure that uh, that's, we put them on the right path before they are, are um, going into their own homes, which then fall down. It's exactly the same housing first principles as we apply to people with addictions, um, people with mental health problems of all ages. So um, I know that Clamai do some work, um, and they have some hostel accommodation, but I just wondered how much focus has been on ensuring that it is available across uh, Wales, um, because obviously the work done by Grassroots, uh, their street-based outreach work, identifies at least one third of these young people are coming from elsewhere outside Cardiff because nobody wants to be the only trans person in the village and people who are, who are just uh, getting judgmental attitudes rather than empathy are bound to come to our cities. Um, so um, I think if, if we could just focus on the sort of um, supported housing that is needed to ensure that the most vulnerable of, of our young people are successfully enabled to get back into um, living a, a successful life. Minister. Thank you very much uh, for those comments. And um, I'm particularly interested in the grassroots project uh, in Cardiff. So I'll be uh, sure to try and uh, have a visit there to find out uh, more about what's happening. And, and again, look to the example that you've given of St Basil's in Birmingham, because I think it's important that we do look to best practice uh, wherever we can find it. Um, you mentioned the young man with autism who um, was being supported into independent uh, living and um, I'm pleased to see that um, that individual now has the support that he needs and um, I've been keen within this portfolio to uh, reflect on previously uh, responsibilities I've had and one of the things that um, we have introduced is some new guidance on housing specifically um, related to how best to offer support to people with autism um, and that is as a result of the work that we've been doing uh, more widely through the ASD strategic action plan again a, a piece of work which we work on um, right across across government um, you also referred to um, a young person just not being ready to move on to independent uh, living and that's very much does reflect the kind of discussions that we've had within the ministerial task and finish group where we heard of young people who um, thought they were ready, but they weren't. And again, that's um, the kind of example I gave to David Meldon, where an individual needs that second chance, a third chance, however many chances it takes to get support in order to, um, to be able to move on to independence and adulthood. Um, one of the pieces of work which is going on across government again is um, some uh, wider work regarding the When I'm Ready policy but um, not looking at it just in terms of um, young people within the foster care environment, but actually uh, residential care more widely. So I think that that will be an important uh, piece of work uh, moving forward as well. But the Tlamai example that you gave, I'm very familiar with, uh, with that. I've been to visit them in Cardiff and had the opportunity again to speak to some of the young people who've been um, positively, very positively impacted by the services that they've been able to have. I will say the Innovation Fund that we've announced uh, today, I'm keen to see how we can link that up with Welsh Government's capital funding, so there could be potential um, you know, for further services of that um, foyer type, uh, which you described, uh, um, potentially coming forward as, uh, as projects under that. And the uh, foyer model very much does inform some of the supporting people work, which already goes on at the moment, um, and it certainly does uh, uh, bring forward those G-long principles which I referred to uh, earlier on in my statement. Thank you very much, Minister, and apologies to those who already were on the list to speak, but uh, we have run out of time. Item 8 on our agenda this afternoon is the debate on the law derived from the European Union Wales Act of 2018, Repeal Regulations 2018. 
And I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to move the motion. Mark Drayford. Jan Fowler, Dipper then in opening this debate, I'd like to begin by reminding us why this piece of legislation, the law derived from the European Union Wales Bill, as it then was in the first place earlier this year. Uh, we developed the bill, as the First Minister said repeatedly on the floor of the Assembly, as a fallback measure, a measure designed to protect the devolution settlement in the event that the UK Government would not amend its EU withdrawal bill in a way which removed the very real th threats it contained to our devolution here in Wales and the National Assembly's freedom to legislate in areas of devolved competence. I don't think there's any doubt that had the EU withdrawal bill been enacted as originally drafted, it would have seen a real clawing back and centralisation of powers to Westminster. That is why we embarked upon a long and detailed process of negotiation involving the Welsh, Scottish and UK governments in which we secured a new agreement which provides strong protection for vital Welsh interests. The agreement we reached has ensured that not a single devolved responsibility has left this Assembly. Areas already devolved remain devolved and the necessary safeguards are in place to ensure that this continues to be the case. Devolution is entrenched in the intergovernmental agreement, not diluted by it and not undermined by it as the EU withdrawal bill, as originally enacted, certainly would have done. And all of that was demonstrated last week, Llawydd, when the UK Government published its first quarterly report about the operation of the EU, EU Withdrawal Act, as it now is, and common frameworks. Uh, that report that has been made available to the Assembly pointed to the significant joint progress on common frameworks and the continued collaboration to ensure the statute book is ready for exit day. As a result of that significant joint progress, there are no proposals to freeze the current EU rulebook beyond our membership of the European Union. We are achieving everything we set out to achieve by agreement, as we always argued we could. This progress has been welcomed not only by ourselves, but by the Scottish Government as well. And as my colleague Alan Davis has said, the agreement established a parity between administrations which is in the best interests of Wales and of Wales in the United Kingdom. Now, Flowey, that approach is also being reflected in the development of statutory instruments under the EU Withdrawal Act which modify EU-derived law so that it is operable at the point of our exit from the European Union. And that is action which becomes all the more urgent uh, as the prospect of a no-deal Brexit has strengthened over the time since the intergovernmental agreement was drawn up. Where these statutory instruments contain provisions about devolved matters, the UK Government is seeking the consent of Welsh ministers in line with its commitments under that IGA before they are laid in Parliament and we are notifying Assembly members when we are laid. The reality is Lawe, that we have obtained every drop of leverage to be extracted from the LDEU Act and now is the time to ask this Assembly to do what we as a Welsh Government committed to doing in the intergovernmental agreement to repeal the Act. And this is now urgent. As the Constitutional and Legal Affairs Committee has noted, the programme of corrective SIs is already under considerable time pressure. Repealing the Act will remove one hurdle which impedes the progress of UK secondary legislation, which in turn has a knock-on effect on our own programme. If we do not do so, 
the risk of an unmanageable legislative logjam here in the new year will increase, and that is not in the interests of Welsh businesses or of Welsh citizens. And in any event, shall we, the challenge we are facing now, how to persuade the UK Government to adopt an approach to, to the withdrawal deal, which is capable of commanding a broad political sensor, consensus rather than one <coughs> which threatens to bring us to the very edge of the most dangerous cliff, is not one which the LDEU Act can help us to address. The Act has done its job, Llywydd. It is time to move on. That is why, in line with the enhanced procedure set out in the LDEU Act, the draft regulations to repeal the Act were laid for 60 days, providing an opportunity for representations to be made. That 60-day period has expired, and members will have seen from my written statement that only one representation was received during that time. I thank the Constitutional and Legislative Affairs Committee for its ongoing engagement with the legislation and its consideration of the draft regulations. There was nothing in what the committee said which stands in the way of repeal. It is in Welsh interests that we now do so, and I ask members to support the motion approving the regulations which will enable the Act to be repealed today. Darren Miller. Dear Llywydd, and can I uh, thank the Government for bringing forward uh, this motion today uh, to repeal uh, the law derived from the Uni European Union Wales Act. Um, as the uh, Government and all members of this uh, Chamber will be acutely aware, we opposed uh, this Act when it was put before the National Assembly as, a, uh, as an emergency uh, bill using emergency procedures, a significant uh, piece of legislation which we had uh, just 14 days uh, to, uh, to scrutinise. Um, we said at that time that it was an unnecessary bill because we were confident that an agreement could be reached between the Welsh and UK governments which respected the devolution uh, settlement uh, and which accommodated uh, the concerns, uh, the quite rightful uh, concerns, uh, that some people had uh, in this chamber and that the Welsh Government quite rightly had with the originally drafted uh, EU uh, withdrawal bill as it was at, at that time. And, um, and of course that intergovernmental agreement was secured within weeks uh, of the emergency legislation having passed through uh, this uh, National uh, Assembly. We welcomed, of course, the, uh, the ongoing engagement that there has been as a result of that intergovernmental agreement um, in respect of the Brexit process and ensuring that the legislation uh, which has been um, adopted by the uh, UK during its membership of the EU uh, will continue to be uh, in place uh, going forward. Uh, now, uh, I have to say that I think uh, that it is disappointing that there's been quite a significant delay, uh, actually, in fulfilling the commitment that the Welsh Government made to the, uh, to the UK Government as part of that intergovernmental agreement. You said that you would repeal this bill, and I think everybody was expecting that it would happen much more quickly than the many months uh, which it has taken before you tabled this motion uh, today. Um, but I think you're quite right, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to say... Uh, that this bill offers no leverage in the future uh, to, uh, to the uh, Welsh Government or the National Assembly for Wales uh, in terms of squeezing anything more out of the UK Government in terms of respect for the constitutional settlement. Um, we've seen many LCMs, uh, some of which are uh, going through the committee stages which were discussed at Business Committee uh, this morning, the Fisheries Bill, uh, the uh, International uh, Healthcare Arrangements Bill, and I'm sure that there will be many others where there is uh, a, an issue which needs to be considered by this Assembly. Quite rightly, uh, an LCM will be brought forward. We always felt that the LCM process was the backstop, uh, if you like, uh, for securing the powers of this Assembly and making sure that there was proper respect uh, for devolution. Uh, and I think uh, that not only the intergovernmental uh, agreement has made sure that that uh, is uh, the case, uh, but of course the very practice of the UK Government Ministers uh, since that agreement uh, has come into play uh, has demonstrated very much uh, that there is a great deal of respect from the UK Government in terms of the, uh, in terms of the settlement. So I do hope 
uh, that other parties will be as responsible as the Welsh Government has been in respecting the decision uh, that was made to agree uh, with the UK Government a clear protocol for ensuring that there was a proper workable uh, solution to protecting those uh, rights and taking forward those laws which had already been uh, adopted uh, in terms of UK legislation and to make sure uh, that the Welsh voice is heard as part of that process. I was very pleased uh, to hear you refer to the progress which has been made in terms of the UK-wide frameworks uh, and perhaps uh, in responding to today's debate, uh, you can just elaborate a little bit further uh, on those. Uh, I know that uh, as far as uh, colleagues in the UK Government are concerned, they've been very pleased with the engagement uh, that there has been uh, from the Welsh Government and indeed the Scottish Government in the development of those frameworks uh, and the um, uh, Northern Ireland uh, team, uh, if I can call them that, because obviously there isn't an executive at present. Um, and I do think uh, that it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to work together to make sure that those frameworks are in the best interests of uh, the whole of uh, the United Kingdom, as well as making sure uh, that uh, Wales is uh, afforded a significant voice at the table uh, when those frameworks are developed. So we will be supporting uh, this motion today. Stefan Lewis. Strange, Kelly, that we're looking back at the last 12 months or so uh, of the journey of the Continuity Act and, and it, what it has taken since it, it was first mooted. And, Indeed, contrary to Assembly folklore, I was not the first member of uh, this place to raise the prospect of a continuity act on the floor of this chamber. The person now occupying the role of Council General for Wales was the first member. Uh, he was ahead of me, which probably explains why he has uh, risen to bigger and better things uh, in the meantime. Uh, it's been clear from the, from the outset, though, that members from almost all sides uh, were able to agree that legislating in order to uphold devolution in the context of EU withdrawal was appropriate and necessary. I happen to believe that it was among the finest hours of this Parliament that we acted across party lines in the interest of something far greater than ourselves as individual politicians or as individual political parties, our very political nationhood. And let's not forget that was at stake um, when the uh, withdrawal bill was first drafted. Uh, I think tribute also should be paid especially to those who crafted the continuity bill in the first place. This was not an easy piece of legislation uh, to draft. It is highly technical and intricate, and it is, it, 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 it is a credit to its authors. Like the Welsh Government, I would much rather there not be a need at all or in the first place for Welsh continuity legislation. It has always been my view that the UK Government, re if, it, if they really cherished this union, that if they genuinely respected the nations of the UK, then from the outset, the mechanics of EU withdrawal could and should have been negotiated between the nations of the UK before Article 50 was even triggered. I believe that an accession in reverse model of withdrawal could have accomplished this comfortably. The UK government chose not to engage with the devolved governments on the basis of respect and partnership, and they've deliberately decided not to do so at every stage of this process since the referendum. Continuity legislation, therefore, became essential because there was no other way of securing the wishes expressed by the people of Wales in two devolution referenda. Uh, it is fair with, with great sadness that the consensus which brought about the Continuity Act has now evaporated in light of the intergovernmental agreement between Welsh Government and the Westminster Government. I genuinely and sincerely disagree with the Cabinet Secretary um, in terms of the continuing need for continuity legislation. I believe the Continuity Act is still needed and should remain on the statute book, and I believe so for four primary reasons. Firstly, I believe the intergovernmental agreement fails to deliver the safeguards needed to ensure Welsh laws are free from unilateral interference from ministers in London. Indeed, with Section 6 of the agreement makes it clear that UK ministers can make changes in devolved fields even without the consent of Wales. Secondly, now that we know the UK government's intention through the draft withdrawal agreement, given that we know it fails to meet the aspirations of securing Wales' future, it makes no sense to facilitate the UK Government's withdrawal agreement through repealing our legislative shield. That seems to me to be a clear contradiction politically. Thirdly, I do not believe the UK Government is in any position to be trusted to even attempt to seek 
agreement with Welsh ministers on the future implementation of the Withdrawal Act. They have form for breaking the Sewell Convention, let's not forget, and in their newfound desperation, I have no doubt they will do so again without a second thought. Fourthly, I find the timing of this proposed repeal puzzling. We are awaiting the judgment of the Supreme Court on the Scottish Continuity Act. Would it not be best for members here to make a proper decision on whether or not to repeal our legislation in full knowledge of the legal and constitutional ramifications that that judgment will provide us with? This issue, however, for me, has always been bigger than personalities, parties and even politics itself. I very much fear that precedent set now during these extraordinary times may linger well into the future and cast lasting doubt over the ability of this place to legislate in key areas and could well normalise a newfound Westminster habit of legislating in devolved matters yeah. into the future. I simply believe that no one has the right to use Brexit or any other crisis as an excuse to change Welsh devolved laws without the agreement of the democratically elected members of this Parliament. What's at stake here goes beyond a piece of legislation. This is about enshrining in Welsh law all those rights and standards that we cherish so that no one can take them away from us. We often talk of future generations in this place. The generations that will be affected by decisions like this one today are countless and I urge members to reject the repeal of this much-needed Continuity Act. Jane Hunt. I'm pleased to take part in this debate and would like to express my thanks to Stefan Lewis for the integrity of purpose and principle that he's brought to the um, External Affairs and Additional Legislation Committee in his role, particularly developing, of course, in those early today, days, um, post-referendum, uh, Brexit referendum, securing Wales's future the paper which has stood the test of time since its inception. But I do support the Welsh Government motion today, which is no surprise, as I welcomed the outcome of the Cabinet Secretary's negotiations, which resulted in the intergovernmental agreement earlier this year, and which reflected our proposed amendments to the UK Government Withdrawal Bill. I welcomed his statement last week, which provides the assurance and evidence that the route he took was the right one and delivered the outcomes we called for to safeguard our powers. Now, if you recall, as a result of the EU Withdrawal Act, following the achievements of the Intergovernmental Agreement, the, committee, the, edu the EAL Committee supported the need for the UK Government to report to Parliament on matters relating to frameworks and any use of the so-called Section 12 freezing powers to temporarily maintain existing EU, EU law limits on devolved competence. We called for our standing orders to require such a report to be laid before the Assembly within a day of it being laid in Parliament, and it was indeed laid, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement on the 13th of November. Can I again acknowledge the importance of the intergovernmental agreement? It was the Cabinet Secretary who succeeded in getting the UK Government to change its position so that all devolved powers and policy areas should rest in Cardiff and Edinburgh unless there are areas where common frameworks can be agreed. As a result of intensive negotiations over the past few months, we have this positive outcome with regard to these UK common areas. And I think it's worth putting on record again today uh, what the UK Government Ministerial Forward said last week. On the basis of the significant joint progress on future frameworks and the continued collaboration to ensure the statute book is ready for exit day, the UK Government concluded that it does not need to bring forward any Section 12 regulations at this juncture. Again, the positive impact of this outcome is clear as it goes on to say Scottish and Welsh Governments continue to commit to not diverging in ways that would cut across future frameworks where it's been agreed that they are necessary or where discussion um, will continue. The Cabinet Secretary has indicated a positive response today from the Scottish Government to this outcome as well. So taking forward the Continuity Bill was important, but it was always a fallback, as the Cabinet Secretary said, and the First Minister, and the Cabinet Secretary said that on a number of occasions during the debate about the Continuity Bill. And the preferred outcome would be to see changes in the Withdrawal Bill to reflect our roles, powers and responsibilities. It was leverage that was needed, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, and it must be acknowledged that is a result of cross-party 
action. Um, the impact of this leverage is so important, and we must record it clearly today. It, it is evident. And I recall an article by Ian Price of the CBI in the Western Mail, the time of the intergovernmental agreement. He was taking the long view when he said the deal was very good for the Welsh economy and its people. And what has been agreed is a sensible collaboration between Cardiff Bay, Westminster and Whitehall to find a common way forward on areas that affect the whole of the UK. So I'm sure businesses in Wales will be welcoming the Cabinet Secretary's statement last week. And Welsh businesses will be reassured in the context of so much uncertainty as to the state in terms of Brexit for Wales and agree that the integrity and purpose of the intergovernmental agreement must be safeguarded. So it's for that reason that I support the repeal of the Continuity Act. As the Cabinet Secretary set, said, devolution is entrenched in the intergovernmental agreement and this is a positive outcome which has re commanded respect in the Houses of Parliament as well as this Chamber and the UK Government. Guy Lloyd. Uh, Lewis, can I say what an honour it is to speak about what I still call the Continuity Act, um, a law passed by this Assembly using its uh, legislative powers. We haven't passed that many laws using our legislative powers. Uh, and it owes much to the craft and artistry of my colleague here, Stefan Lewis, uh, although he was obviously deflecting attention onto others uh, in his speech. Um, now, there's been much talk of respecting the result of a referendum. Uh, well, how about also respecting the result of the 2011 referendum in Wales, when 64% of the Welsh electorate voted for the National Assembly for Wales to gain more powers? more legislative powers. Wales has not voted to lose powers. Yet the Wales Act 2017 has seen us lose powers, 193 retained fields. And with the EU withdrawal bill, legislative consent was granted by this Assembly on May the 15th this year, so that powers in 26 devolved areas, powers that we always had since 1999, devolved powers were frozen for up to seven years our devolved powers limply given away. Any leverage we ever had gone in agriculture, environment, fisheries, public procurement and the rest. Public, public, Plaid Cymru voted against that. Scotland refused such legislative consent as well. Mark Drakeford in summing up on the 15th of May, was proud to call himself a unionist and trumpet the common frameworks aspect of the EU withdrawal. Shared governance was the talk of the day. A new spirit of respect and trust would break out between the governments of these islands. Westminster and Welsh Government would be equal partners in this new sunlit Brexit uplands. Wales would be involved and respected in all decisions in devolved frozen matters. And the reality? Well, in the Royal Welsh Show, this summer, that gave us a view of the new order. The main food hall, full of Welsh produce, branded with red, white and blue, Union Jacks, no Welsh language. Food is great, Britain and Northern Ireland. Very, very pithy. The UK Agricultural Bill and Welsh Government's consultation on the future of agriculture blithely following the policy in England in ditching single farm payments despite farming in Wales being totally different and more akin to farming in Scotland and Northern Ireland that are retaining single payments. The tortuous Brexit negotiations. Are Wales involved at all? Welsh Government complains are not being listened to. Is this shared governance? The shared prosperity fund. Wales does not know what's going on with the replacement for European funding. Much eloquence from Labour members last week and from a couple of Labour members in First Minister's scrutiny on Friday about Westminster ignoring Wales. 585 pages of a bad Brexit deal with no mention of Wales. A bad Brexit deal that <coughs> Labour here opposes. 100 pages on Northern Ireland, zero on Wales. Now we have an intergovernmental agreement, Labour say. The non-statutory, non-enforceable intergovernmental agreement, surely it's in jeopardy, tied to a Brexit deal that Labour here opposes. The present Westminster government pays precious little attention to it. Government has been coming back here saying they don't listen. What hopes has our non-statutory 
intergovernmental agreement got with a different UK Prime Minister or with a Labour UK Government Prime Minister? What hopes? Intergovernmental non-statutory agreement. I'm not holding my breath. With rampant uncertainty all around, we need to keep the devolved powers that we have always had. What a mess. The Welsh Continuity Act is in the statute book. Let it stay there. Mick Antonev. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, And I'd perhaps uh, like to thank Clyde for promoting my question at the uh, scrutiny of the First Minister so widely on social media. It is always, does my career, does my career the word of good. Um, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I also say, though, that uh, on the several occasions I've raised those questions, they've raised very sincerely, and the points that Stefan makes uh, and the challenges you make are very valid ones, uh, and ones that do deserve, I think, considered uh, replies. Um, and uh, I think it is a, a question of considered judgment and strategy as to where we go on this. I have to say I've been in two minds about the issue of the uh, Continuity Act, as I will call it, as, uh, as it's much, much loved, uh, as to what it represents uh, and what it will achieve. Certainly, when it was introduced, it was absolutely vital. We had Clause 11 in a bill, which clearly was an agenda that took away powers. Uh, it certainly gave us leverage. It was certainly a very effectively drafted piece of legislation. Uh, and uh, I, I think put forward very, very succinct arguments that set the parameters in terms of how we see uh, Welsh powers returning from Brussels. And I think it set exactly right the constitutional position. The point about it is, though, is that a consequence of that was that we then came to the intergovernmental agreement. And that intergovernmental agreement, the question now is, is the Continuity Act better than, does it put us in a stronger position than the uh, issues that arise from the intergovernmental agreement? And that's a very serious question uh, to ask that, Steve, that Stefan has asked uh, and that I've asked as well. I've thought about it very, very carefully and I have to say this. The first thing about the intergovernmental agreement, which is, I think, a remarkable piece of negotiation by Mark Drakeford, by the uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, for a number of particular reasons. Firstly, it is based on a recognition of those very devolved powers that we have argued. It actually enshrines, as a matter of principle, those uh, devolved powers that we say belong to us that are part of the devolution settlement. Secondly, it doesn't involve the transfer of any powers elsewhere. Thirdly, it actually incorporates an enhanced civil process. It's quite remarkable, when we were at the Interbark Parliamentary Forum, when we were down in Westminster and in the House of Lords, telling the House of Lords members that they now actually have a veto on steps that might be taken by the UK government to override the refusal of consent from this place. I think it's actually quite a remarkable step forward. I'm not actually sure that uh, when uh, the UK government negotiated this, they were actually aware of what they were doing. It's quite remarkable. I've never been in favour of the House of Lords or, in fact, giving it more powers, but on this particular occasion, I'm, I'm perhaps prepared to make a, 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 bit, a bit of an exception. And importantly, what it also does is something that uh, is very important to us uh, at this present moment, and that is the development of frameworks. Whatever happens, we need a, a mechanism for those frameworks to proceed. Now, if we, if we withdraw, if we uh, don't repeal that, and if the intergovernmental agreement collapses, does it therefore provide us with any silver bullet of protection? That's the question I've asked myself. And I can't say where it does. Uh, at no stage do we, uh, at any stage, challenge or are able to challenge that ultimately the sovereignty of Parliament enables it to override in all, all sorts of ways. Stefan asks another very important question as well. Um, should we wait to the Scottish Judgment? I, you know, I would really like to wait to the Scottish Judgment. I know there are pressures why we have to uh, do this now because of the potential of collapse of the intergovernmental agreement at this current moment in time. Uh, but the, other, the, the, the adverse side to the Scottish Judgment is this. Firstly, if it's successful, it doesn't put us actually in a stronger position. If it is adverse to us, 
it actually puts us in a much worse position. We not only don't have the intergovernmental agreement and the protections there, you then have a judgment of the Supreme Court, which is confirming the power of uh, Westminster to override uh, on constitutional matters. So I don't think it gives us that particular silver bullet that we actually want. So, you know, I don't think that it also, you know, us taking the position that we're doing now and repealing this, uh, it doesn't take away the constitutional challenges, which are very fundamental challenges that still exist in respect of the reform of the JMC. The fact that we do need a clearly delineated sewer arrangement, one that is justiciable. We need a clearly a more federalised constitutional structure. And interestingly, the Interparliamentary Forum, which we've been participating in, Dyrese and myself as chairs of our respective committees, is actually almost saying that very thing I itself. So at this moment in time, I think we have to separate this very carefully from some of the other political issues that are going on, the very serious issues at the moment as to whether the government's going to collapse, whether there's going to be a general election, what the consequence might be of that, or if there isn't a general election of uh, alternative constitutional steps being taken. But at this moment in time, in terms of all the things that we have responsibility for and are doing, are we better off as a result are we better off as a result of the intergovernmental agreement that we've got that makes us clear in the position that we're in and the powers we have and sets a clear structure for that? Or are we better off by throwing that away and relying on a piece of legislation that can be so easily overturned? Uh, the answer I've come to is it is correct to repeal this. Strategically, it is the most prudent decision and the best decision in the interest of Wales. Not one I particularly want to take. But I think at this state, this moment in time, it is the right decision to take. And I think the recommendation from the uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, our Brexit Minister, Mark Drakeford, is the correct one. And he's put forward the correct proposal. And I think it is right that we do take the step that's being uh, mooted today. David Melden. I'm pleased that, to have attracted you. I am very grateful. I hadn't originally intended to speak in this debate, but I, I do think uh, Stephen Lewis has raised points that are important and deserve a uh, uh, response. Um, I, in what I thought was a thoughtful uh, uh, contribution, I, I enjoyed Di Lloyd's contribution, but I, 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 I'm not so sure it was, it was quite as thoughtful, but it was certainly uh, plangent and uh, uh, full of uh, that spirit that we're used to seeing from uh, uh, the plied benches. Um, I, I, I spoke for uh, uh, the Welsh Conservative Group when the bill was going through its uh, very speedy passage through this place. I mean, as an emergency piece of legislation, I think I'm right in saying it received uh, less attention than any other piece of legislation that we have ever passed, and we have passed a couple of emergency uh, bills. Um, and this, I thought, was really troubling, but the reason I particularly uh, objected to the bill was that I always thought it was a distraction. It was the intergovernmental agreement that was always central. And uh, I argued this case very strongly then. Um, I am pleased, actually, that both governments, the Welsh government and the UK government, uh, were able, despite the passing of the bill and, and it becoming an act, uh, to work at uh, that uh, agreement and, and to secure it. The need for UK-wide frameworks has always been recognised over such fields as aspects of the environment and agriculture and other key areas, recognised by the Scottish Government, I think in fairness, recognised by Plaid. And indeed, uh, these frameworks require powers uh, that uh, were previously vested in the EU to sit somewhere so that they could be crafted. And they do need to be crafted between the governments with, I argued then, the UK government with its capacity taking the lead, but as a partner and not I imposing. And I do think that that is what has transpired. Uh, and as has already been uh, referred to in this debate, uh, the UK government has not driven over us. The Section 12 powers have not been used. However, I would finish with this, and this is uh, the point where, I mean, I do have some... Uh, uh, I do recognise some of the, the, the uh, reservations and concerns that uh, the Ply Cymru Group have. We now start with a model of shared governance. It's still a little clumsy. It's being crafted. But in our uh, you know, uh, uh, post-Brexit uh, existence, which will come into play uh, sometime next year, presumably, 
Uh, the way the UK deals with its intergovernmental and, uh, uh, arrangements and the need for shared governance over uh, uh, key areas, which does involve all the parliaments of the UK, that will really test the strength of the union. And I think Stefan was hinting uh, in his uh, contribution, you know, where are the unionists? They need to be talking up this need for a new, more federal, perhaps, uh, dimension, I think, uh, uh, Mick hinted at this as well, and I agree with that. I think that will be the real test. It's how it will work uh, after this uh, 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 obviously difficult process of uh, uh, leaving uh, the EU. But as a, I, 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 as a piece of legislation, I never thought it was particularly necessary. I mean, it was part of the wider debate in the end, and, you know, let bygones be bygones. But I do think it's time as... Uh, as, as now passed, and it is right, I think, uh, to fully honour, uh, or for the Welsh Government to fully honour the uh, intergovernmental agreement, and that will strengthen its position uh, in the future. I do have a great confidence that uh, the Welsh Government's general approach, uh, it, you know, it is critical of many of the priorities the UK Government has over its own domestic fields, but it has been prepared to work constructively, and I do welcome that fact, and it does give me uh, a lot of optimism that our shared governance models will become more and more robust with time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yeah. call on the Cabinet Secretary to the prior to the debate. Uh, shall we? Thanks to all members who have taken part uh, in this uh, important and thoughtful uh, debate. Uh, let me begin by um, reflecting on what Darren Miller and David Melding just uh, said. The, the point at which I uh, don't agree with them uh, is when they have argued that the continuity bill was a distraction to the process of securing the intergovernmental uh, agreement. In my experience of being in the room and in those discussions, it was integral to achieving that intergovernmental agreement. Uh, and I'm very proud of the Act and what was achieved here because it genuinely did provide us with leverage at a very important point in the process. Uh, the fact that we had it undoubtedly made the achievement of the sort of intergovernmental agreement that we were able to negotiate more likely, not uh, less likely. Uh, our belief is that the IGA is better than uh, the Act. That's why uh, we regard it uh, as right today to move to repeal uh, of the Act. But I don't agree at all uh, that the bill and the debate here and the fact that we put it on the statute book, that that did not play an integral and pivotal part in allowing us to get to that intergovernmental uh, agreement. Uh, Darren asked why we had uh, delayed in bringing the repeal uh, forward. And the reason for that is that we needed to allow the process that we had set out in the intergovernmental agreement to be demonstrated. We needed to see that it was being honoured on both sides. And the report that was put in front of Parliament last week, I think, provides us with that evidence and allows us to move to repeal uh, this afternoon. Uh, Darren Miller asked about uh, frameworks. Uh, because it is because we are making such progress with frameworks that there is now no prospect of the freezing uh, parts of the Withdrawal Act being uh, used. So a great deal of work has gone on. We are now at uh, a stage agreed in the Joint Ministerial Committee uh, earlier this month that in December we will see the first of the frameworks come in front of the JMC uh, for uh, review. They are in uh, fisheries management and support, animal health and welfare, hazardous substances planning and nutrition. And the Scottish Government, as Darren Miller said, has played a full part uh, in all those uh, discussions and will be part of the JMC consideration of them in December. And then we will go out to consult with stakeholders who have an interest in those four areas before they come back to the JMC for that final part of the shared governance that the IGA sets up and which is being delivered uh, in that uh, way. Let me turn to the two Ply Cymru um, contributions uh, this afternoon. Uh, there is no doubting uh, at all uh, the integrity and the sincerity with which Stefan Lewis has played his part. 
in the whole history uh, of the continuity bill and in the remarks that he has made uh, this afternoon. And I share some of the things uh, that he said, certainly the tribute he made to those who have crafted uh, the continuity bill. It was a very skillful and successful uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and I agree with him too, uh, that too often the current United Kingdom government is careless about the future of the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's been a constant part of what uh, Wales has contributed to the JMC and other discussions that we continuously uh, put forward the need for time to be found before we leave the European Union, uh, for thought to be given to the way that the United Kingdom will operate when the rule book that we share between us through our membership of the European Union is no longer uh, there. One of the reasons why it is right to emphasise the intergovernmental agreement, however, is because it breaks new ground in that way. It moves us forward into territory where greater shared government in the future beyond the European Union is more likely, not less likely. Uh, Stefan set out four reasons why he uh, opposed the repeal of the Continuity Bill. He said that the IGA fails to safeguard uh, Welsh powers against unilateral action by the UK Government, but it does defend Wales against that. There are no unilateral powers that can be used without our agreement, and not with the agreement of the Government, but with the agreement of this Legislature, because any move to freeze powers would have to be agreed by us and put to the floor of the Assembly uh, here. Uh, he said that it didn't help us to uh, withstand the withdrawal uh, agreement, but the LEDEU bill is no shield uh, against the withdrawal agreement. It simply doesn't operate uh, in that area. He pointed to Sewell, and I have worked closely with the Scottish Minister at the JMC to try to get the UK Government to revisit Sewell and to find a more satisfactory way of entrenching the defences that it provides. But as Mick Antoniff said, as far as the IGA is concerned, it extends Sewell. It requires a separate vote in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and not only a separate vote in both houses, but those legislatures making that decision will, for the very first time, have an independent account provided by the Welsh Government of our perspective on the issue that they are, uh, that they are resolving. And as to the Supreme Court, uh, I, I agree with what the First Minister uh, says here on this uh, issue, that the risk of the Supreme Court for Scotland is, is that it's left without an act and without an intergovernmental agreement, whereas we have succeeded in an IGA which is not dependent upon the Supreme uh, Court uh, action uh, at all. And that's why we come back uh, in front of the Assembly uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dyloid, um, look, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to say once again, I say it every time, uh, Dyloid began by saying that the intergovernmental agreement allowed for powers in 26 areas uh, to be frozen and that they'd already gone. Now, not a single part of that is accurate. Not a single power has left this assembly. Every single power on that list of 26 is still here. Not one of those areas has been frozen. Not one of those areas has left the jurisdiction of this National Assembly. And the risk of that happening, of course, of course. So that, say I'll pick at random one of the 26, yeah. say food labelling or hazardous substances planning that we've always had here from Brussels. So tomorrow you could decide to legislate that there, could you? Or is it frozen? You can do nothing about it. No, let me, let me explain, exactly. I really think I need to be clear what the position is. Uh, we are today still members of the European Union, yeah. so we couldn't legislate tomorrow uh, because we are part of the common European uh, rule book. Uh, your party, as I myself uh, would want to say, believes that we will be better off remaining in the European Union. If those powers were to be frozen, and they haven't been in that area or any one of the 26, all that freezing would do 
will be to guarantee that the current rule book would continue. That's what freezing means. It means the current arrangements, the arrangements we all support as part of our membership of the European Union, would go on being in place <laughs> until something else was agreed to be put in its place. And nothing else could be put in its place unless it was agreed, and agreed by this National Assembly. That's why the anxieties that I repeated this afternoon about powers being gone from the National Assembly simply doesn't measure up to the facts of the matter. Nothing has gone. All those powers are here. They remain here as they always have, exercised as they are now and have been since the start of the Assembly through the common European rule. Thank you for taking the intervention. Is, isn't that the reality, though, that we are at the beginning of a protracted period uh, of seven, eight years, over which there will be changes of government at UK level, uh, changes of government here, and non-statutory intergovernmental agreements could end up as worthless uh, in the context of different opinions and different relationships. You, you, you clearly think you have a good relationship with people you've been negotiating with. That might not always be the case. Uh, so if governments can't proceed on that basis, governments have to proceed on the basis that a, a, an, an agreement struck with a government is an agreement that uh, goes on being honoured. That's why the fiscal framework uh, has been successively uh, negotiated with different UK governments, Labour governments, Conservative governments, governments over 20 years. Those things go on being honoured as governments pass from one to the other until you reach a point when it is renegotiated by mutual uh, consent. You can't go on as governments uh, always on the basis that you can't trust the person who you've just come to uh, an agreement with. Uh, let me end then, Chloe, if I can, by thanking uh, Jane Hutt and Mick Antonyuf for what they both uh, said, emphasising the importance of the intergovernmental agreement, explaining what a reversal of the original Clause 11 uh, that it demonstrates, and saying that we have reached a point where the LDEU Act, vitally important as it was at the moment that it was agreed, its usefulness has now been extracted in full, now is the moment to repeal it, because that is what is in the best interests of Wales. Question you. The proposal is to agree the motion. Does any member object? Object. I will defer voting under this item until voting time. The next item is item 9, debate on how we achieve a low-carbon energy system for Wales. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary for Energy Planning and Rural Affairs, Leslie Griffiths. I'm pleased to bring this debate to plenary to explore the future role Wales should play in the UK and global energy system, stimulating a discussion regarding the future of energy in Wales. This is a challenging time given the uncertainties of energy in a post-Brexit world. What is certain is the need to decarbonise. In Wales, the Environment Act is our legislative vehicle acting on climate change. Next month, I will ask the Assembly to approve our interim emissions targets to 2050 and our first two carbon budgets. In March next year, we will be publishing our first low carbon delivery plan for Wales. I'm working cross government with my Cabinet colleagues through the Decarbonisation Ministerial Task and Finish Group to deliver decarbonisation across all our portfolios. It's clear every one of us has to take action on climate change now, and I call on the Assembly to support our efforts to decrease carbon emissions. This also delivers on the priorities I set out in my energy statement in September 2016. My first priority is to use energy more efficiently in Wales. Improving the energy efficiency of the homes of low-income households is the most effective way in which we can tackle fuel poverty, whilst also reducing harmful emissions into the environment. We are investing £104 million in Welsh Government warm homes for the period of 2017 to 2021. This will enable us to improve a further 25,000 homes. Our Welsh Government Energy Service has invested over £55 million of zero interest loans across the public sector in Wales over the last three years, supporting the ambition for a carbon neutral public sector. We also need to ensure new buildings don't add to the retrofit challenge. We are currently scoping out the topics that will be in the review of building regulations and expect to go to public consultation in the spring. My second priority is reducing our reliance on energy generated uh, from fossil fuels. 
Last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a hard-hitting report on the impacts of global warming. To limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, the IPCC recommends scaling up renewable generation rapidly to provide around 85% of the world's electricity by 2050. The report suggests a renewables-led system supported by nuclear and fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage would allow gas to generate around 8% of electricity worldwide to provide a flexible base load and ensure supplies are secure. This means we have to change our energy system. We are not going to create the scale of the change we need without difficult decisions which impact on communities in Wales. Last year I set stretching but realistic renewable targets. These will help us decarbonise our energy system, reduce long-term costs and deliver greater benefits to Wales. We're already making good progress towards these targets. I've just published an updated Energy Generation in Wales report with figures to the end of 2017. The report shows electricity equivalent to 48% of Wales' consumption was generated from renewable energy. 529 megawatts of our installed renewable electricity capacity was locally owned, meaning the, the profits from this generation stayed in Wales. This represents good progress against our targets of 70% of electricity consumption from renewables and one gigawatt of locally owned generation by 2030. New generation must deliver sufficient benefit to justify Wales hosting it. And this ties into my third priority to drive the energy transition to deliver maximum benefits for Wales. I expect all new renewable energy projects in Wales to include at least an element of local ownership, to retain wealth and provide real benefit to communities. Our response to the call for evidence on local ownership will be published in the next few weeks. We will be taking action to increase retention of benefit in Wales. I hope when people have more ownership of generation, the dialogue around renewable energy will change from do we want this to what do we need and where should we put it. We also have a window of opportunity now to develop and grow our own innovative marine energy industry, which could help others across the globe to reduce fossil fuels. Marine energy represents a major export opportunity. We've invested in marine technologies and the UK government must provide supportive financial regimes for these emerging technologies, which cannot yet compete on price alone with established technologies. The offshore wind sector is an example of early stage UK funding during development, leading to cost effective and sustainable energy generation. I hope we can find new sites off Wales' coast for offshore to contribute to our targets. This example should now be followed for the marine sector. The UK missed the opportunity to be a global leader in offshore wind. We cannot afford for the same to happen to our marine wave and tidal industry. However much renewable energy generation we produce, we must also remove fossil fuel generation from the energy system to bring emissions down. The new energy generation report also shows Wales generated more than twice the electricity it consumed last year. Between 1990 and 2016, our emissions from the power sector increased by 44%, whilst overall UK emissions from the sector reduced by 60%. We host 19% of the UK's gas-fired electricity generation, a key factor in this increase. We need to think about whether we are con content to host new gas generation in Wales, and if so, how we can ensure it is compatible with carbon capture and storage. I'm keen to hear uh, members' views on whether Wales should only generate electricity for our own needs, or whether we should continue to be a net ex exporter. As part of our work to reduce emissions, Welsh Government has made clear our opposition to fracking. I am determined to use every possible lever to ensure fracking does not take place in Wales. This includes a strong opposition to issuing new petroleum licences or consents for fracking and the introduction of a much more robust planning policy. The recent consultation on petroleum extraction set out our preferred position. I will confirm our policy position and respond to the consultation before the end of the year. We also need to consider the role of nuclear. If UK Government does consent new nuclear in Wales, it will be the largest single investment in Wales in a generation, and our priority is to achieve a positive 
and lasting legacy for North Wales. We must also ensure we protect the local communities and environment. In addition to current electricity use, we need to consider the impact of decarbonising transport and heat. Currently, there are around 2.5 million ultra-low emissions vehicles bought annually in the UK. There could be as many as 11 million electric vehicles by 2030. Charging an electric vehicle at home would almost double the electricity consumption of that home. Significant investment in renewables and infrastructure will be needed to serve this increasing demand. And we need clarity on what infrastructure is needed and where it should be. As agreed with Plaid Cymru, I have committed funding to an Energy Atlas, and we recently agreed our approach on this to offer support for regional and local energy planning. This will help ensure we maximise the value of energy opportunities within the city and growth deals throughout Wales. This delivers on my third priority of driving the energy transition to deliver maximum benefits for Wales. Regional whole energy system planning will help us understand where we need more low-carbon generation and where our energy infrastructure requires investment. We are working with network providers on this as where uh, they are sure new grid is needed, they can build this into their investment plans. Putting Wales at the forefront of the evolving energy frontier, we are creating demonstrators to encourage academics and businesses to develop new technology systems and processes. We are leveraging funding from the EU and other sources to help deliver our vision of a smart, low-carbon energy system. Specific is changing the way we deliver buildings. They've developed several energy-positive buildings, including, including the active classroom at Swansea Bay Campus and the Salsa House at Stormy Down. We're also supporting the Swansea University-led proposal to establish an active building centre in Wales. This will be an industry-led centre to speed up the rollout of active buildings. The Welsh Government's innovative housing programme provides another opportunity to develop proofs of concept buildings. By doing this at scale, we tackle the uncertainties about whether efficient homes will be more expensive to build. Innovative technologies require new business models and changes in regulation. They also change the way we live and work in buildings. New models are coming forward, exploring new approaches to energy efficiency, generation, use and storage. All these initiatives help us capture Welsh value from the transition to a low-carbon energy system. I have no illusions regarding the size of the challenge decarbonisation presents, nor the uncertainties around how we might get there. There is no one single solution or technology which will guarantee delivery of our carbon targets. Given the size of the challenge, we will need to explore all avenues. Wales has an internationally admired suite of innovative research and development programmes to help us do it. So I very much look forward to hearing all members' views uh, around the direction for a prosperous and low-carbon Wales. Thank you. I have selected the five amendments to the motion, and I call on Neil McAvoy to move Amendment 1 table in his name. Neil McAvoy. On the 24th of October, I was the only Assembly member who voted to oppose nuclear power in Wales. I found that quite incredible, given how much opposition there is to nuclear power from the public and supposedly from other politicians. If he were here, I would say to the alleged anti-nuclear Labour leadership candidates, the AM for Cardiff West, who voted to dump nuclear mud in Wales and who did not oppose nuclear power last time, here is an opportunity to reject nuclear energy and put it on the record. The same goes for the Labour AM for Cardiff Central, who also is not here. She claims to be an environmentalist and anti-nuclear, but said the waters just outside Cardiff was the, the go-to site to dump mud dredged from outside Hinkley Point nuclear power station. I, I find that astonishing. The Labour AM for Cardiff Central also failed to oppose nuclear power last time. Well, the AM is not bound by the whip this time, so maybe, maybe she may vote against nuclear energy. A justification for some in not opposing nuclear power is that energy here is not devolved. It's not devolved to this assembly. 
Well, just, just because a matter is not devolved, that does not mean that we should not have a position on it. Far from it. Far from it. We debate Brexit, yet have no power here to deal with the dog's dinner of it made by the Conservatives. We're not just here to sit back and let the Conservative government in England dump whatever they want on us. If we want to get some respect, we have to kick up a fuss and say no in the national interest of Wales. So that's why today we've got a new amendment that I've introduced, this time calling on the Welsh Government to oppose the use of nuclear power as a means to achieve a low carbon energy system. Nuclear power is not low carbon. It is not sustainable. There is a much higher carbon cost than for renewables. Nuclear power plants will generate as much carbon as nuclear, as gas-powered stations in the future. I think that's worth, worth saying because uh, I don't think many people realise that nuclear power stations will generate as much carbon as gas-powered stations in the future. That's because the, the grade of uranium is decreasing. We're a country blessed with natural resources, water, wind, tides, and even a bit of sun sometimes. Why not use those natural resources and not import uranium producing nuclear wastes and taking huge risks with the future of Wales and the health of our people? <coughs> Research by the Federal Government of Germany shows that there are increased cancer rates around nuclear power stations. And that's one of the reasons why they're being phased out in Germany. Now, if this Labour government in Wales is serious about achieving a low carbon energy system, then we must oppose nuclear energy and send a clear message to the Conservatives in England to keep their reactors out of our country. Support the amendment and oppose nuclear in Wales. Deal. Thank you. I'm going to call on Andrew Archie Davies to move amendments two and three, tabled in the name of Darren Miller. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's my pleasure to move the two amendments in the name of Darren Miller this afternoon. Um, just as talking about the generalities of the debate, it is good that we do debate these issues. One thing that Wales has is an abundance of natural resources that, if harnessed correctly, could help the energy footprint, not just of Wales, and of the, but of the rest of the United Kingdom. And I did note that the Cabinet Secretary said that is a question we should pose to ourselves. Should we be exporting our energies, or should we be generating enough for uh, Wales as a country? And I would argue that we are well placed to help the rest of the United Kingdom meet its energy requirements. Indeed, it is very desirable. Uh, for us to do that uh, with the host of energy generation that we could uh, put to best use. Uh, talking to the two amendments, if I may, uh, obviously the Wilver Neuwith proposal up in Anglesey is an exciting and dynamic proposal that has been on the stocks for many years now uh, and thankfully seems to be coming into fruition uh, and the end game. Uh, and I do hope very much that the political groups here today will support the amendment that is before the Assembly uh, because it offers an exciting opportunity an opportunity that the First Minister himself has said is transformational, not just for the North Wales economy, but for the economy of Wales as a whole, uh, when we're talking of between 8 and 10,000 jobs at peak production um, of, of, of construction, uh, with 850 permanent jobs, well-paid jobs, I might add, and being located in a location that has a historical perspective of hosting a nuclear plant uh, prior to the new one being established. I'll take the member. Thank you, thank, thank you very much for taking an, an intervention. We, we won't be supporting the, the amendment as it happens, and although it's well known that I, I work very positively with the developers at, at Wilbur, there are a few things uh, with this amendment that, that I would say is not consistent with certainly what, what I feel long term. I don't think nuclear is the, the answer. We've got to be clear on that. We've got to be clear about how transformational it is in the long term for the economy of Wales, as important as it is for my constituency. Uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to 
talk of energy mix for Wales. Will there's part of an energy mix for the UK, not, not for Wales in, in reality? I, I find that remarkable, that intervention from the Member of Anxia. I recognise the work that he has done as an individual, but it clearly shows that he has failed to win the argument within his political group. Well, and I therefore, uh, I fail to see how, when the re reference in the amendment is quite clear to Wilver Newith specifically, uh, and doesn't widen any broader than that, um, that he, certainly as an individual, cannot support it, leave alone the rest of the Plaid Cymru group. So I had assumed that the Plaid Cymru group uh, were supportive of Wilver Newith, uh, whilst had a discussion and a debate around the wider issues of nuclear production and nuclear energy. But obviously people will see the way the group votes today and know which side their bread is buttered on. Uh, on Amendment 3, um, I think this is a really important issue that uh, was driven home to me uh, by the residents of the, around the Hendy Wind Farm development, which the Minister obviously chose to intervene on uh, and actually give permission to this particular development. Uh, the Minister did touch on communities being able to have a say and a stake uh, in renewable projects. And I do think that's really, really important. But when uh, residents of a locality find that they've engaged in the democratic process, i.e. the planning system, they've gone through the local authority, they've had an inspector look at the proposals as well, and on each and every occasion, uh, the inspector and the planning authority have said that this application is not suitable to be developed in this particular location. That really does undermine residents' faith, residents faith uh, in the process. And this amendment is put down tonight in the hope that members in this chamber will galvanise support to encourage the Minister to reflect on the decision she has taken. Only this morning some pictures were coming out from the location uh, showing that heavy plant was moving on to the site uh, in defiance, I would suggest, of um, the planning authorities' permissions to date along common ground. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary, if, that amendment, if our amendment is defeated tonight, that she does make inquiries to satisfy herself that there is no work going on on the site at the moment uh, because it is huge, huge, causing a huge amount of concern. But obviously I very much hope that our amendment will pass this, this, this evening because it really does warrant a reconsideration on behalf of the Minister. There is an exciting and dynamic agenda when it comes to renewables, but riding roughshod over local residents is confidence in the, in the principle of having a fair hearing, putting their case and having that case heard and supported, and then undermining those cases uh, really does no no service at all to the renewable sectors. Uh, and I do believe that the Minister does need to answer that in her summing up this afternoon, and I hope that she will do that. Uh, just if I could galvanise the rest of the debate that we want to put forward from this side, we do believe passionately that Wales is well paced to play its part in lowering carbon emissions uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, we do have a natural abundance of opportunities to develop renewable energy here. Uh, two areas that do need considerable consideration, though, I would suggest, in government influence are grid connections in particular, because there are many small renewable projects that could get off the ground if only they could get a grid connection, and they could in themselves play a huge uh, opportunity in collectively coming together to raise our uh, numbers in this particular field. And I do believe that Ofgem, uh, whilst it's not a devolved responsibility, the Cabinet Secretary engaged uh, with Ofgem to encourage them to be more proactive here in Wales, because they are the regulator, and in, when it comes to combined heat and plant uh, units being established, which the report touches on, there is a huge issue around the backlog, around RHI applications, that really is deterring investment in that particular sector. Uh, and again, I do believe that that's an area that needs uh, addressing um, and hopefully government intervention to support the sector to make sure that people have confidence to make those significant investments. But I do hope our two amendments carry tonight. Uh, the one in particular around Wilver Newith, which looks to invest in a community that is desperate for that investment and create quality jobs with decent, well-paid well -paid, well -paid salaries. Uh, and the second amendment that we've tabled around the Hendy Wind Farm it does require a second look, Minister. I do hope that you will give us the confidence. I can see you shaking your head and saying that you will not be doing it. It is highly regrettable, and people will lack the confidence going forward that Ministers are adhering to the rules. I'm going to call on Claire Griffiths to move amendments 4 and 5, tabled in the name of Sri Napiola. Uh, um... Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased that the motion and the Cabinet Secretary referred to the Energy Generation Report in Wales 2017, because that tells us a great deal of the story, namely that 48% of the electricity that we use in Wales comes from renewable energy. That's increased by 5%. 
and that's positive of course what's less positive is only 751 megawatts of capacity of renewable energy install is actually locally owned by the community and clearly that's an area where some work needs to be done because not only are we eager to see the development of renewable energy but we also want to ensure that the ownership of that energy is in the right hands 63,000 energy projects renewable energy projects under local ownership in one sense but 94 percent of those uh, solar PV schemes on domestic roofs that's positive of course but it does show how much work remains to be done and as we've already heard we do have the natural resources we have the natural capital in Wales to be a world leader in terms of renewable energy the question therefore is why aren't we leading the world what's holding us back and I would argue that both amendments that we've put forward this afternoon do try to highlight those issues in the first place we need the powers to achieve that potential and to deliver it and secondly we need the political will but also the means to deliver that potential too we're calling for full devolution of all energy powers nobody would surprised, be surprised about that but it is striking that the Westminster agenda in energy is moving in one direction and the political will here in Wales is going in a very different direction we've already heard reference to fracking which is one clear example of that and the absence of those powers holds us back. Look at the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. If the responsibilities for energy had been devolved, I have no doubt that it would happen. It either would have happened already or it would be construct being, being constructed as we speak. So if we are serious about achieving much of our potential, then we do have to take ownership of the powers in order to deliver that ourselves. Affairs in its uh, re-energising Wales project has uh, demonstrated that greater ambition and immediate practical action uh, are required to realise the vision for 100% renewable energy and these actions include upscaling energy efficiency well of course you'll remember our manifesto pledge for a multi-billion pound retrofitting uh, scheme here in Wales also mentions how uh, building regulations could significantly uh, increase energy efficiency you, you refer to that but of course Plaid Cymru was the only party in this assembly that wasn't happy with the very modest uh, improvement in the Part L regulations that this government brought forward a few years ago and now of course we're playing catch-up uh, onshore wind farms offshore wind farms uh, and future proofing electricity grids it's all there in the re-energizing uh, Wales uh, work and of course it isn't just the environmental uh, focus the economic one is clear uh, as well because uh, those kinds of investments according to the Institute of Welsh Affairs could support some 20,000 jobs annually across Wales during a 15-year investment period with around seven, nearly £7.5 billion in total Welsh GBA created uh, as uh, a result. You mentioned, um, well, I, I mentioned Unni Cymru, you mentioned Atlas, uh, the Atlas, Energy Atlas, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, Unni Cymru, of course, uh, is, I believe, one way of developing that stronger focus on community-orientated uh, uh, energy uh, development. We've, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again, because every time I get up in these kinds of debates, I'll be saying it. We need to move away from the hub-and-spoke model of, of energy generation to a more uh, dispersed uh, spider web where energy is used as well as produced locally. Uh, that will give us the resilience. And it's happening in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, in Denmark and other countries, uh, and we need to move in that direction uh, as well. I, I welcome the Energy Atlas. I think it will help us with mapping out and modelling the potential of renewable energy resources throughout Wales, uh, and that investment will enable strategic energy planning that will, as well, uh, facilitate a bottom-up approach to energy uh, in the longer term. I'm running out of time, so I will address uh, the amendments very, very quickly. Um, um, well, I did respond to the First Amendment some fortnight ago, and I don't see that anything's changed since that point, so I will leave that there. In terms of the Second Amendment on Wilva, well, the last thing we want is that nuclear should be part of the long-term energy mix. The whole purpose is that we move away from the hub-and-spoke model, as I said earlier, and not shackle another generation to that model. So clearly we're going to oppose that amendment, and on the Third Amendment, well, it's only right, of course, that local voices should be heard in any discussions around planning decisions, be it energy or anything else. And it's also right, of course, 
that having balanced the different factors and the different considerations that the Cabinet Secretary should make a final decision on issues which are of greater significance than simply the local. They have national significance, so we will also be opposing that amendment. We do have the local, the natural resources here in Wales, rather. We have the natural capital, so let's use it in a way that brings benefits to our people and, most importantly, brings benefits for future generations. Thank you. Dara Miller. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just want to speak very briefly uh, in respect of the amendment that uh, has been tabled uh, by the Welsh Conservatives in respect of the Hendy Wind Farm. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that she made a very similar decision uh, to this earlier this year in respect of a wind farm application in my own constituency uh, in the Denby Moors uh, area, the Pant Mine Wind Farm, uh, which was uh, uh, subject to a planning application which was submitted to Denbyshire County, uh, County Council. That application was uh, refused. An appeal was made uh, to uh, the Welsh Government. The inspectorate then produced a report which recommended uh, refusal, very strongly recommended uh, refusal. Other uh, Assembly uh, Welsh, uh, Welsh Government uh, sponsored bodies, including CADU, uh, also objected to the development on the basis uh, that it would uh, impact on the view from uh, nearby uh, Bronze Age barrows and, uh, uh, and, and burial mounds, that it would um, have a, a devastating impact on the landscape of the nearby Cluidian Range uh, area of outstanding natural beauty uh, as well. Uh, and yet, for some reason, the Welsh Government uh, proceeded uh, with, or the Welsh Minister decided uh, that her view uh, was different uh, than that of the Inspector, different than that uh, of the local authority. And unfortunately, uh, this wind farm is now going to be uh, developed. And I appreciate uh, the point that Claire Griffith made about the need for a uh, national strategy perspective uh, from the Welsh Government uh, from time to time on issues uh, which are significant. But this is a very small uh, wind farm uh, which was being developed, just seven turbines, uh, just seven individual uh, turbines, not huge at all. You could hardly say that seven turbines individually are a strate of strategic importance nationally in the same way that Wilver Newydd, uh, or, or a much more sizable offshore wind farm like the Gwyntamore wind farm. Uh, uh, might be. So I am concerned that this is ri riding roughshod, frankly, over local uh, democracy. I think that the people in the area of the Hendy Wind Farm are facing now uh, precisely the same sort of uh, scenario. I don't think that it's appropriate, and I think we need a, a planning system which is much more balanced and much more reflective of local people's <coughs> views. So I would urge the Welsh Government to look again at the Hendy Wind Farm uh, decision. You know, we've already had one wrong. What we don't want are two, three, four, five, or many others uh, in the future. Let's get this right. Let's sort the balance uh, in the system out uh, so that we can have some confidence in it going forward. I'll take the intervention. Can I, can I agree with the comments in... Oh, permission. Russell George. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I agree with the, the views in the, in riding rough shot over the local community? This doesn't do anything for de local democracy when the Minister rides rough shot over the views of the local authority and the inspector as well. But can I specifically ask when the Minister does respond to this particular amendment that she also addresses the concerns about works being undertaken today that haven't yet had the proper permissions, and perhaps that needs to be reflected in the Minister's comments on this issue as well. I think it is incumbent upon uh, uh, the Minister to try to consider whether those uh, works which are proceeding have the uh, relevant permissions. Clearly, if they haven't, uh, then they should cease uh, forthwith. Uh, and I think that um, you know, we, we have a Cabinet Secretary who has listened on many occasions to arguments which have been made uh, by uh, the Welsh Conservatives uh, and taken forward uh, decisions on, on the basis of the discussions that she's had with us. And I do hope uh, that we are knocking on open door today in respect of this decision too. Thank you. Neil Hamilton. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know very well that I oppose the whole thrust of the Government's energy policy it, uh, and uh, as an exercise in futility, because even if she were to succeed in all her objectives, what we gain in Wales is massively swamped by what's happening in the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the price of this policy is being paid for by the electricity consumers and taxpayers in Wales, and we've just heard the 
the, the, the effects which will be felt in the countryside of these wind farms, these excrescences that are being dotted around all over the hills of Wales. I drove down from Abu Dhabi uh, through uh, Mid Wales uh, at the weekend, and almost everywhere on the skyline you see these eyesores. Um, and in, in addition to the points which I totally agree with that have been raised already by Andrew R.T. Davison and Darren Miller, um, I, I would like to ask wh why it is that the Hendy wind farm has been treated in a different way from that at Truss Crowther in Pembrokeshire, where the same considerations, planning considerations arose. That was only five turbines, Hendy is seven. Uh, Ross Crowther was turned down on the basis of its visual impact and the effect of the landscape. At Llandegli Rocks, uh, near the Hindi, the Hendi uh, wind farm, you've got unspot landscape, scheduled ancient monuments, internationally important paleontology of the Llandegli Rocks. It's the source of the River Edu. There's a huge starling roost there, two to 3,000 starlings, a, co a conservation species, which uh, uh, the developers plan to fell. And there are listed buildings very close to the site. I agree entirely with the point that Darren Miller made, that uh, the effect upon the landscape, and let's not forget that one of the principal assets of Mid Wales is its tourist potential, the effect on the landscape is wholly disproportionate to the gain in terms of the government's energy policy. It's a relatively small project, and looking at this in a global context, it is totally insignificant. And I can't understand, therefore, why the Cabinet Secretary has decided to allow this to go ahead when it can be of no gain practically to anybody other than the developers themselves. And I don't think that that is a sensible basis upon which governments should take these decisions. But I want to address now the wider considerations that the government's energy policy uh, brings up. Now, it would disappoint the uh, Cabinet Secretary if I didn't mention China in this speech, because she actually constantly <laughs> points out to me uh, that, that uh, this is something that I always raise. And, and she's absolutely right, because I want to make this point again. China has 993 gigawatts of capacity for generating electricity, and they have currently under construction another 259 gigawatts of uh, coal-fired power stations principally, um, and that's a 25% increase on their current capacity. That is six times the entire generating capacity of the United Kingdom. If we closed down the entire United Kingdom economy, of course we would uh, cut our carbon emissions uh, to a very small uh, percentage, um, but China uh, would, in the course of however long these new power stations take to build, five to ten years, have made up for that reduction by six times. So anything that we do in Wales, which is responsible for only a minute fraction of 1% of global emissions, uh, uh, will be completely irrelevant uh, uh, in the debate on, on global warming. And I'd like to, uh, uh, to, to, to read from a BBC uh, uh, article on its website only in September. Building workers started, restarted hundreds of Chinese coal-fired power stations according to an analysis of satellite imagery. Uh, 259 gigawatts new capacity under development. Uh, so th this is something which has achieved considerable publicity. Uh, and I think it wholly undermines the whole argument for renewables at vast subsidies which are paid for by ordinary people, and Wales is the poorest part of the United Kingdom. 291,000 households are in fuel poverty, government's own figures. That's 23% of the households in Wales. Uh, people can't afford to pay these increases. Uh, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility last spring uh, revealed uh, in its economic and fiscal outlook that uh, environmental levies this year will cost throughout the United Kingdom £11.3 billion. Pounds. That's a rise of £2 billion pounds over the last financial year. And goes on to say the increase of £2 billion represents a rise in average electricity bills of about 5%. So that's twice the rate uh, of inflation. And this is plan to go on and on and on each year uh, for the foreseeable future until in uh, 2030 it's estimated that at least a third of all electricity bills will be accounted for uh, by environmental levies. So the government's policy is an exercise in futility and the people who are really paying the price are those at the bottom of the income scale whom I would have thought the Labour Party would have had an interest in helping rather than making their lives more difficult. Thank you. Caroline Jones. Dr. Prosewith, 
I welcome the Welsh Government's Energy Generation in Wales 2017 report. The report highlights the mountain we have to climb if we are to reduce Wales' emissions by at least 80% over the next 30 years. It is essential for our future survival that we meet these targets. As set out in the Paris Agreement, reducing emissions was vital if we were to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees compared with pre-industrial levels, with an upper limit of 2 degrees. However, the IPCC reported last month that we would, that we would meet the 1.5 degrees threshold in the next 10 years. Unless we take drastic immediate action, the world is heading for a three to four degree rise in global temperatures. Not a single member of the G20 is taking sufficient action to tackle global warming. And this is not helped by those who still believe climate change is a myth. At the weekend, the leader of the world's largest economy, America, still clung to his woefully mistaken belief that the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. This is in spite of a massive loss of life to climate-related events in the past 12 months. Unless we take drastic immediate action, deadly forest fires, catastrophic hurricanes and devastating floods will be the least of our problems. Even with a two degree rise in global temperatures, we will see entire countries disappear below the rising ocean. A 50% increase in wildfires across Europe and millions of people displaced. We have to act now and we have to act fast. As the energy generation in Wales report highlights, 78% of Welsh energy production comes from fossil fuels. If our planet is to survive relatively unscathed, then we need to reduce that to zero over the coming decades. We need a true mix of renewables, solar panels, tidal power, but the answer doesn't lie in a large-scale wind or solar farm. We need to move to a decentralised energy grid where every home, every village, every town and city produces its own energy. Technology will be the key to averting a global catastrophe. Already we are seeing our homes become more energy efficient. LED lighting uses one uses 100 times less energy. Our appliances are now achieving power and efficiency rates of 95%. New homes are so well insulated, they rarely need heating. However, transport remains our biggest challenge. We need to move to all electric and hydrogen fuelled vehicles a lot sooner than the UK Government's target of 2050. Because of Wales' geography, public transport will never replace all demand for personal transport. We therefore have to ensure that we replace the car, the lorry and the van with clean alternatives. But that is going to require significant investment in infrastructure, investment that we must make and must make now if we are to stand any chance of surviving our changing climate. Diolchan can I now call the Cabinet Secretary for Energy Planning and Rural Affairs to reply to the debate, Leslie Griffiths. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer, and I'd like to thank members um, for their contributions. I think it's very clear that we do need to reconsider Wales' historic role in supporting the wider UK energy system. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks the recent low carbon delivery plan consultation. That really made clear that we do need to fundamentally change our approach to power, heat and transport in order that we meet our decarbonisation objectives in ways that achieve benefits uh, for the people of Wales. And I, and I don't doubt that, that this will need very difficult decisions, and I think it needs not just national leadership, but also uh, local leadership too. We've got to take some bold decisions around building efficiency and future-proofing our building stock. And we also need to help businesses take a longer-term investment approach to energy efficiency projects. And I think we also need to help them recognise that uh, decarbonisation also provides opportunities and our economic action plan prioritises the decarbonisation call to action and the regional approach to its delivery, which will really fit well with our regional energy planning work. Our, on generation, our current reliance on gas, I really think puts us at a risk of missing our carbon targets. I mentioned that we currently host 19% of the UK's gas-fired 
electricity generation, but use only uh, 5%. So, given our responsibility for carbon, I believe that uh, Wales should have complete control over the consenting and deployment of energy in Wales, as we called for in the uh, negotiations of the Wales Act in 2017. The marine sector is working really hard to persuade the UK Government it is worth backing and has a strong fit with their industrial strategy. And I am absolutely uh, committed to working with partners to develop lagoon technologies in Wales and also consider the case uh, for supporting for a new private sector-led project. Overall, the future of our thriving renewable energy industry must be secured if we are to meet our renewable Target. So I do continue to lobby the UK Government to increase levels of investment in renewables. I have raised concerns about the exclusion of onshore wind, which members will be aware is uh, the lowest cost form of, of generation, and also solar technologies from contracts for difference, the proposed closure of the feed-in tariff and the lack of funding to support wave and tidal technologies. And I really do think the UK Government must take um, some swift decisions regarding future support for small-scale renewables. I believe achieving 100 per cent of renewable energy ge uh, generation would be extremely challenging. I think it would risk, um, if we were relying on our neighbours, I think it would risk us being able to keep the lights on in Wales, and I'm sure uh, members here would share my concerns about putting Wales in that position. Uh, we will need significant investments in energy generation and networks in order to deliver our carbon targets in Wales. However, I think by doing it smarter, we can avoid unnecessary expense. Robust development plans can provide a basis for investment by grid operators to uh, support clear future need. And we're also working to support energy planning to ensure appropriate developments are supported in national, regional and local plans. If I can just turn um, to the amendments, we will be opposing Amendment 1 brought forward by um, Neil McAvoy. Um, as, as you have made very clear, nuclear is absolutely part of the energy uh, mix. We will be accepting um, the uh, Amendment 2 in the name of the Welsh Conservatives. We have invested significant time and resource into a comprehensive programme of support to maximise the potential lasting legacy from Wilver Newydd. We will be opposing um, the Amendment 3. Um, and members should be aware you know, Welsh Government can't reconsider the decision. I can pass no further comment. Uh, we've provided consistent support to communities as a vital part of energy development in Wales. And anyone who wishes to question the decision on Hendy Wind Farm and the reasoning behind it and the decision letter is there for people to see. Uh, it can do it through um, the court. Uh, the two amendments from Plaid Cymru, we will be opposing both. I mentioned that we've consistently fought um, for full powers over energy developments in Wales. However, we are part of a, a joined-up UK um, and global energy system, and I think we have to recognise the way the system is uh, funded and regulated. In relation to um, Amendment 5, um, you'll be aware that in, in discussions with Plaid Cymru, I did look at um, establishing an energy a company for Wales. We had that recent call for evidence that I'm sure uh, members are aware of. And there was, we didn't feel there was sufficient clarity on the, pur on, on the purpose of what that energy company would do, but I'm very happy. Um, I'm aware Thea um, is now um, uh, taking this forward along with the Energy Atlas. And I'm, you know, I'd be very happy to have future discussions about it if you can bring forward uh, more clarity on how, how really it would benefit um, the um, investment that would be required um, to bring it forward. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, yes. Uh, Secretary, possibly uh, in, uh, have discussions with uh, Scottish Government <coughs> colleagues. They, they have recently produced uh, quite an extensive report yeah. on the idea of a, of a uh, national energy company for Scotland, which could indeed be a model for us in Wales. Yeah, I have actually uh, seen the, the report, Adam Price. But yes, of course, I'd be very happy to... Um, to have that discussion with um, colleagues in Scotland. But as I say, when we looked at it initially, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, we just thought the significant investment that would needed couldn't be justified, but I'm very happy to continue to have those discussions. Um, I, I will, of course, ask officials to look into the accusations by, I think it was two or three um, Welsh Conservative members that works currently underway at Hendy. That's not my understanding, but of course I will ask officials to look into that for me and just thank members for their interest in energy and their uh, contributions today. Deal. The proposal is to agree Amendment 1. Does any member object? Object. Defer voting 
on this item until voting time. <laughs> item 10 on our agenda this evening is a statement by the Chair of the Children, Young People and Education Committee, United Nations Universal Ch Children's Day, and I call on the Chair of the Committee, Lynn Neagle. Thank you, Dipra Llewydd. I'm very pleased to be able to make this statement today on behalf of the Children, Young People and Education Committee to recognise the importance of the UN Universal Children's Day. The United Nations Universal Children's Day was established in 1954 and is celebrated on November the 20th each year to promote international togetherness, awareness among children worldwide and improving children's welfare. Since its establishment, November the 20th has become an important date in relation to the progress of children's rights across the world. On the 20th of November 1959, the UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration on the Rights of the Child. It is also the date in 1989 when the UN General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Since 1990, Universal Children's Day has been used to celebrate the anniversary of the adopt adoption of both the Declaration and the Convention on Children's Rights. More importantly, it is a day on which, across the world, children are honoured and time is taken to reflect on progress that has been made in promoting their rights. The National Assembly for Wales has a great story to tell on its scrutiny of children's rights. In 2011, Wales became the first country in the UK to make the UNCRC part of its domestic law when we passed the Rights of Children and Young People Wales measure. The measure aimed to strengthen and build on the approach the Welsh Government was taking to making policy for children and young people. It placed a duty on Welsh ministers to have due regard to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and required ministers to publish a children's rights scheme setting out the arrangements in place to have that due regard. These duties must be the cornerstone of how Welsh Government creates its policies for children. Welsh Government actions under this duty is something that this committee has and will continually monitor and scrutinise in order to ensure our children and young people are safe, well, happy and having their legal rights respected. The work of the committee has made a significant impact and has directly influenced change and improvement in service delivery for children and young people in many areas. I am pleased by the progress we have made in, in scrutinising key areas of policy and legislation during the first half of this Assembly. At the outset of the Assembly, we set clear principles and ambitions for our work. One of those principles was that engagement with children and young people should underpin all the work we do, ensuring that their views and, experience, and experiences are captured in a useful, sensitive and constructive way. We are now at the halfway point of the Fifth Assembly, so this provides a perfect opportunity for me to update members on the work the Committee has undertaken on children's matters and how we have engaged with children and young people along the way. I sadly won't be able to cover all of these areas during the statement. Instead, I will concentrate on ones where I believe we have made the biggest impact and have had the most engagement with children. In our snapshot inquiry into youth services in Wales, more than 1,500 young people gave us their views. The feedback from young people was incredibly clear. When youth work provision disappears from a young person's life, the impact is considerable. This formed an essential part of our findings and recommendations. We are pleased to note the Welsh Government's renewed focus on these services following our report and the direction of travel appears promising with the recent appointment of an interim youth work board. Despite a, high, a number of high profile previous reports relating to advocacy services, the committee remained concerned that the most vulnerable children in Wales were still not being supported to have their voices heard about issues that affected them. This was despite the need for independent advocacy being a key recommendation in the Waterhouse report in the year 2000. The importance of ensuring vulnerable children have an independent advocate cannot be underestimated. So in October 2016, we took, undertook a short, focused inquiry into statutory advocacy provision in Wales. 
We are pleased that since our report, progress has been made and the Committee's scrutiny is widely credited with ensuring that the national model for advocacy has been fully implemented and funded across Wales. As part of our scrutiny of the Additional Learning Needs Bill, we held a series of workshops with young people and held a conference for those working directly with children with ALN to help feed in views on how the Bill affected them. This engagement formed a vital part of our scrutiny and provided a clear insight into the needs of those children and how the Bill could be used to enhance the services they receive. <coughs> One vital way in which the committee improved the bill was to include a duty on local authorities and NHS bodies to have due regard to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which came as a result of our representations and those of the Children's Commissioner. Flying Start is regarded as one of the Welsh Government's flagship early years programmes. We chose to undertake a focused inquiry on the outreach elements of Flying Start because respondents to our 2016 consultation on the first thousand days of a child's life highlighted concerns about the programme's reach. Whilst there was general support for the aims of Flying Star, there was concern that the geographical targeting of the programme had the potential to create further inequality by excluding a significant number of children living in poverty. The Committee's consideration of this matter led to positive change, in particularly in relation to extending the outreach funding, meaning local authorities have more flexibility to choose to use their budgets to provide fly and start services outside designated postcode areas. With over £600 million spent on Flying Start to date, our committee will continue to shine a light on whether this investment can evidence it is delivering improved outcomes in the early years. The emotional and mental health of our children and young people is paramount. In our Mind Over Matter report, we called on the Welsh Government to deliver a step change in the support available. We gathered extensive evidence and concluded that the urgent challenge now lies at the front end of the care pathway, with much more support needed for emotional well-being, resilience and early intervention. Failure to deliver at this end of the pathway will lead to demand for specialist services outstripping supply and will leave a significant proportion of children, the so-called missing middle, without the help they need. Our disappointment with the Welsh Government's original response is well documented. But I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretaries have reflected over the summer and established the Task and Finish Group that recently met for the first time to consider a way forward. As a committee, we will not take our foot off the pedal on this, and we have requested a revised written response to our recommendations by March next year, and we will be keeping a focused eye on the Government's actions in this area. The issue of the lack of suitable textbooks and other educational resources had been highlighted to the committee as a concern by those across the sector and, most importantly, by school pupils themselves. The provision of appropriate resources for learners, particularly for GCSE and A-level, is fundamental. The committee therefore undertook work to establish what could be done to improve this. To help understand the problems, we took evidence directly from a number of children through a series of video blogs. Hearing directly from the children helped us understand the nature of the issues they faced and the extent of the problem. Although not part of the committee's work, on Universal Children's Day it would be remiss of me not to mention the Welsh Youth Parliament, and I am grateful to the Llywydd and to the Youth Parliament project team for keeping me informed on progress. The establishment of the Parliament is a genuinely exciting moment in the history of the Assembly. It is a true recognition of the value children and young people have in our democracy and should create a meaningful and long-lasting ties between schools, young people and the Assembly. The election, as you know, uh, to the first Youth Parliament is underway, with votes closing at the end of this week. I want to offer our committee's full support to the Youth Parliament and its members, and I look forward to the committee working with the Parliament wherever it can. There are many other areas of the committee's work that I could talk about that have impacted on children. We have done much work and we are committed to following through on all our inquiries. A current example of this is the follow-up we are currently undertaking on our perinatal mental health inquiry. 
Looking ahead, we have a heavy workload, with inquiries on the impact of Brexit on HE and FE and the status of the Welsh Baccalaureate, as well as the childcare funding bill work ongoing. There is also forthcoming legislation in the pipeline. The Public Accounts Committee has today published its report on care experienced children and young people. It is deeply concerning that the report finds that children in care across Wales are being let down because organisations are not recognising their corporate parenting responsibilities. As part of our work programme, we will look closely at this report and the Government's response. As outlined, the Committee will continue its work in relation to Mind Over Matter and have committed to undertaking inquiries into school funding and obesity in children. Finally, we will be undertaking work to consider the way in which the rights of the child measure has operated in practice and how that legislation might be improved further to put children's rights in Wales on an even firmer footing. We are committed to ensuring that children's rights are not just words on a page. We want to be clear that they are considered, respected and maintained across all government activity. In closing my statement today, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to thank all those who have contributed to our work during this Fifth Assembly. But in particular, our thanks go to the children and young people whose contributions have played such a huge role in helping to shape policy and legislation in Wales. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a number of speakers, so if everybody is quite brief, I should get you all in. So, John. That's, that's entirely up to you. Janet Finch Saunders. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding. And it's so uh, heartening, actually, to hear the Chairman of the CYPE Committee. Um, I know for a fact that your intentions and ambitions for our children in Wales are you know, very genuine and laudable, and certainly your determination is very apparent. So thank you for the work that you do, and I'm really pleased to be a member of your committee. Um, we, of course, today celebrate and welcome the UN... Uh, Universal Children's Day established in 1954. This year's theme for the day is blue. And we all look to build a world where every child is in school, safe from harm, and can fulfil their own potential. However, in Wales, we are reminded through our own casework as AMs that the Welsh Labour Government has more to do to ensure that those fundamental aims are fulfilled. The recent Children's Commissioner's report goes some way in addressing some of the obvious failings, and she is very correct to highlight them. Um, the fact that there are no children's rights impact assessment of last year's Welsh Government budget, and this is, was despite recommendations by the Children's Commissioner to have impact assessment for three children's issues, school uniform grants, minor ethnic achievement grants, and the All Wales Schools Liaison Programme. Of particular concern to me in the report is that the fact that the Welsh Government have made very little progress in early interventions for children and young people's mental health. And again, I would like to commend uh, you again, Lynn, um, Neagle AM, um, in the work that you have done in wanting a step change uh, with the work, uh, you know, sort of th that you've done previously. We are all very familiar with the inadequacy of provision for behavioural and emotional needs, not actually qualifying for intervention by CAMS, and that is despite many previous recommendations. Um, it remains, as of today, that there remains little or indeed no evidence that despite much rhetoric in this chamber from uh, cabinet me members uh, previously, that the Labour government in Wales is not taking its own obligations seriously <coughs> enough. Um, I would like to know how the recommendations in this report by the Children's Commission, particularly the red ones, where you know, no recommendation was made on this topic this year, where it states the Welsh Government and local authorities should ensure appropriate state support for the communication needs for deaf and hearing impaired children and young people and their families, including accessible and affordable BSL learning opportunities at a range of levels and the employment of staff in schools who are fluent communicators of BSL to meet individual needs. I'd have thought in this day and age that was a basic requirement, but it's one that the Welsh Labour Government still chooses to ignore. Ending on a positive note, though, uh, we are all heartened by the establishment of a Welsh Youth Parliament 
It is a true recognition of our youth and their own value to our society. And I look forward to working with um, other parties across this chamber uh, on behalf of the Welsh Conservatives with my colleague Susie Davis, AM, to ensure that we really do enshrine those children's rights, not only just in our thoughts or in our words, but truly in our deeds. Thank you. Lynn Eagle. Thank you, um, Janet Finch Saunders, for those remarks and for the kind words, which are much appreciated. A number of the issues that you raised were in relation to the Children's Commissioner's report. As you know, the Children's Commissioner will be before us on Thursday, and we'll have the opportunity to directly question plus follow up those issues then, and they are all very important issues that she's raised. Um, I agree with you on the children's rights impact assessments. This has been an ongoing concern for the committee, and you'll be aware that last week we held the concurrent meeting with um, the Equalities Local Government Committee and the Finance Committee, and I'm hoping that as a group of committees we can take forward those recommendations to make those impact assessments more meaningful. Um, but what I would say is that there is a reason why children are singled out for a particular impact assessment, and that is because you know they don't vote, they don't have a vote, they don't have the kind of democratic say. So I think it is particularly important that we ensure that their rights are at the heart of what we do. Um, but thank you for the comments, and I agree with you on the Youth Parliament. Julie Morgan. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I welcome the statement today. I think it's very important that we do um, celebrate this uh, day, um, Universal Children's Day, and it gives us the opportunity to assess um, where we are in terms of um, children's rights. And I am a member of the committee, and I'd like to thank the Chair for her statement. Um, it gives a flavour of the committee's work, and I think she's covered the areas very comprehensively. Um, and I just wondered... Um, I think um, she does refer, as she goes um, through the, um, the different areas, about the particular influence that she feels the committee has had on the government. So I don't know whether she could um, comment um, further on that. Um, I think there are particular areas where there has been um, considerable um, influence. Um, and I think it's been very good that we've been able to um, do the, um, the, uh, the Mind Over Matter report in particular. And I'd like to um, you know, congratulate the Chair on her ferret-like nature in following that, uh, in following that through. <laughs> because I think that has been terrier, terrier, not ferret, yes. <laughs> yes, but terrier, I think is a better word. Um, but, no, you know, seriously, I think that um, you have shown great leadership um, in that um, report. And I wonder if you could comment about how you think the, um, the Welsh Government will respond um, to that. And then, as um, others have um, said, it is very <coughs> exciting that we're celebrating the Youth um, Parliament. Um, I think it's, um, you know, the voting is um, just about to, to finish, and I think it's a great uh, step forward. And I don't know whether she could comment in terms of how the committee could perhaps work um, with the um, Commission and with the Youth Parliament to see that move um, forward. Um, but then I do want to... Um, comment that really, I don't know um, whether the committee chair can comment on the fact that um, we are really in a very difficult position in relation to children's rights because we don't know what impact Brexit um, will have on children's rights. And also we have had the UN Poverty Report by mm -hmm. Philip um, Alston, which has been referred to here today in the chamber already. Um, extremely critical of the impact of universal credit, and Austin said levels of child poverty, not just a disgrace, but a social calamity and an economic disaster. And it wasn't very encouraging, I thought, that Amber Rudd's response was to comment on the extraordinary political nature of his language. And um, I wonder if the chair could um, comment on the fact that uh, we, um, you know, we've, uh, we're looking at all these um, areas within Wales where we believe we are making progress, but it's hard going in this climate where the actions of the UK government are having such a terrible detrimental effect on children in Wales. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Julie, for those um, remarks, and thank you for, oh, for the ongoing uh, very positive contribution that you, know, you make to 
um, the committee. Um, I did give a few examples in the uh, statement of where I think that we have been able to secure um, some change. You referred to mind over matter, and uh, as you know, the committee was very disappointed with the Welsh Government's response to mind over matter. Um, but the task and finish group has now been established. <coughs> I am a member of it uh, as a fully participating member, but retaining uh, with an observer status, so retaining my ability to um, criticise and call things out if I'm not happy with things. Um, and I will certainly continue to do that. Um, I think that uh, both cabinet secretaries and hopefully across government, everyone realises that the committee is absolutely determined to see what I think is is a, a comprehensive route map for change in mind over matter delivered and um, we're not going to take our foot off the pedal we're going to keep uh, drilling down on it because we don't want to hand this over to another committee in another assembly the time to deal with this is now um, Thank you for your comments about the Youth Parliament. Um, I'm really keen that um, once they're in post that we establish a strong working relationship with them. I think it will be important to listen to them about how they want to engage with us rather than us saying, well, we're the Children's Committee, we'd like to do such and such. But I hope that as soon as they are in place, we can start to have um, those discussions and that they know that we're as keen uh, to, to work with them as possible. Um, you referred to the um, UN Envoy report, which was certainly a very sobering report last week with talk of um, destitution and people in extreme poverty, which of course has a massive impact on children. Um, and I hope that when we do the work on the rights of the child measure, that that, that will include some scrutiny of the areas around um, child poverty, which of course are, are featured by the UN. But I think it also raises challenges for us as an assembly, because although things like universal credit have been visited on us by Westminster, we are going to have to try and pick up the pieces as best we can. And a, a common theme in the committee has been concern about where poverty and child poverty now sits in the assembly, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's not with a particular minister. And that does present challenges with scrutinising it. And I hope that, you know, going forward, we can look at that. And also with John Griffiths's committee, because we have to, so many of these problems that we see, um, like the mental health problems, they start with people living in poverty, and we have to tackle them. Thank you very much to Lynn for the statement and for providing this opportunity for us to put a clear focus on children's rights here in Wales. I'm particularly pleased, as I'm sure we are, that Wales has adopted the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 2011, the first nation in the UK to do so. It is entirely appropriate that the Welsh Government should publish a review of its commitments to the Convention next year, and this will provide us with a direct opportunity as an Assembly to scrutinise the implementation of the measure, as we've heard. The Children's Commissioner is very critical that no careers were carried out on the current budgetary Proposals, Article 4 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, make it a requirement for every level of government to act in a way that is consistent with the Convention. It states that there needs to be regular assessment of how budgets will impact on different groups of children, ensuring that the budgetary decisions lead to the best possible outcomes for the greatest possible number of children, also taking into account as a central part of that process, children who are vulnerable. But the Commissioner said last week... ...appear to be an add-on within this budget. And Rather than those rights being part of the analysis from the very outset, and that leads to budgetary decisions being the right ones. And yes, the Children's Commissioner is very critical and has every right to be so. But to be fair, she also said that there are few examples of 
good practice. There are very few examples of governments working systematically to ensure that priority is given to children and children's rights as they draw up their budgets. So Wales isn't alone in that regard. There are very few examples of states who are truly successful in budgeting in accordance with their commitments to the rights of children. So why don't we in the Senedd of Wales show the way? We are the first in the UK to adopt the Convention. Why can't we be the first Senedd, the first Parliament in the world to put children's rights at the heart of our budgetary processes? And I would like your view on that, and more importantly, perhaps, the view of the Cabinet Secretary for Finance on that particular point. Wouldn't it be excellent if we were able to support that today on UN Universal Children's Day? Um, thank you um, to Sean Gwenllian uh, for her comments. I'm very pleased to have her as a member of the committee as well. Um, I completely agree with you on the children's rights issue. It has been a constant theme in the Assembly that we are concerned that despite this wonderful start back in 2011, that there has been a dilution of that commitment in recent years. Um, for, for what seem like very worthy reasons with things like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But as I said earlier, there is a reason why we have child single children out and we have to stick to that really. And I hope that we can progress this working with the other committees. Um, another very positive suggestion that came out last week was to look back at the excellent work that was done when um, Jane Hutt was Cabinet Secretary for Finance around children's budgeting because it isn't enough to just talk about these things. We have to actually make sure that they happen and I think it would be wonderful if, if we as an Assembly could make sure that we do continue to lead the way in this area. I would be very, very enthusiastic about that. Thank you. And finally, Rhiannon Passmore. Uh, Llawydd, thank you. I'm also proud to be able to speak on International Children's Day in this institution that has done so much for the rights of children here in the National Assembly for Wales. We can be proud that the rights of children are at the cornerstone of everything we do. The rights of children and young persons Wales measure ensured that Wales was the first nation of the United Kingdom to integrate children's rights into domestic law. John F. Kennedy once said, children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. And though I'm sure that this sentiment is shared around the chamber, I believe we can all be proud that this assembly support for our most valuable resource is not confined to well-meaning statements, but is enshrined in legislation. And on White Ribbon Day, the legislation around domestic violence spearheaded by Carl Sargent has a valued place in ensuring the rights of the child. And we can also be proud of leading the way with the creation of the Children's Commissioner for Wales in 2001, something that has been replicated in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. It is important that we as politicians listen to the voice of young people and that is why I am delighted to see so many youngsters across Wales engaging with the first election to the Welsh Youth Parliament. So well done to all of our candidates and obviously good luck to Islaen. Though there is much that we can be proud of, we must also acknowledge the challenges that still face too many children in Wales. It is right that we in this place acknowledge the pressures that are currently being placed on youth services, not least by the Tory government's harmful and cruel austerity agenda passported to local government, who deal with the most vulnerable in our society. And it is sobering to hear the UN Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights in his just published damning report on poverty and the impact on children across the UK. This is now the second highly damning UN report on the UK government's social policy, which is, in his own words, creating poverty and homelessness through a cruel and misogynistic welfare system, and in the report's words, failing the rights of the child. And I am deeply concerned about the potential rise in youth homelessness exacerbated by UK welfare reform and the UK government's regressive policies. 
Despite this harsh backdrop, progressive steps are being taken by this Welsh Government. Just yesterday, I was proud to welcome the First Minister to my constituency in Abobago to see the fantastic collaborative work going on between Caerphilly Youth Services, the Welsh Government and third sector groups such as Lamai. Collaborative working for the individual child and to announce an additional £10 million of funding for projects to prevent youth homelessness. Real action and real initiative. I welcome the Welsh Government's additional funding of £15 million announced last week to tackle the rise in children being taken into care. And I ask that all in this chamber work together and call upon the UK Government to protect the rights of the child and to make another UN report on UK poverty and human rights unnecessary by ending austerity and furthering the universal credit rollout fiasco by ending it. I call upon everyone in this chamber to call upon the UK Government to end that. Thank you. And then Lynn Eagle briefly to Can I um, thank uh, Rhiannon Passmore for her comments. Um, I agree that we have a, a very good record in Wales, one that we can be proud of, but we can't be complacent, um, especially at a time of austerity when there are such competing priorities. It's incumbent on all of us to do what we can to ensure that rights of children are central to uh, what, they're do what we're doing. Thank you for mentioning youth services. They are crucially important. It was our first inquiry. Um, they're important for the most vulnerable children, but also important that we remember that they're there for all children, and that was a very clear message in our inquiry, that this should be universal provision that is open access for all children and young people so that uh, everybody is, is catered for. Um, I agree, I agree again with your remarks about the UN report. I think it is something that we will have to look at. I hope that it's something that the committees can work together to uh, look at. Um, and I hope that everybody will convey the messages in it, because there is only so much that we can do on some things while we are still having some very adverse welfare reforms inflicted on us. And, uh, at the end of the day, poverty is such a big driver for all the other issues like mental health problems, family relationship breakdown, etc. So I hope that we can all work together on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 11 is voting time. Unless three members wish for the bell to be rung, I intend to proceed to the vote. The first vote this afternoon or this evening then is a on the debate on the law derived from the European Union Wales Act 2018 repeal regulations of 2018. And I call for a vote on the motion tabled in the name of Julie James. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the motion, 40, no abstentions, 8 against. Therefore, the motion is agreed. We now move to vote on the debate, how do we achieve a low-carbon energy system for Wales? And I call for a vote on Amendment 1, tabled in the name of Neil McAvoy. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the motion, one, eight abstentions, 40 against. Therefore, the motion is not agreed. I now call for a vote on Amendment 2, tabled in the name of Darren Miller. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the motion, 40, no abstentions, nine against. Therefore, Amendment 2 is agreed. Call for a vote on Amendment 3, tabled in the name of Darren Miller. Open the vote. Close the vote. For the motion 13, no abstentions, 36 against. Therefore, that Amendment 3 is not agreed. Call for a vote on Amendment 4, tabled in the name of Free Napiorowith. Open the vote.
close the vote for the motion 10 no abstentions 39 against therefore amendment 4 is not agreed call for a vote on amendment 5 table in the name of free nappy Orweth, open the vote close the vote for the motion 11 no abstentions 38 against therefore amendment 5 is not agreed I now call for a vote on the motion as amended, tabled in the name of Julie James. Open the vote. Close the vote for the motion 37, two abstentions, 10 against. Therefore, the amended motion is agreed. And that brings today's proceedings to a close. Thank you.